Section 1 of Fires and Firefighters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlon. Fires and Firefighters A History of Modern Firefighting with a Review of Its Development from Earliest Times by John Kenlon. Chief of New York Fire Department. Dedicated to my comrades, the members of the International Association of Fire Engineers. Chapter 1 Introduction. A common axiom amongst firefighters is that no definitive rules can be formulated which wholly embody the principles of their craft. It is argued that since no two fires are absolutely alike in all respects, that which would be efficacious in one instance would be absolutely futile in another. This proposition is fallacious. Physicians might just as well advance the theory that since no two individuals are constitutionally alike, it is useless to apply the same treatment for some well-known disease, even with those modifications necessitated by physical differences. Of course this is a reductio ad absurdum, since doctors study their patients scientifically, following general principles resulting from experience, only varied in minor details according to the exigencies of the case. Similarly, notwithstanding differences in construction and occupancy, it is perfectly feasible to fight fires with intelligence born of systematic acquaintance with certain fixed data and it may be added with some degree of scientific exactitude. As there are prime factors in the treatment of illness, particularly if it be contagious, such as the removal of the patient to a place where it is almost impossible for the disease to be communicated to others, so it is with fire. The first general principles to be observed include, naturally, the confinement of an outbreak to as narrow a place as possible, the safety of contiguous property, the prevention of loss of life, and the centralization of the outbreak as a whole. To this must be added the concentration upon the point of greatest danger of all the forces at the command of the officer in charge. In the following chapters an attempt has been made to deal with this subject in such a manner that while the professional firefighter shall find much information which will be of value to him, the lay reader shall likewise discover material for thought, as well as food for the imagination. It has been estimated that no less than 64% of all fires occur in the homes of the people, and though these may not be attended by the tremendous financial losses consequent upon outbreaks in warehouses, office buildings, and the like, they strike fear into the heart at a greater degree for it is the human hazard which is at stake. Few realize also the unremitting labor, the devotion to service, the daily acts of heroism, the mental and physical strain, and the inadequate acknowledgment in many instances by the public of the achievements of the genus fireman. Not that he wishes to be advertised, but since the soldier, the sailor, and even the policeman loom large in general estimation, it seems only just that something should be written illustrative of the responsibilities entrusted to his charge. To how many people does it ever occur that negligence on the part of a policeman may result in the loss by robbery of a few thousand dollars, or the sacrifice of at most two or three human lives by murder, while the same fault on the part of a fireman may entail some hideous disaster involving scores of lives or the loss of millions of dollars. Further, is it realized that whereas the soldier or sailor risks his life for his country at rare intervals, the fireman takes the same chances regularly in the course of his daily avocation? Thus it will be seen that no occupation or career should make a greater appeal to the sympathy and interest of the public than that of the firemen, who constitute a force which stands for much, and without which the insecurity of life would be increased tenfold. 
In addition, the advance of science and the evolution of the simple building into the highly complex structure necessitated by modern requirements have in their turn caused a corresponding advance in the theory and practice of firefighting. Questions of such import as the alleviation of congestion in crowded districts, the provision of suitable accommodation for domestic and business premises, and the supply of the minimum of light and air compatible with modern ideas of hygiene, have led architects to find their only solution in the piling up of story upon story, till, with the Woolworth Building in New York, realms of space hitherto unpierced except by the Eiffel Tower have surrendered to their all-conquering demand, and finality has by no means been reached in this direction. No wonder, therefore, that those responsible for fire control have paused, perplexed momentarily, at the problems confronting them. Generally speaking, except under the rarest of circumstances, it is only possible to fight fires from the street up to a height of seven stories. After that, reliance must be placed upon the fire appliances within the building, coupled with the tactical skill of the firemen in using the same. This is one of the instances in which the scientific training of a fire department is manifested. The isolation of elevator shafts, the prevention of flames being drawn from floor to floor through windows, and the avoidance of the most dangerous enemy, backdraft, constitute features of enormous significance. Similarly, fire apparatus has grown in complexity, and its handling requires a corresponding degree of judgment and skill. The old days of the manual have gone forever, and though for many centuries little advance was made in the mechanical aspect of firefighting equipment, the last fifty years have witnessed a complete revolution in the means and methods employed. As the hand-drawn manual gave way to the horse-drawn steam engine, so has the latter in its turn been succeeded by the automobile gasoline pump. Likewise, the Roman ladder, which for years marked the limit of human ingenuity as applied to means of entry to and rescue from burning buildings, has been superseded to a large extent by mechanically operated extension ladders of great length. Such apparatus as water towers, searchlights, high-pressure pumps, dangerous structure traps, and so forth, presuppose a high degree of scientific skill and technical knowledge on the part of the firefighter, who may thus legitimately claim to belong to a well-defined profession. Since appliances vary in different parts of the world according to local needs, the author has included in this volume some slight account of the equipment and methods of foreign departments which would prove serviceable for purposes of comparison. Equally, full descriptions will be found of the most modern mechanical devices in use, which it is hoped will be of real service to those who are interested in the subject from a practical standpoint. There is no doubt that at last the world has awakened to the economic importance of fire control. Insurance risks have become so stupendous that those involved financially in the same demand the acme of scientific foresight and the maximum of human enterprise towards the protection of their capital. It is true that in some quarters there is a regrettable tendency to gamble on fire risks, which brings in its train sporadic outbursts of incendiarism, whereby in many cases human lives are jeopardized. But with the exposure of such dubious modes of increasing business, and with a realization of their results, it seems beyond question that saner and wiser counsels will prevail. These are days of keen competition as applied to the search after a bare livelihood, and the pay and prospects of the firemen are such that they well merit the attention of young men with ambition and brains. The life is a healthy, if strenuous, one, while the position of fire chief, at any rate in America, is within reach of all comers, and the goal one to be envied. Should this work prove to be the means of encouraging the right type of man to come forward, then the writer will be happy in the knowledge that his labor has not been in vain. 
It will be noticed that a chapter has been devoted to the consideration of how best to deal with fires in private houses, and the most prolific causes of these outbreaks. Carelessness can never be wholly eradicated from human nature, but this same failing is one of the prime factors constituting the fire risk of the citizen. Not long since, a guest in a hotel thoughtlessly threw away a lighted cigarette end into a waste-paper basket. In due course, the contents burst into flames, set alight the curtains, and eventually involved the whole floor of the building, causing, incidentally, the loss of three lives. That same story is repeated, week by week and day by day, the world over, and yet the lesson never seems to be appreciated. Hence, the next best thing to prevention being cure, an attempt has been made in the chapter indicated to formulate certain simple rules which, if followed, will go a long way towards controlling the blaze until such time as professional help shall arrive. Further, it is not generally realized by what means fires are sometimes started. For instance, who would ever suspect that the common garden rat possessed all the qualities of an incipient firebug? In the city of Washington, during one year, 36 outbreaks arose through rats nibbling at the ends of matches, proof sufficient that where fire is concerned, not even the most remote possibilities can be overlooked with impunity. The prevention of panic in schools, shops, factories, and the like is, of course, one of the most important features of the ethics of firefighting. It is no exaggeration to say that as many people are killed by suffocation, by being trampled to death, and by unnecessarily jumping into the streets, as are actually sacrificed to the flames themselves. Human nature is easily susceptible of control, provided that there is at hand a sufficiently strong influence to inspire confidence and restore nerve. This influence must be a combination of self-possession and training. With this upon which to draw, panic can often be averted. Thus in schools, teachers should be trained in the marshalling of their charges, in the same way that employees in shops should be taught to look after the safety of purchasers. The timely playing of the orchestra in a theater has often prevented disaster, and such aids are worthy of more than passing attention. All this has received careful study in the chapter devoted to the subject, and the writer confidently anticipates that if his advice is followed, advice framed upon forty years of actual experience, the casualties due to fire panics will be appreciably minimized. These are some of the issues connected with firefighting, which have been dealt with in as exhaustive and interesting a manner as possible in this volume. The particular intention of the writer has been to avoid lengthy and tedious explanations which would be beyond the comprehension of the untrained layman. To that end, an appendix has been supplied, replete with all the tables necessary to the scientific fireman. For the rest, the problems of fire control have emerged from the chrysalis stage of experiment into the fully developed formulae of an exact science, and the time has arrived when no one can afford to be ignorant of the first principles governing the same. A great quantity of useless information is assimilated by the public. Is it too much to hope that opportunity may be found for the perusal of a subject so closely connected with the welfare, safety, and homes of the people? End of section one. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 2 of Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Firefighting in Ancient Rome. From the earliest times, the Romans well recognized the ever present menace of fire, and as a matter of precaution, a law was passed compelling the erection of separate houses, each standing on its own plot of ground. But as the size of the city increased, this regulation became more honored in the breach than in the observance, with the result that serious conflagrations occurred frequently, and thus the subject of effective firefighting was forced upon the attention of the authorities. 
Indeed, there is nothing surprising in Rome having been constantly visited by such calamities. The houses in the poorer and more populous quarter of the city were usually constructed of wood. Sanctuary fires were continually kept burning in every household in honor of the domestic deities, and it does not require the imagination of a Jules Verne to conjure up visions of the dire results caused by an act of carelessness or a moment's thoughtlessness. The streets being narrow and tortuous, the smallest blaze would quickly develop into a veritable conflagration, the magnitude of which would depend solely upon the natural barriers which might stand in the way of the flames. In addition, intermingled with the dwelling-houses were vast warehouses and granaries which offered an easy prey to fire. Furthermore, human nature in ancient Rome was much the same as human nature in modern New York, and enterprising miscreants were not lacking who realized that by starting a fire and availing themselves of the ensuing confusion, they could enrich themselves comfortably and quickly at the expense of their neighbors. They were, in fact, the germ from which developed the individual who is a terror to his neighbors, a pest in the community, and a source of constant activity to fire departments, by whom he is dubbed expressively a firebug. Hence it will be seen that even at this early date the menace of fire in its primary conditions did not differ materially from the modern fire risks in many towns. Under the Republic, one of the duties of the Roman triumvirs was to protect the city from fire, and later they came to be called nocturnes because of their mounting guard during the night. In this task they were assisted by the aediles, to whom the care of the buildings in the town was entrusted. This constituted the official fighting force, but there were in addition private organizations consisting of slaves whose services were given gratuitously according to the wishes of their masters, who doubtless in this manner hoped to rise in public esteem. This forms an interesting analogy to the methods employed by many so-called philanthropists in the present day, who are usually ready to support any public work upon which a liberal amount of limelight is turned. Little could be expected from a department composed of such heterogeneous elements, ignorant alike of discipline and organization. The Emperor Caesar Augustus, realizing the importance of effective fire protection in his capital, introduced the first regularly constituted fire department known to history. It consisted of seven cohorts, each numbering roughly 1,000 men. Their duties consisted not only in the actual work of fighting the flames, but also in policing the streets contiguous to an outbreak and in preventing robbery and looting. The fire chief was known as the Prefectus Vigilum. He was assisted by three lieutenants, sub-prefecti, seven tribunes, forty-nine centurions, and a great number of principales. This last title was given to everyone in the Roman army who had any species of fixed office, to all those, in fact, who occupied the intermediate ranks between commissioned officers and common soldiers. Prominent among the principales were the librarii, who kept the accounts and paid the wages, the buccinatores, or buglers, the ensign-bearers, one for each cohort, and the aquarii, the siphonarii, the sebaciarii, and the mitularii, to whose respective duties attention will be paid when considering the manner in which fires were fought. There were also four doctors attached to each cohort, and last, but by no means least, an official known as the questionarius, whose interesting duty it was to apply torture in cases of suspected incendiarism. The seven cohorts were quartered in as many barracks, designated castra, which were so located that each could effectively protect two of the fourteen regions into which the city was divided. As to the construction of these barracks, there is fortunately preserved an important record in the shape of a fragment of an ancient plan of imperial Rome, showing the details of the barrack allocated to the first cohort. This was situated near St. Grisagone in Trastevere, and the building had evidently been specially designed for the use of firemen on duty. 
the atrium or entrance hall was tiled with black and white mosaic arranged to represent various marine subjects while in the middle stood a handsome hexagonal fountain flanking the walls on either side were benches for the men while numerous inscriptions and rough drawings evidenced the fact that in their moments of leisure the roman firemen found amusement in caricaturing their fellows opposite to the main entrance of the atrium was a door leading to a spacious bathroom giving the impression that the wants of the men even in those days were the subject of as careful consideration as they are today it must have been about this time that the intellectual activity of the romans commenced to assert itself and not only the great thermes or baths were open the whole night long but also such halls of assembly as the palestre the scolae the bibliotheque and the pinocotheque would be crowded at all hours with throngs of eager disputants in fact nocturnal life in rome had come to be an integral part of the city's existence this in turn necessitated some form of municipal illumination and this was likewise entrusted to the fire department a special branch being formed under the name of the sebacchiarii after their first captain one sebacchiarius special men were drawn monthly from each cohort for this service their duties including the supervision of the monster torches continually burning outside fire stations as a signal to all and sundry whither to repair in the event of wishing to give an alarm of fire some years ago a bronze torch was excavated not far from st grisogone which experts presume to have been a street lamp of this period fortunately rome was well supplied with water which was carried in hame or light vases by squads of firemen to the scene of an outbreak where it was placed at the disposal of those in charge of the siphones or hand pumps from specimens which have been frequently found in excavations these latter must have been very similar to the old-fashioned syringes used by gardeners only of course constructed of wood the aquarii or as their name designates the water carriers did not confine their attentions to that duty alone they were also expected to be conversant with all possible sources of water supply in the two regions of town for which their cohort was responsible on the whole the firemen were well equipped with apparatus including hammers saws mattocks and other such implements besides leather hose in suitable lengths large pillows specially designed to break the fall of any one jumping from a height were in general use and incidentally were not much improved upon till the beginning of the last century in addition the roman ladder the forerunner of the modern escape had already been introduced and a detailed description of the same may be found in the chapter dealing with appliances given these data it is not difficult to frame in the mind's eye a picture of a fire in ancient rome there is sufficient evidence that the romans were distinctly human and no doubt an outbreak of fire provided a pleasant interlude when the discourse of a popular orator started to become tedious Hence it can be imagined, even as today, that the nocturnes or fire police were fully occupied in preventing the curious from hindering the firemen. The prefectus vigilum, or fire chief, would arrive to take charge of operations, and woe betide anyone in the vicinity were there any suspicion of incendiarism. The services of the questionarius, or fire marshal, would be hastily requisitioned and judging by the comprehensive fashion in which the law was administered at that period it may be hazarded that while no doubt the guilty eventually received their well-merited reward it is not unlikely that meantime a proportion of the innocent had also tasted that official's ingenious skill this assuredly must have had a discouraging effect upon the enthusiasm of the genus firebug for inasmuch as example is generally a deterrent it mattered little whether the punishment reached the real offender so long as the modus operandi of the punishment and the reason thereof were known and appreciated but to return to a more serious vein of thought it is a fact that modern methods of procedure against incendiaries 
lack the finality and thoroughness of those early days. In a later portion of this volume, the subject is treated at length, and hence it is unnecessary further to pursue the question. Suffice it to say that, broadly speaking, the fire department of ancient Rome was as well organized and equipped for its duties as many a municipal force as late as the 18th century, and it might not be exaggeration to hazard even composed of as competent firefighters as some corps of today. End of section two. Recording by Maria Casper. Section three of Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three The Evolution of Firefighting. It may be safely asserted that the fire department of ancient Rome was better organized and better equipped than the rough and ready volunteer services maintained by the great European cities during the Middle Ages. There had, in fact, been a period of retrogression, which was coincident with the dismemberment of the Roman Empire, when all art and science languished in the chaos that ensued. Needless to say, the problems affecting fire control were relegated to the background, and indeed the art of destroying towns received more consideration than that of their preservation. Thus it is that no records can be found of mechanical appliances being used at the conflagrations which demolished Constantinople and Vienna. Indeed, this retrograde movement had so far affected the whole subject that even in the Renaissance, when Europe teemed with fresh ideas and new thought, no other method of fighting fires existed than the primitive bucket of the pre-Roman period. By 1590, however, there were signs of an awakening interest, and in an account of a fire in England, the use of a monstrous syringe is related as the introduction of a novelty, although in reality it must have been practically a counterpart of the siphonarius, mention of which was made in the last chapter. In 1615, a hand engine was made in Germany, but it was merely a pump without hose, the principle embodied being a rotary paddle wheel, which, by being turned rapidly, forced the water out through an orifice. This again was not new, the idea having probably been derived from Greek sources. Even in 1666, the good citizens of London were without any mechanical appliances and were practically helpless to stem that terrific conflagration, which devastated their city and consumed 13,200 houses, covering an area of 436 acres, the ancient cathedral of St. Paul and 36 other churches, the Royal Exchange, the Custom House, hospitals, and four prisons, in which, incidentally, several persons lost their lives. The value of the property destroyed amounted to nearly $60 million, and it undoubtedly served to impress upon the public mind the necessity of some proper system of fire prevention. Immediately afterwards, the city was divided into four districts, each under the control of a special officer, possessed of authority to take charge in the event of a fire. It must be understood that at this time social and economic conditions made life comparatively simple. Gas and matches were unknown, thus eliminating those two fruitful sources of carelessness. Buildings were, as a rule, one story in height, and the floors, even in the dwellings of the wealthy, were flagged with stone. Hence the change was slow in coming, and was concomitant with the demand for increased security of persons and property. Business activity began to show itself in all parts of Western Europe in the 15th century, and towns destined to be the industrial centers of the modern world had their genesis. With their growth began afresh a full appreciation of fire risks and the necessity of fire control. Yet it was not until the 18th century that one Richard Newsham designed a hand engine of practical utility. 
water was supplied to it by hand and was then pumped out through a hose, thus forming the predecessor of the manual, drafting its own water and thereby supplying pumps. America had to learn her lesson in her own way. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, her colonists found the country covered with dense forests, which were naturally utilized for building purposes, and as a result, as early as 1648, the first fire ordinance was adopted in New York, forbidding the use of wooden chimneys, and providing for the purchase of one hundred leather buckets, hooks, and ladders. A body of volunteers was organized to patrol the streets at night and watch for outbreaks, who, from their persistent, painstaking, and sometimes rather indiscreet efforts, were christened suggestively the Prowlers. Their work was, however, appreciated, and in 1678 the town of Boston organized the first regular fire company under municipal control, and imported from England a species of hand pump. Only in 1808 did a Philadelphia firm put on the market riveted leather hose, and soon afterwards an ingenious hose carriage of American invention was adopted, and remains in use in a modified form to the present day. England was the first country to manufacture rubber hose about 1820, and its employment with certain improvements has become general. The application of steam as a means of obtaining power was responsible for a revolution in fire apparatus, as it was in all other lines of mechanical effort. It has contributed in no small degree to the construction of effective portable machinery with which to fight fires, and the benefits derived from its use have been almost incalculable. Obviously it is the endeavor of all firemen to check a fire in its early stage, since, generally speaking, its commencement is small and progress comparatively slow. It is no exaggeration to say that some of the great conflagrations, which for hours and even days have baffled the combined efforts of huge fire departments with scores of determined firemen equipped with much powerful apparatus, could have been extinguished in a few seconds, by the cool-headed and well-directed work of one man armed with but a single pail of water, had he arrived in time. In other words, if ready means of suppressing a fire in its infancy were at hand, many serious outbreaks might be averted. And hence it is that so much depends upon effective apparatus and the speed with which it is conveyed to the scene of the action. For imagine what happened in the old days before the adoption of the steam fire engine. First, consider the bucket period. A person discovering a fire would run to his nearest neighbor for help, and then the alarm would be given from one house to another, and immediately all would be confusion. Volunteers there would be in plenty, armed with buckets or any other domestic utensil which could contain water. Forming a line, they would pass the buckets from hand to hand, sending them back by their womenfolk to be refilled. With such loss of time and feeble resistance, it is small wonder if usually the flames continued their course practically unchecked, and a building saved from complete ruin was considered as a remarkable achievement. Next came the period of the hand engine, Bells upon churches and other public buildings were now the means of spreading the dire tidings, and upon hearing their summons, the voluntary firemen would hurry to their quarters and drag their engine in the direction of the first alarm. Then arose the question, where was the nearest water supply? And no doubt time was wasted through unsolicited advice. If, as was often the case, the supply proved to be at too great a distance from the outbreak for one engine to furnish an efficient stream, a second was stationed between the fire and the water. The ensuing contest between both parties of excited men, as to which should occupy the place of honor nearer the fire, and the efforts of the vanquished to pump up more water than the engine in front could use, no doubt added to the gaiety of the community, and the mythological god of fire must have smiled and perhaps murmured, what fools these mortals be. But this opera bouffe method of fire-fighting really served a useful purpose, 
inasmuch as the increasing seriousness of the fire risk did not appeal in the same degree to the sense of humor of those who lost their property with the result that the advent of a new factor in fire control was welcomed by the influential of the population george braithwaite an englishman first conceived a steam fire engine which was completed in the year eighteen twenty nine and was a portent of the great change to come skeptics there were who scoffed at its superiority and who jeeringly referred to it as the steam squirt or the kitchen stove but it had come to stay and in eighteen forty a new yorker by the name paul hodges constructed a model of curious design which however proved impracticable the year eighteen forty five was marked by the first of the great fires which heralded the era of new building construction in the united states and which therefore deserves more than passing mention pittsburgh pennsylvania was the scene of the disaster which originated from the simplest act of carelessness on washing day in the early part of april a housewife made a small fire upon which to boil water in the back yard of her home a high wind was blowing and sparks from her miniature bonfire were carried to a neighboring building which quickly ignited with incredible rapidity the flames spread from house to house and despite the desperate efforts of volunteer and amateur firemen the destruction ceased only when no material was left for the fire to feed upon in a territory fifty-six acres in extent the financial loss was five million dollars an enormous one for those days and two thousand families wandered homeless over the charred remains of what had been their dwellings this is one of those instances when prompt and timely action would have probably saved the situation but the antiquated methods employed coupled with the delay inseparable from the summoning of volunteers was just sufficient to transform what might have been a backyard blaze into a conflagration of the first magnitude and so it always will be in fire control time is an ally of the utmost value which in its turn demands the maximum of celerity on the part of all concerned prominence is given to this episode since some such reminder was needed in america as elsewhere to stir up its citizens to a realization of what fire could accomplish even from the smallest and most trifling beginnings untold romance lies in the history of the great forest fires of america which even today rage to a large extent uncontrolled but which educated the early settlers to a vivid realization of their perils thus in the prosperous colony of new brunswick there is chronicled a conflagration which in its destructive horror has left an indelible mark upon the population as well as upon the land itself along the banks of the river miramichi there were scattered in eighteen twenty five prosperous settlements of fishermen and farmers while through the forest which extended for hundreds of miles to the north and south roamed hunters and trappers of nomadic habits in search of a livelihood to them nature appeared so bountiful that no thought of any enemy common alike to both entered their contented minds the summer had been a dry one and the autumn had brought but little rain till the pine needles and leaves crackled under the weight of a passing step and a careless lumberman was to transform this haven of quiet into a holocaust of ruin having finished his evening pipe he knocked it out against a tree stump and turned in little recking of the consequences he awoke to find the forest ablaze about him and although fearfully burned managed to make his way to the nearest camp where there was no need to tell his story for east and west north and south the glow of an unnatural day was upon them from the waters of the miramichi to the shores of bay chaleur there was one roaring hurricane of flame and no human means wherewith to stay it dawn followed dawn bringing no relief till the heart of a great province was transformed from a richly wooded country into a lonely and desolate waste 
so much had been accomplished by human carelessness, though it is ever thus that the world has learned its lesson. No less than two hundred persons either perished in the flames or were drowned in the river vainly trying to find safety in its cooling waters. Over a thousand horses and cattle were swept to their doom, and six thousand square miles of forest disappeared as completely from the face of the earth as though they had never been. In some places the destruction of vegetation was so thorough that even to this day nothing can grow there but stunted shrubbery and coarse grass, a constant reminder of this tragedy. With such examples of the terrific power of fire, was it surprising that the New World hailed the invention of the steam engine with enthusiasm as a possible panacea for its sufferings? Even to the amateur mechanic, the principles governing the construction and working of the steam fire engine are simple and easy of understanding. In the earliest examples, an upright boiler with a spacious firebox at its base was set between the rear wheels of an ordinary carriage body and surmounted by a short smokestack. Bolted to the front of the boiler were two steam cylinders, above them being placed the pump itself so that the piston rod of the engine served as the rod of the pump. Steam drove the pistons up and down in the engine, drawing water through a large suction hose on one side and forcing it out on the other through a smaller hose. From the pumps the water was forced to an air chamber, forming a cushion and serving to equalize the pressure, thus giving an unvarying discharge. The principle of these pumps was therefore very much akin to that of the hand engine, but with enormously increased power. As this was long prior to the introduction of the water tube boiler, steam had to be generated in the old way, by which the heat given off by combustion is conveyed by tubes through the boiler. The water supply of the boiler was obtained from a small pipe connected to or near the suction chamber and pumps. On the average, the diameter of the cylinders in the various sizes of engines ranged from six and one-half to ten inches, while the stroke, as a rule, measured eight inches. These rough particulars will give the reader some idea of the chrysalis from which the modern fire engine has emerged. Since fires cannot be fought without water, some account of the problem connected with its supply deserves attention. Here again may be observed the retrograde movement, since in Roman times it was not uncommon to find aqueducts forty miles in length, which from their situation were enabled to deliver to the city, in accordance with the laws of gravity, a sufficient quantity of water at a moderate pressure. Naturally this was of great advantage in fire-fighting, and from historical records it is clear that the most was made of it. But in Europe of the Middle Ages, these lessons had been forgotten, and the practice had fallen into desuetude. Rivers, wells, and ponds were considered adequate for the needs of the population, and it is curious to meditate that the intellectual wealth of that time expended itself solely upon art and the most profound metaphysics, to the exclusion of more mundane, though probably more useful, considerations regarding public health and safety. Yet even in the middle of the last century, it was by no means uncommon to find large towns dependent upon a water supply operated by private companies and conveyed by means of open mains through the streets. In 1815, Philadelphia introduced a complete system of underground pipes constantly supplied with water by a central pumping station, this plan proved a success, and has since been gradually adopted even by many of the smallest towns in America. This system, however, did not at its initiation take into consideration the fire department, and the city of New York probably had the first water service to which hydrants were connected for that particular purpose. By degrees has been evolved from this mode of supply that most valuable adjunct of modern firefighting, the high-pressure system, which even now has not been extended to its limit of usefulness, and which is lacking in cities where it should most certainly be installed. 
A detailed description of its advantages is given in a separate chapter. Naturally, an outbreak of fire being invariably attended with some danger to human life, those far-sighted Romans cast about for the most simple yet effective means of coping with the situation. Two pieces of their apparatus were specially designed for this purpose, and have survived in a modified form until the present day. Firstly, mention must be made of the Roman ladder. The great advantage of this apparatus lies in its simplicity. In its constructive details it has changed practically not a whit since the days of Nero, and it is as useful in wide thoroughfares as in narrow courts, while its portability is such that one man can carry the entire equipment. It consists of a series of short ladders from six to nine feet in length, the lower part of each being slightly broader than the top. By means of a slot, the sections can be fitted together, all being interchangeable except that designed for the bottom, which has its sides somewhat more outspread in order to provide a firmer hold upon the ground. The method of erection is simple and ingenious. The lowest section is first placed against the wall to be scaled at a considerable angle. The fireman then ascends it with a section on his shoulder, and armed with a rope, a hook belted to his waist, and a pulley. When he reaches a certain rung, which in modern practice is painted scarlet, he puts his leg through the ladder, his foot against the wall, and hooking himself on in order to leave his hands free, pushes the ladder away from the wall, and fits the section he has carried on top of the section upon which he is standing. He then hauls up another section and repeats the same maneuver. At the Colosseum in Rome, for exhibition purposes, these ladders have been joined up together till they reached a total length of 164 feet. This apparatus, it may be remarked, is in regular use in many of the Italian fire departments today. The second noteworthy appliance of Roman times, which has endured through all these centuries, and which, in the writer's humble opinion, modern invention has not improved, is the jumping pillow. This was nothing more nor less than a large mattress, some eight feet square, stuffed with hair or feathers, and designed to break the fall of any one jumping from a height. Nowadays the practice is to use a net made of heavy rope attached to springs to afford additional resiliency. The chances of any one jumping from a height of more than three stories must always be intensely hazardous. But all things considered, there appears to be a balance in favor of landing on the pillow. During that most distressing fire at the Ash Building in New York, when a number of lives were lost, several young women attempted to jump to safety, were caught in the net, and found death. The impetus their bodies gathered while falling was so terrific that the shock of the impact killed them in every case. Hence it will be seen that the firefighting world is still awaiting the genius of the inventor who will be able to devise some other means of catching unfortunates who are compelled by dire necessity to jump to their doom. This brief resume will have been sufficient to demonstrate the fact that the inclusion of firefighting amongst the scientific problems of the day, and as one worthy of serious consideration, dates from modern times, and hence the many improvements which have been introduced into its practice, are all of such recent origin that even now they are only just emerging from an embryonic stage. It is probable that the next century will witness advances along all lines of such immense consequence that present apparatus will be totally outclassed and will be relegated to the glass cases and dusty environment of museums, where the curious of future generations will gaze with interest, tinged possibly with amusement, at the appliances used to fight the flames by their forefathers. So far, the use of chemistry as an ally of water in subduing fires is only in its infancy, and though prophecy is admittedly unsatisfactory, and more often than not misleading, it may be hazarded that the cumbersome steam fire pump will in due course disappear from the sphere of active operations, 
and that the outbreaks of the future will be dealt with swiftly and easily by a combination of high-pressure streams coupled with chemical forces as yet inoperative. It has taken many centuries to evolve the fire departments of the present, but as so often happens, now that a scientific advance has at last been made, that advance will continue with increasing rapidity, until fire, as was always intended, shall be the servant and not the scourge of man. End of section three. Recording by Maria Casper. Section four of Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four. Past and Present. Reminiscences of a Firefighter. A sage once penned the dictum that fire makes a good servant but a bad master, and few practical firemen will be found to argue the accuracy of the statement. For the firefighter, life consists of one protracted struggle against this most crafty of elements, which oftentimes is most dangerous when apparently subdued, and which in its methods of attack would appear to be guided by some Machiavellian mastermind of strategy. Hence it goes without saying that to successfully cope with such an adversary demands the maximum of skill and determination, which are fundamental characteristics in the genus Fireman. The sailor is an idol of the public largely because he is ever pictured as pitting his seamanship and science against the two stubborn forces of wind and waves. In song and story he is immortalized as the acme of all that is dashing and fearless, and it is small wonder that the younger generation, inspired by such narratives, yearns to emulate such heroes. Yet, for some strange reason, the fireman has never occupied so large a place in popular romance. His deeds have not been chronicled with the same degree of graphic narration. The cheap notoriety of the music-hall ballad has perhaps happily been denied him, and it has remained for the daily press to utilize him as a convenient feature in the absence of other material. This must not be taken as implying any want of generosity on the part of those concerned, but naturally a minor fire, though involving considerable risk to those operating against it, cannot receive the same publicity as that accorded to some event of general interest. Also, it must be remembered that it is a common trait of human nature to accept, without particular comment, the services of any organization to which it has become accustomed. The average person is ignorant of the sea, except through the medium of what is written, and hence, being unfamiliar otherwise with the subject, instinctively envelops the calling of the sailor with a glamour of romanticism and mystery. Nevertheless, to those who care to seek it, there is a potent fascination in the career of a fireman, a life full of ever-varying incident, and a calling which may well appeal to the imagination of the young man in search of adventure. Picture a warm, well-lighted recreation room. A dozen firemen are gathered about tables, passing away the time with dominoes and pool, while one of their number is amusing himself at the piano by strumming over the latest popular airs. Suddenly the alarm gong sounds. It is a district call, and almost instantaneously the men are in their jerseys and boots. The pianist has disappeared down the sliding pole with a celerity which would put to shame the demon in a fairy play. While the others are following, the horses have already clattered from their stalls, and taken their allotted places under their harness. With a snap and a click, their collars are locked, the drivers leap to their seats, and as the station doors swing automatically open, the firemen clamber onto the apparatus, which is already under way. Not so bad, mutters the officer in charge, eighteen seconds from the alarm. Outside the night is chill and misty, intensified by a steady drizzle. The streets are greasy, and the engine rocks perilously from side to side, as, with bell clanging and siren sounding, it dashes at full speed along thoroughfares crowded with home-going pleasure-seekers. 
Arrived at the scene of the outbreak, it is found that the cause of the trouble is a large warehouse on the waterfront, full of combustible materials already well ablaze. The driver, versed in the geography of the district, pulls up at the nearest hydrant. A loud clattering heralds the approach of the hose wagon. A burly fireman deftly catches the end of a hose section thrown to him and couples up to the standpipe. Then the crew, with an automatic precision born of long experience, lay hold of their weapons, the hose pipes, and advance to the attack. Above the roar of the flames raging up the elevator shaft of the building resounds the shrill crescendo of a ship's whistle. A fireboat has responded to the call and is wending its way rapidly along the water's edge. Within a period measurable only by seconds, it also has joined in the fray and is directing several streams upon the rear of the main fire, thus carrying out the most effective maneuver in modern warfare, that of outflanking the enemy. Meantime, other engines and other apparatus have arrived. Curious crowds have collected, and strong drafts of police are kept busy in preventing the hampering of the brigade's efforts. A large motor draws up. Its occupant is the fire chief, distinguishable from all others by a white helmet. There is no confusion, little excitement. The general has arrived to take the supreme command. An officer briefly outlines the situation. The fire has gained such and such a hold. So many pieces of apparatus are being employed, with a certain end in view. The only question is whether the general is satisfied that the forces are being used to the best possible advantage. They decide that a personal inspection is necessary, and without delay the chief enters the building. Nearby stands a hospital ambulance, with its doctor and orderlies ready for any emergency, for even as on a battlefield casualties are to be expected. By order of the chief, a heavier attack is developed upon a particular portion of the structure, and an extension ladder shoots up through the murk, with men clinging cat-like to its rungs even as it lengthens. An order rings out, Start water, and a powerful jet is forced into the heart of the seething inferno. The crucial point in the attack upon the fire has now arrived. It is as though each contestant were summoning up his reserves, with a view to one overwhelming effort at mastery. Flames have crept into the cellars, rendering the task of the firemen in that quarter almost impossible. Several are overcome by heat and smoke, and are quickly removed to the ambulance, their places being speedily taken by reliefs. But still the fire gains. Moreover, a new ally assists the flames in the shape of a snapped, heavily charged electric light cable, like some huge serpent, it twists and writhes hither and thither, menacing with instant death those who again and again essay to check its career. It hisses venomously, its blue glare blinds them in the pervading gloom, until with one supreme effort it is seized and denuded of its fangs, being severed from the main. One successful skirmish does not, however, constitute a victory and a reinforcement of the enemy appears to check too confident an advance. The roof is yet intact, and upon the third floor the firemen are met by great volumes of dense smoke, which threaten a backdraft. With axes and hatchets, doors and shutters are demolished, anything to create a draft. A sheet of flame and a whirling eddy of sparks momentarily envelop the workers on the extension ladder, and few among the watchers can credit their safety as they emerge from this fiery whirlpool, clothes burnt, hair singed, hands blistered, but still fighting on with grim determination. That marked the last desperate stand of the enemy. The Niagara of water is beginning to tell, and a sullen pall of smoke darkens the angry brilliance of the blaze. Some of the companies are recalled to their stations to be in readiness for other outbreaks, while a sufficient number of men remain until the last vestiges of their foe have disappeared. Then they, too, retire, perchance to a well-earned rest. This is by no means an over-colored picture of an everyday fire in the warehouse district of any city. Moreover, it is devoid of the heart-rending scenes and nerve-wracking uncertainty 
inseparable from those occasions when human lives are involved. Thus, who shall say that the life of the fireman lacks that romance which is supposed to be inalienable from them that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters? As a matter of fact, the career of those who fight the flames teems with anecdotes of splendid courage, self-denying heroism, and hairbreadth escapes, which furnish material and to spare for the great masters of the pen. For instance, this from real life. During the progress of a serious fire in the city of Boston, the assistant chief went to the top of the building involved for the purpose of opening the hydrants connected with its water protection. While thus engaged, he was cut off from all means of escape save one, which consisted of a heavy telegraph cable connected to a separate building across the street. In order to make his predicament known, he threw his fire helmet to the ground many feet below. Extension ladders were erected with all rapidity, but were prevented from reaching him by a tangle of overhead wires. By this time his clothing was on fire, and the position was rapidly becoming untenable. All that separated possible life from a horrible death was that cable. Crawling to the edge of the building, he swung himself onto the wire, which swayed and quivered with his weight. With the utmost presence of mind, hand over hand and leg over leg, he worked his way toward the center of the cable, where he remained suspended ninety feet above the ground. Had the line run directly across the street, the officer, with the distance he had actually covered, would have reached safety. But unfortunately, the line was at an upward angle, and his efforts to reach the point which he had gained had sapped his vital energy to that degree which made further progress impossible. Men were hastily placed on hose wagons, which were backed in together to form a circle. A life net was then stretched between them in case his strength should give out and his grasp relax. Fortunately, at this juncture, one of the firemen with a special knowledge of knots made his way to the roof of the house upon which the fire free end of the cable was attached. Fastening a rope to the cable, he sawed the latter through thus enabling both man and cable to be lowered inch by inch towards the ground. When the knot joining cable to rope was reached, the officer lost his hold and was caught by his comrades in the net and carried into the street. This exciting escape proved no barrier to the further duty of this fireman, who twenty-four hours after this incident was able to report for service and carry on as though nothing had happened. In the early days, before fire departments had come to be officially recognized, dependents had necessarily to be placed upon volunteers, and many are the stories, humorous and pathetic, which could be told about them. The fascination of the service certainly extended to those who enrolled, judging by their social position, and by the fact that many of them gave up valuable time in order the better to qualify for their duties. Some peculiar entries are to be found in the old minute books of these stations, indicative of the fact that the commonest breach of discipline would appear to have been a too free use of strong language. Thus the secretary of one company reports a fireman for saying to him, You be damned, you damned old Dutch hog, for which he was severely reprimanded. While the Puritan spirit was carried so far that a man was fined for saying, Damn the odds. Some fifty years ago it was customary for all young men to belong to associations of some sort, religious, social, or political. The story goes that one such youth was sitting in a tavern, and overheard others of his age discussing the societies to which they subscribed. This filled him with a desire to go and do likewise. So on his return home he told his mother of his ambition, remarking that he was not particular as to the nature of the club which he joined. There was a great revival going on in those days, and like all good mothers, she told him to go with her and join the church. Well, quoth he, I don't specially care what it is, but I must belong to something. So down to the church he went. But to his chagrin the minister told him that he must be placed on probation for three months. When that period had expired, he was told that he must wait yet another two months. 
Some time passed when one day the minister happened to meet his probationer, walking down the street, in a neat red shirt, a gaudy pair of suspenders, a coat thrown over his arm, and bearing a number on his back. Aha, said the pastor, you're the one I want to see. You haven't been to church of late. No, Dominie, answered the young man, that probation was too long for me. But, cried the former, it is at an end, and now you can join the church. Too late, too late, Domini, I've joined an engine company down here, and it's going to take all my time to look after fires. I'm going to one now. You see, I was bound to join something, and these fellows let me in without any probation. All I had to do was give up two dollars, and I was called a member. Come round to see us, Domini, we've got as bully a little engine as ever went to a fire. From which it may be deduced that the pleasures of earthly fires were greater to the majority of young folk than the terrors of fires to come, as depicted, no doubt, in the Bible meetings. About that time, one of the most popular chiefs was James Gulick, who commanded the New York Fire Department. The following incident is illustrative of the affection in which he was held by his men. A fire had broken out in Center Street, adjoining the works of the New York Gas Company, which had destroyed two houses. Against the gable end of one of the burning buildings, a large number of barrels of resin were piled, and the firemen worked diligently to save them by rolling them into the street. The night was intensely cold, and somebody kindled a small fire with a part of the contents of a broken barrel, which the workmen employed by the gas company attempted to extinguish. These were warned by the firemen to desist, and a big heavy fellow who continued his efforts was pushed away. Thereupon a large number of his friends attacked the few firemen in charge, who were joined by their comrades, and a fight ensued. The brigade was victorious. Gulick heard of the affair, and hastened to the scene, exclaiming, "'What does all this shameful conduct mean at such a moment?' The only answer was a blow from a workman, who struck his head from behind with an iron bar, and only his helmet protected him from serious injury. Turning upon his assailant, the chief pursued him across the ruins of a fallen wall and threw him upon the debris, but was followed in his turn by some thirty or forty employees. "'Men, stand by your chief!' was the cry of the devoted brigade, and in an instant the attack was turned into a rout, the workmen taking refuge in the gas house. Gulick, by almost superhuman efforts, forced an entrance in advance of his enraged followers, and amid volleys of coal buckets called upon the rioters to surrender, promising protection. His reply was a charge with a red-hot poker, which fortunately passed through his trumpet which he carried under his arm. This put an end to his forbearance, and jumping from the doorway he shouted, "'Now, men, surround the house. Don't let one of them escape.' The excited firemen rushed into the building and administered a sound thrashing to their truculent foes, who were afterwards arrested, and even then the former were not appeased, and attempted to destroy the machinery, which was only saved by the chief's firmness and discipline. After the great fire of 1835, which caused twenty million dollars worth of damage, and dislodged more than six hundred mercantile firms, the resignation of Gulick was demanded, upon which the brigade in toto struck work, and it was only with the greatest difficulty that it was re-established on a satisfactory basis. Perhaps the writer may be forgiven for trespassing upon the patience of his readers, to the extent of drawing from his own personal experience some anecdotes illustrative of the various phases of his life, both before and since he became a fireman. If there is any truth in the old adage that experientia docet, then assuredly thirty years of practical firefighting in the largest organization of the kind in the world, entitle him to form some opinions and arrive at some conclusions. It would not be difficult to write a whole book with the personal material at hand, but the present object is rather briefly to show how any young man, minus influence or capital, but possessed of determination, may climb the ladder leading to positions of grave responsibility, and ultimately to the head of his chosen profession. Incidentally, the writer wishes to emphasize the fact that his advancement was in no way due to any exceptional opportunities 
or to what is termed popularly good luck, but rather to a steady and unremitting attention to duty, coupled with some of that perseverance which in that historic race between the hare and the tortoise gave the victory to the latter. Since the following narratives are the writer's own experiences, it seems more apropos to relate them in the first person. At the immature age of three I may claim to have received my baptism of fire, since, like most other youngsters, anything to do with the forbidden joys of matches possessed an unholy fascination for me. One day, while playing with some other children, whose tastes were similar to my own, I conceived the brilliant idea of making a good blaze in the hay-yard. I cannot remember whence I procured the matches, which in those days were a great luxury and were carefully hoarded, but since desire is the father of acquisition, by hook or crook I secured some. And what could make a better bonfire than a haystack? Within less time than it takes to write, one was in flames, and we jumped and danced around it, playing at Red Indians, until some unsympathetic neighbors came running from all directions, gesticulating wildly. It then occurred to me, for the first time, that I had done wrong, and I promptly showed a clean pair of heels to avenging justice. Running into the house, I hid under the bed, and while workmen and friends busied themselves in saving the house, I lay there not daring to emerge. Not until the excitement had subsided were inquiries made as to the origin of the fire, and, knowing my foibles, I, of course, was suspected, and a search was instituted for the incipient firebug. It did not take long to discover me and drag me forth, when my angry mother carried me to an adjacent stream, telling me that such naughty boys had better be drowned early in life than be allowed to live to burn up property and people. My feelings of remorse can easily be imagined, and I promised that never in my life would I again start a fire, and that always I would do whatever lay in my power to extinguish conflagrations. But this childish prank, aside from the promise that I made on that occasion, which I have ever kept, taught me one great lesson. It is that children, when frightened by fire, have a tendency to conceal themselves under beds, and therefore in searching a dwelling firemen never neglect to look carefully in these hiding-places. When children are awakened by suffocating smoke, or by members of the household during excitement consequent upon fire, unless watched they will invariably crawl under beds, thinking in their childish fancy that thereby they are safely hidden from the flames, and many a little body is on that account brought forth lifeless. It is, of course, difficult to lay down any hard and fast rule for occasions of this sort, but it might be impressed upon children from their very earliest years that under no circumstances should they adopt this method of hiding. Whether in games or to avoid mamma with a slipper, the practice is a bad one, and though the actual occasion may never arise to prove the value of this instruction, it will undoubtedly, in that odd chance of five hundred, be the means of preserving a precious life. In fact, this is the epitome of fire control. Watch and be prepared for the odd chance. For just as the individual who is foolish enough to carry a revolver will probably never need it, but if he does, will need it uncommonly badly, so in all fire precautions necessity for their use may never arise, but should the unforeseen happen, their absence may prove disastrous. From my childhood I always possessed a great love for the sea, and thus it happened that at the age of thirteen I shipped as boy in a topsail schooner bound from Whitehaven to Dundalk with a cargo of coal. Her name was the Gazelle, and judging by her behavior on that eventful trip, her owners were not mistaken in thus christening her. We left Whitehaven in the middle of an unusually stormy December, and by the time we were off the Isle of Man we were running into a howling southeasterly gale, which was not improved by incessant squalls of blinding sleet. Needless to say, I experienced the additional discomfort of being horribly seasick, not that on that account I was permitted to escape my share of the ship's work. I can remember as though it were yesterday, making my way along the wave-swept decks, 
and wondering what on earth had ever induced me to leave the comforts of terra firma for such an inferno of physical torment as was apparently offered by a sea life after hours of incessant tacking we managed to make belfast lauf where we found shelter and anchored preparatory to riding the storm out the ship was in a terribly battered condition sails blown to ribbons boats washed away and half the bulwarks gone ship's boy in those days was synonymous with maid of all work and as there is so it is affirmed no rest for the wicked i was promptly told off to make up a good fire in the bogey a dirty little black stove which smoked incessantly and had been the bane of my existence during the voyage full of anxiety to disprove the reputation which i had gained as a seasick landlubber i stoked up and soon had a warm comfortable glow in the forecastle then i turned in it must have been a half an hour later that i awakened to find the heat becoming oppressive the cause was not far to seek the boat was afire the black bogey had again played me a low trick and had become red hot moreover the flu had caught the infection and in turn was transmitting the disease so effectually that bulkhead and deck planking were emitting a miniature vesuvius of smoke and sparks without waiting for any instructions i attacked the invader with buckets of water the sleepy crew lending an extraordinarily willing hand when they realized that their belongings were in peril on the painful events following the captain's reappearance i will not dwell suffice it to say that i received the smartest lacing the old man could give me the memory of which remained with me long after i had left the merchant service but the moral is obvious anything more ludicrous than stovepipes passing through unprotected wooden bulkheads would be hard to imagine yet such is the conservatism of the sea that it is by no means uncommon to find such conditions even today in small coasters and smacks the foregoing was my first fire at sea but i was fated to have another experience of a more serious character i happened to be quartermaster in the old abyssinia of the now defunct guion line plying between new york and liverpool we had sailed from the former port in the month of july with nine hundred passengers of all classes and a full cargo of cotton about two hundred eighty miles east of cape race a fire was discovered in the main hold which though located in the middle of the night was kept from the passengers knowledge until noon of the following day when the united efforts of the crew had been found insufficient to cope with the outbreak the captain then decided to call upon the passengers to lend a hand and men and women from saloon intermediate and steerage bravely combined with the sailors in their dangerous task happily the sea was smooth and to the lasting credit of all concerned there was no panic steam was used to fight the burning cotton and as the seamen were overcome by smoke in the darkness of the hold volunteers took their places with the result that after three days of incessant labor the outbreak was under control had there been a panic or had the flames gained the upper hand the result would have been hideous beyond words since there were only boats to accommodate three hundred persons it only remains to add that queenstown was made in safety without any casualty and though the incident lacks any spectacular element it contains material for thought regarding the principles governing fire control at sea the use of steam on shipboard for the extinction of fires is general though its efficiency is open to serious question when water becomes steam it is practically non-absorbent since in assuming this form it has been subjected to great heat as the object desired in fighting a fire is the absorption of the heat created by the flames it is apparent that any element at a high temperature is unable to obtain with certainty its reduction all that can be expected from steam is that by its moisture it may be able to check a further advance of the enemy hence if steam must be used let it contain as much moisture as possible or in simple language let it be used at as low a temperature as is compatible with its existence 
but in the opinion of the writer the whole subject is one of such a highly complex character and withal of such overwhelming importance that it merits the study and consideration of all concerned in the safety of passengers and cargo in ocean-going vessels about the autumn of eighteen seventy eight i shipped as first officer on a steamer bound from chicago to buffalo with a cargo of oats all went well until we were in lake erie about sixty miles from buffalo i had a trick at the wheel from eight to twelve in the first night watch and on being relieved i went forward to the deck-house filled my pipe and prepared to enjoy a smoke scarcely had i got it well alight when i heard a cry of fire and rushing out saw flames bursting through the after hatch close to the companionway leading to the cabin the captain who had been on deck most of the time during the first watch had gone below a few minutes before his wife who was with us on the trip was in the cabin at that moment running aft i realized we had a very dangerous fire with which to contend the deck watch in charge of the mate attacked the blaze and i dashed into the cabin to notify the captain and his wife in a few minutes they were both on deck and the fire had so increased that i suggested the advisability of getting out the boat and launching in addition the life raft which we carried this was agreed upon since the steamer was constructed of wood and her condition was hopeless we succeeded in lowering the raft but the flames had spread with such rapidity that they had enveloped that part of the ship from which the lifeboat swung making its launching an impossibility wrapping a blanket around the captain's wife who was clad only in her nightdress we were able to get her on the raft but she suddenly remembered that her jewelry had been left behind and implored her husband to secure it for her his complaisance almost cost him his life for on his return to the cabin he was severely burnt about the head and face and he failed in addition to gain his object the dry oats proved excellent fuel and it speedily became evident that the ship was doomed we had either to remain by it or to take to the raft which was built to carry ten persons while we were fourteen all told the stokers engineers and deckhands joined the terrified woman while the captain the mate and i went forward to that part of the vessel which was not yet involved in the general conflagration we stood together near the bow watching the fire advance slowly towards us the heat was intense and the lake was lighted up for miles around by the flames suddenly the foremast fell it barely missed the captain who stood in a dazed condition by my side the mate and i realized that in a few minutes we should be forced to jump overboard and made ready by removing our clothing until we stood only in our undershirts and trousers from the raft which was about two hundred fifty feet to windward of the burning vessel came an imploring cry beseeching the captain to leave his ship and come to his wife he shook hands with us and sprang overboard as he was a powerful swimmer he was soon alongside the raft we however remained where we were for perhaps ten minutes when it became a question of death by fire or taking our chances in the water the water seemed inviting in comparison with the flames and we did not hesitate to plunge overboard after saying good-bye and murmuring a few words of prayer never shall i forget my sensations when i felt the cold waters of lake erie that october morning actually blistering from the heat i thought i had been suddenly transported to paradise between the pleasures of dying by drowning and the horrors of being roasted to death there is a gulf almost as wide as that which divides the celestial realms from the regions of the damned and the sense of security and relief from pain was almost indescribable but now a new difficulty confronted me i had learned to swim in salt water and i found the fresh water exceedingly light and hard in which to keep afloat by easy strokes i contrived to get near the raft but alas there was no room for me upon it and any such attempt on my part would have spelled disaster and probable death to all concerned 
Floating and swimming by turns, I kept up for about an hour, when my strength began to waver, and semi-unconsciousness supervened. Amongst the crew was a negro cook, who sang songs and cracked jokes in an effort to keep up the courage of his unfortunate comrades. All the time that I had been swimming by the raft, this cheerful creature had watched me, and as I was about to sink, I felt his hand take hold of my shirt, and heard his voice in words of comfort. He quietly drew me towards him, and with the help of the chief engineer got me securely seated on the raft. Then he slipped overboard, where he lay on his back and floated like a chip. For seven hours he stayed in the water, helping the captain and mate alternately to rest on the raft when they became exhausted. The chief engineer and another took turns in swimming, but neither of them stayed in the water as long as did this sturdy colored man. Never once did he complain. He was the same cheerful soul at the end of his long trial as he had been when he left Chicago. We were rescued eventually by a tug which had put out from Buffalo, having seen the flames sixty miles away. The memory of that brave negro has always remained with me. I may say I owe my life to him, for though I am a fair swimmer, I could never have lasted through those terrible eight hours without his unselfish assistance. There has always been in my heart a feeling of gratitude, not alone to this brave fellow, who I am sorry to say lost his life afterwards in a railway accident, but to the race to which he belonged. Many years afterwards, when an engineer of a certain company, I had an opportunity of vicariously paying off something of this debt. We responded to a fire which proved to be in a tenement occupied by colored people. The building was already a mass of flames, and several persons on the upper floors were cut off from escape. Two colored women and a little boy were trapped on the third floor. Mounting to the windows by extension ladders, we could see them with their clothing already on fire. The only chance of saving them was a desperate one, but we took it. Fireman Malavi and I entered and succeeded in passing the three to others outside, who carried them safely to the ground. The boy and the young woman are alive today, but the elder woman was so badly burnt that she died in the hospital on the following morning. It only remains to be said that the one life lost in the Lake Erie fire was that of the captain's wife, who succumbed shortly afterwards from exposure, a circumstance made doubly sad from the fact that she was a beautiful bride of only four months. Curiously enough, my first active service in the New York Fire Department was in connection with a vessel on fire, and is illustrative of the adage that all knowledge is valuable. As is usually the case with a new member of the force, I was extremely nervous during my first nights at the station. Although my seafaring life had taught me to be accustomed to turning out at any moment and in all sorts of weather, I found that the watching and waiting for the alarm gong possessed a mental strain of its own, which is incidentally common to all firefighters. During the night in question I had lain awake with tense nerves, fearing that the call might come and that I might get left behind. Then I fell into a troubled sleep, to be roused by the sound I had so long expected. In my anxiety I stumbled over my own boots and narrowly escaped upsetting my neighbor, who did not appreciate the attention. I gained my object, however, and my nightmare of missing my first alarm dissolved as we galloped through the silent streets. A French ship was involved, a fire having broken out in the forward hold. With enthusiasm I seized a length of hose, only to be told in official phraseology to leave it alone. Not comprehending the order, I attempted to board the vessel, but was stopped by the battalion chief, who recognized in me a recruit. Perhaps I may here remark that it took me a full month to master the regular words of command which are peculiar to fire departments. Eventually I found my chance, for with my marine knowledge I knew how best to tackle the trouble, and, creeping along through the smoke, made my way to the heart of the outbreak. There I was found later by the chief, who, finding me on my face, using the hose to the best of my ability, 
told me to get up, and lending me a helping hand, together we extinguished the fire. I was later complimented on my action, and I am happy to say that my kindly mentor still survives and occupies an honored position in the department. Out of the memories of my many years' experience of firefighting, it is difficult to select one particular conflagration as being more thrilling in its incidents than any other. All fires entail risk to life in a greater or smaller degree, and are therefore replete with that human interest which makes special appeal to the heart. For even in the factory or warehouse outbreak, human lives are endangered, the lives of the firemen employed. But sometimes circumstances do arise which require the pen of a Stevenson to give them that actuality and force which alone can depict them in their fearful vividness. To my dying day I shall never forget the horrors accompanying the burning of the Park Avenue Hotel. At one thirty in the morning of February 22, 1902, the gong in the quarters of Engine Company 72 sounded 33446, which translated into bald English signified the fact that a dangerous and threatening fire was raging in the vicinity of Park Avenue and 34th Street, in the borough of Manhattan, New York City. In other words, it was a third alarm, summoning to the scene thirteen engine companies, four hook-and-ladder companies, the chief of the department, the deputy chief, and four battalion chiefs. Engine Company 72 responded on the third alarm, and in less than twenty seconds after the receipt of the first tap of the gong, they were clear of the doors of the quarters and on their way to the fire. At that time I was captain of this company, and beginning to feel the full weight of my responsibility. A fierce gale from the northeast raged about us as we left our comfortable quarters, the snow and sleet lashing our faces and making vision almost impossible. The driver of the engine has since often assured me that for a mile and a half of the distance to be covered, he let his horses gallop without knowing his precise whereabouts. Yet in spite of the storm, we reached the scene of the fire in less than five minutes. On our arrival, we found that the 71st Regimental Armory, situated at the southeast corner of Park Avenue and 34th Street, was ablaze. The interior of this imitation fortress was of wood, and filled with arms and ammunition of every description. Evidently the fire had been burning for some time, for as we pulled up there was a constant rattle of exploding cartridges, for all the world as though our services had been requisitioned to a field of battle. In addition to this, the building was heavily charged with smoke, which reached the explosive point as soon as an opening admitting a fresh supply of oxygen was effected. Orders were received from the commanding officer, Deputy Chief Duane, that a line was to be taken into the armory by the 34th Street entrance. At this moment the truck companies succeeded in opening these doors, but the pressure of heated air and gas blew the men back into the street. Almost instantly the whole interior of the building was a seething mass of flame. Nothing further apparently could be done here, as my instructions then were to cover the dwelling houses on the east side of 34th Street, where we fought the fire back until the wall of this part of the armory fell outwards, burying our line and cutting it in two. Some idea of the difficulties confronting us can be imagined when I add that the position from which we were fighting consisted of a narrow strip of street some twenty-five feet wide, bounded on one side by the flames, and on the other by a trench forty feet deep, which was being prepared for the reception of the present subway. The break in our line naturally shut off the stream, and I went immediately to see what had happened. Meeting the officer in charge, I was ordered to take yet another position in Park Avenue in order to cover the Fourth Avenue car stables. These were to the south of the fire, and it was this change which brought my company into a position which enabled it to assist in the most harrowing and exciting events that I have ever experienced on land or sea. To begin with, this maneuver necessitated our crossing the subway trench, which, incidentally, we were told, contained three tons of blasting powder. 
It has always been a marvel to me that this did not explode, exposed as it was to sparks and burning embers. We managed to reach our goal in safety by means of the engineering shores used in the cut-and-cover system of excavation. At this moment, from some unexplained cause, the Park Avenue Hotel took fire. The figure of a woman clad only in her nightclothes appeared at a fifth-story window, and above the roar of the flames and the exploding of the ammunition could be heard screaming for help. Even as her voice rang out, guests could be seen watching the conflagration from their bedrooms, while in the foyer men were strolling about, cigars in their mouths, discussing with interest the probable amount of damage which would be caused by the blaze. Little did they realize that the angel of death, with wings outstretched, was hovering over the building in which they were. Our change of position made us among the foremost to effect an entrance. From the first we were hampered by the revolving doors, which prevented our handling our lines with facility. Thus valuable time was lost, and our task rendered the more difficult. Our arrival had been heralded with the frankest incredulity, but once the onlookers realized the grisly danger threatening their dear ones, they had to be forcibly restrained from adding themselves to the human sacrifices awaiting us upon the floors above. As we climbed the stairs, the smoke grew denser and denser, till our breath came in strangling gasps, and physical endurance seemed about to fail. It was impossible to see. On hands and knees we groped and felt like blind men, instinct our only guide. And then the horror. Imagine crawling sightless along a strange corridor. Imagine the outstretched hand wandering over an unknown substance which slowly reveals itself to be a corpse. That would be a ghastly situation. But add to it the distant crackling of flame, licking its way remorselessly from floor to floor, the shouts of firemen in difficulty, the sobs and piteous entreaties, of unseen women dying slowly from suffocation, and can hell be pictured as more hideous. Grimly, however, all ranks alike stuck to their lines, scrambled over these gruesome barriers, and with almost miraculous tenacity of purpose succeeded in quelling the grim destroyer. As a matter of fact, the whole outbreak was under control within a short time, and it was then possible to realize the tragic uncertainty of life. For had the men and women whose lifeless forms encumbered the passages only remained in their rooms, not one need have been lost. As we returned from the Holocaust and passed through the front hall, it seemed incredible even then that there were those who were still skeptical that death the reaper had passed with his scythe. But next day the unfortunates in the tomb's prison knew of the harvest, for amongst those who had fallen in the mowing was one whom they called their angel, Mrs. Foster, the Florence Nightingale of the prisoners. No lives were lost in the armory fire, but the number of persons who perished in the hotel amounted to twenty. It is naturally impossible to lay down hard and fast rules for the guidance of people who are unfortunate enough to be caught in such fires. But broadly, the safest course to pursue is to avoid the vicinity of elevator shafts. Perhaps I may include amongst these few stories an incident so commonplace to the firefighter that it was never even officially reported, but which should bring home to the outsider the daily unconsidered risks accepted by the former without demur. On this particular occasion, the captain of our company received orders to take his line to the roof of the building to the north of the one on fire. The intention was to breach the wall of the burning structure with battering rams in order to better attack the flames. As our point of vantage was some fifteen feet lower than the top of the wall to be attacked, this move was excellent strategy. We lowered our roof rope to the street, where it was made fast to the hose and hoisted up to be in readiness. In order to make it perfectly secure, I was instructed to lash it at the cornice of the roof with a special knot, known to firemen as a rolling hitch, 
preparatory to starting the water. Properly to adjust the knot, it was necessary for me to lie at full length near the edge. I had just got a turn of the rope round the hose, when a warning cry caused me to look round, and I saw all hands running for the north coping. There was no need to tell me that the wall was falling, and I jumped to my feet, letting go of rope and hose. By great good luck I escaped becoming entangled with them, or I should have been dragged to my death. Just as I reached my comrades, the wall crashed down, carrying with it the roof of our building, and the fire instantly swept into the rooms beneath us. It then became imperative that we should reach the next house by hook or crook or perish. Between us and safety was a pocket. That is to say, there was first a drop of some fifteen feet onto tiles, followed by a climb of the same height up a bare wall. This latter appeared to offer an insurmountable obstacle, but the fire was hard on our heels, and desperate men reck little of seeming impossibility. One of our number, a giant in stature and strength, named Michael Byrne, raised me on his shoulders, and like an acrobat I placed my feet in his hands, making our combined length almost the height of the wall. With a slight spring I succeeded in clutching the top of the coping, and with sailor-like agility I hauled myself up. Finding a short ladder on the roof, I passed it down, by which means the others escaped, though the captain, the last to leave his post of danger, was badly burnt about the face and hands. While there must always be difficulty attendant upon the fighting of fires, as can be imagined, those that occur in the winter months are by far the most physically trying. For instance, during the great blizzard of 1888, which paralyzed all traffic in New York, my company was summoned to a fire. All telegraph wires were down, and the alarm was brought in by a mounted messenger. On leaving the quarters we found the streets nearly impassable, and after an odd hundred yards our apparatus became stalled. We then commandeered any horses we could find, and pushing and pulling we worked our way through the snowdrifts to within three hundred yards of the outbreak, where the engine pole snapped in two. We left the latter where it was, but succeeded in securing sufficient hose to be serviceable, and for thirty-six hours we remained on duty without food or rest. Again, it sometimes happens that fire hydrants become frozen, and precious time is lost in thawing them, though nowadays this occurrence is becoming increasingly rare, owing to the improvements introduced in modern water supply. But in northern latitudes King Frost is the bete noire of the firefighter, and must be held indirectly responsible for some of those catastrophes which occur during his reign. In concluding these brief personal reminiscences, the writer hopes that he has shown, in a straightforward way, what the life of a firefighter really is, the stirring incidents which compose it, and the great possibilities therein for young men of enterprise and ambition. Some months ago the whole civilized world was stirred to its depths by the tragic and glorious death of the British explorer Captain Scott. It has been said, and said rightly, that the world is the better for the man and his example, which will live through the ages, and doubtless will serve to stimulate others when called upon to face great crises. And the writer ventures to say, with all humility, that the fireman hero, though unknown to history and unsung in legend, meets death as bravely and dies as gloriously in the service of his country and his people. End of section four. Recording by Maria Casper. Section five of Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five. The French Firefighter. The history of the Paris Fire Brigade is of exceptional interest and well deserves study. Its early organization and manifold developments were contemporary with the principal change of thought and government in France, 
and to a certain degree echo the tendency of different forms of state control favored in that country during the past two centuries. In the year 1716, the city of Paris organized its first regularly constituted firefighting force. This consisted, so it is stated, of 36 manual engines with a personnel of 40 to operate them. By 1785, the personnel had increased to 300, and in 1789 the first fire regulations were issued. The year 1807 saw the force placed under the command of the prefect of police, and the introduction of the brass helmet, which is still worn by brigades of distinctly conservative tendencies, notably the London force. Thus, whilst originally a civil organization, in 1811 it was turned into a military corps, and in 1867 it was advanced to the status of a regular regiment, commanded by a colonel and consisting of two battalions of five companies each. In this formation it remains today, with the slight difference that now each battalion numbers six companies, its official designation being Le Regiment des Sapeurs Pompiers. By its constitution, the Paris Fire Brigade is something more than a purely firefighting force. In times of disturbance or war, it may be called upon for military duty, though it is difficult to see how the fire risks of Paris could be guarded were such a step ever taken. However, though under the military authorities, as far as recruiting, internal administration, discipline, promotion, and punishment are concerned, for fire purposes, it is placed under the direct orders of the prefect of police, whose wishes regarding all technical matters, such as scientific training, fire mobilization, and equipment, are paramount. Add to this that the city of Paris is financially responsible for the entire expense of the regiment, and it will be seen that there are no less than three interested parties in the maintenance of this corps. Hence, in order to avoid confusion and friction, there is a joint committee formed of members from these administrations, which settles all questions involving its common interests. The present strength of the force consists of the colonel commanding, 48 officers, 4 medical officers, and 1,803 non-commissioned officers and men. Of the latter, 200 are sergeants, 316 are corporals, the balance of 1,287 being rated as firemen. As a rule, officers are recruited from ordinary infantry regiments, entering as sub-lieutenants, but they are first obliged to pass a medical and technical examination before a special commission. If successful, they then undergo a course of fire service instruction, and are required to attend all important fires as spectators in order to familiarize themselves with the actual handling of apparatus. No doubt it is easy to be hypercritical, but to the scientific firefighter this appears to introduce an element of weakness. The marine engineer officer does not learn his calling by watching the efforts of others, any more than the surgeon is qualified to operate upon a patient because he has had the chance of observing the greatest masters of the knife. It cannot be too strongly emphasized that firefighting is a science which demands of its students that they should understand its complexities from A to Z, and this can never be accomplished by any amount of theoretical schooling. To this extent, then, it may be questioned whether the training of the officers serving in the Paris Fire Department is of the best for practical purposes. Non-commissioned officers, who under the conscription law may elect to do their service with this corps, are not required to pass the technical test should they wish to remain with the regiment. Senior non-commissioned officers rank as warrant officers, and as a rule serve for twenty-five years, while corporals and firemen are limited to fifteen years' service, then retiring with a pension. The regiment is recruited principally from artisans, builders, laborers, mechanics, and coachmen, the idea presumably being that most of the running repairs and a certain proportion of constructional work should be carried out by these men in the workshops of the brigade. Now, this system is also open to comment. 
a fireman should be first and foremost a fireman. The last thing that should be made of him is a jack of all trades. His calling is of the most strenuous, and when not actively engaged at fires, he has plenty to do in seeing that his apparatus is in proper condition. To set him to construct the body of a departmental automobile or to repair a major defect in a pumping engine is to remove him from his proper sphere of operations, and since science has not yet solved the problem of keeping one man in two places at the same time, the actual fighting units must be proportionately weakened. The pay of the Paris firemen, according to American ideas, is so small as to seem ludicrous, but it should be remembered that it is based upon the army scale, which in all European countries is framed upon as low a basis as possible. It commences roughly at thirty cents per diem, rising to forty-four cents should the fireman gain the rank of corporal during his three years under the conscription law. Otherwise, the pay of those proposing to qualify for a pension ranges from two hundred seventy-five dollars to three hundred twenty-five dollars per annum. Free quarters are provided for the married and unmarried non-commissioned officers and men, as well as lights, fuel, and uniforms, but no messing is included. Regular firemen get thirty days leave annually, but conscriptionaires only fifteen, there being short leave once a week for all ranks. It will be seen from an examination of the following table that the area of Paris has increased in the proportion of 1 to 2.26 since 1841, and that the number of fires is ten times as many as at that date. During the same period, the strength of the brigade has only been doubled. Table Year 1841 Brigade strength 803 Area of Paris 13.26 square miles Population, 935,260. One fireman for each 1,145 inhabitants. Expenditure, $146,745, or £29,349. Number of fires, 203. One fire every 43 hours. 1857. Brigade strength, 889. Area of Paris, 13.26 square miles. Population, 1,278,705. One fireman for each 1,438 inhabitants. Expenditure, $169,380, or £33,876. Number of fires, 298. One fire every 29 hours. 1860, brigade strength, 1,208. Area of Paris, 30.2 square miles. Population, 1,537,486. One fireman for each 1,241 inhabitants. Expenditure, $208,495, or £41,699. Number of fires, 445. One fire every 19 hours. 1867. Brigade strength, 1,498. Area of Paris, 30.2 square miles. Population, 1,848,075. One fireman for each 1,233 inhabitants. Expenditure, $295,525, or £59,105. Number of fires, 690. One fire every 12 hours. 1879. Brigade strength, 1,690. Area of Paris, 30.2 square miles. Population, 2,126,230. One fireman for each 1,258 inhabitants. Expenditure, $364,620, or £72,926. Number of fires, 878, or one fire every 10 hours. 
1910, Brigade Strength 1,803, Area of Paris 30.2 square miles, Population 2,763,393, One Fireman for each 1,532 inhabitants, Expenditure $721,400, or 144,280 pounds. Number of fires, 2,030. One fire every four hours, 20 minutes. The statistics in the last annual report show, as stated above, that the brigade attended 2,030 fires, exclusive of chimney fires, which numbered 1,554. They also rendered various additional services, amounting in the aggregate to 444 calls. These last were exceptionally numerous during that year, owing to there being many cases in which assistance was given in connection with floods in Paris, work in which the Corps has always especially distinguished itself. Over and above these legitimate calls, the Department responded to no less than 727 false alarms. Before going into a detailed description of the equipment and work of the brigade, it may not be amiss to point out certain factors in connection with its constitution which will enable the lay reader the better to appreciate the vital part this force plays in fire protection throughout the whole of France. Owing to the number of young men who elect to do their military service in its ranks, and who at the end of their allotted time pass out into civil life, there are all over France many serving in rural and provincial forces who have thus acquired a considerable amount of useful experience, and whose influence must be advantageous in the development of local fire control. In fact, it is worthy of notice that the Paris Fire Force is regarded by the authorities as something more than a municipal institution. Rather, it is intended to meet national requirements. Thus, as a rule, a squad of sailors from the French Navy is attached for an instructional course of six weeks, as it is felt that opportunity should be given to all in government employ to acquaint themselves with the rudiments of this science. That the constitution of the Paris Fire Department is clumsy cannot be denied, since it is under military, police, and municipal control. Yet the introduction of military influence may perhaps be regarded as beneficial. A certain prestige attaches to any form of military control, and in this instance has caused this force to be looked upon as something in the nature of a corps d'élite. Broadly speaking, whilst a brigade which is essentially a municipal institution may develop a tendency towards loss of status and lack of discipline in its truest form, owing to political, party, or labor influence, yet it seems the most logical form of organization. But at the same time, fire control is a question of such serious moment that some form of governmental ascendancy in the hands of a competent central authority appears to be beneficial, if not absolutely necessary. At any rate, the basic structure of a modern fire department should be molded along semi-military lines, for even as on a battlefield, success or failure, victory or defeat, may be largely determined by the unquestioning obedience of all ranks to their superior officers, so when fighting as crafty an enemy as fire, it requires not only the skill of the commander, but also the confidence and prompt compliance with orders on the part of subordinates. This can only be engendered by a quasi-military training, such as it has ever been the ambition of New York fire chiefs to inculcate into the force under their command. There are no doubt many excellent fire brigades controlled wholly by municipalities, but there are also many bad and inefficient ones, which apparently satisfy ignorant and incompetent local authorities. Fire prevention in Paris itself is practically looked upon as an administrative precautionary measure, initiated and applied by the prefect of police, after consultation with the officers of the Paris Fire Brigade, with the municipal technical officers, and with such other parties as have some concern in the matter. Amongst the general public, the architectural, engineering, or surveying professions, 
and even in governmental circles, little or no interest is manifested in the question. There is, in fact, no body either in Paris or France framed along the lines of the British Fire Prevention Committee, which is representative of technical opinion and is formed with the express intention of formulating precautionary rules. Of course, after some great disaster, an irresponsible clamor for precautionary measures must needs arise, and in this particular Paris is no whit different from New York or London. Fanned by a sensation-loving daily press, blame is scattered broadcast, quite irrespective of equity, and the simple necessities of the situation are swamped by the volume of hysterical and irrational vaporings poured forth by the ignorant. And, be it added, like most press sensations, the matter is speedily forgotten, and nothing permanent eventuates. Such agitation arose after the disaster at the Paris Charity Bazaar, after the burning of the Iroquois Theatre in Chicago, after the destruction of the Exeter Theatre in England. But, curiously enough, until very recently, it never resulted in any organized effort on the part of members of the public possessing technical knowledge to combine and assist the authorities on the subject. Thus, for practical purposes, it will be seen that the Paris Prefect of Police embodies all the initiative which should be provided by a French Bureau of Fire Control. At the same time, however, he is possessed of two great advantages, which enable him to use his position of amiable autocracy to the fullest extent, namely the funds and the personnel wherewith to investigate matters, to undertake tests, and to enforce by means of administrative order such safeguards as he may see fit to demand. But equally, the lack of public interest in fire prevention places him in a most unenviable predicament, inasmuch as having no private scientific society or public commission to take the initiative and demand certain safeguards, he is necessarily compelled to act on his own discretion. Hence, were it not that Monsieur Lepine, the world-renowned ex-chief of the Paris police, was a man combining the greatest strength of character with an iron tenacity of will, it is no exaggeration to say that that city would be one of the worst equipped of the great modern capitals as far as fire control is concerned. In this connection must also be noted the names of Monsieur Lepine's most able and competent colleagues, Colonel Vuicon and Lieutenant Colonel Cordier. For effective measures of fire protection, Paris is divided into 24 zones, the size of which is governed by the density of the population. In each of these zones is a fire station with which the fire alarms are connected. Each station is equipped with not less than three firefighting appliances, a motor-propelled steam pump, long ladder, and hose wagon. In addition, the four stations situated in the most populous sections are provided with an electromobile first aid machine fitted with a small electrically driven pump. These machines are intended to deal with a fire in its first stages, much in the same way as the chemical engines common to American fire practice. The number of men on duty at each station consists of three non-commissioned officers and 26 corporals and firemen. In the event of a call, the fire station notified immediately sends out one or two appliances, and at the same time telephones the next nearest station to the scene of the outbreak. While stations help each other in sending on appliances to calls, they do not as a rule deplete their apparatus to a dangerous degree. The pump and ladder are always employed for the defense of the zone belonging to a particular station, and are always the first upon the scene. Fifteen men form the crew of the motor engines, which also carry three hose reels, with 1,968 feet of large hose, 525 feet of small hose, smoke helmet and air bottles, life-saving lines, and a ventilator. These machines are of 45 to 60 horsepower and have a centrifugal pump which can deliver 660 gallons a minute. Horse-drawn steamers carry 1,575 feet of hose, 
short ladders, and all the necessary gear for coupling up with hydrants. Whether shipped on motor or horse vehicles, the long ladder can be extended to a height of 65 and one-half feet. Motor traction is being rapidly introduced, and at the present moment there are in the brigade 49 automobiles, of which eight are electrically propelled. In addition, 76 horses are hired by contract, on the understanding that they are entirely at the disposal of the department. The contractor furnishes fodder and bedding for the horses, as well as the necessary harness and stable gear, for which he receives 83 cents per horse per diem. The training of these animals is good, though being of Flemish breed they are too heavy for the dashing work accomplished by many other fire brigades. Paris possesses seven reservoirs which supply its fire hydrants, the installation of which was commenced in 1872. These latter now number 7,726, and when the system is complete they will be about a hundred yards apart. Their nozzle pressure varies from 15 to 75 pounds according to the height of the reservoirs, and usually the average pressure is sufficient for working purposes. Besides these, there are 691 hydrants belonging to public buildings or private firms. The brigade can be called, firstly, by 521 alarm boxes situated in the public streets, secondly, by 495 private fire alarms in theaters, public buildings, and so forth, and thirdly, by the use of the police or public telephones. All such alarms are of practically the same pattern. They consist of a square box upon a pedestal, instructions for operating being printed upon the glass front of the apparatus. On breaking this glass, the door automatically flies open, making a contact which rings a bell in the fire station. Contained within the box is a telephone transmitter for the purpose of giving the station the address of the fire. When the message is understood, a buzzer is sounded to signify that fact. The disadvantage of this system is obvious, inasmuch as there is no check upon false alarms, while in moments of great emergency the individual is only too inclined to bungle everything in the nature of a telephone message. In the event of no message being received, the appliances proceed to the neighborhood of the firebox. Great attention is paid to the physique of the men forming the corps, and in addition to the squad and company drill which constitutes part of their military training, considerable time is devoted to gymnastics. It may be open to question whether the practice of what, for want of a better term, may be called acrobatic exercises, really improves the stamina in a most advantageous manner, yet a feat such as the following probably inspires a certain amount of self-confidence. The apparatus employed is called the piano, it consists of a vertical timber structure about 14 feet high, comprising a number of horizontal boards separated by a groove to imitate the rustic grooving in classical architecture. The men ascend this with their fingers alone, jumping each board with their two hands simultaneously. These grooves, which form their only support, are but one and a half inches deep. Incidentally, last year the men of the brigade won the regimental cup for gymnastics, open to the whole French army. Regarding a fuller account of the apparatus in use in the Paris Fire Department, it need only be said that with the exception of some unimportant particulars, the appliances are much the same as those employed in the New York Fire Department, a detailed description of which will be found in the chapter under that heading. It only remains to be emphasized in instituting comparisons that the utility of apparatus depends solely upon its suitability to its environment, and the narrow streets of Paris offer an insuperable obstacle to the giant appliances in use elsewhere. The Paris Fire Brigade, having found that considerable delay was caused by the summoning of a building contractor when dangerous walls, etc., required attention, and that the risk thus incurred by the men during the delay preceding his arrival was considerable, 
decided to provide itself with its own gear for dealing with dangerous structures. This consists of eight horse traps, two comprising a unit and manned by fifteen men. Those employed in this particular squad are all carpenters or builders by profession, and are thus supposed to be in a position to render first aid to any building in peril of collapse with facility and expedition. Frankly, this feature in the brigade is one also of doubtful value. True, the numbers allocated for this particular service are not excessive, but in dealing with problems of a similar nature in New York, the author has found that in such cases of emergency, it was more satisfactory to count upon the services of building contractors of known standing than to rely upon a small subdivision of the fire corps itself, which, from the nature of the case, cannot possibly possess the scientific and architectural skill necessary to cope with such a vast and intricate question as shoring up of a wall in momentary danger of collapse. Wrecking crews are employed in the New York Fire Department, but their duties are very much narrower than those of their French colleagues. An account of a fire in Paris, drawn from a report of the British Fire Prevention Committee's journal, may not be without interest to readers, lay and professional alike. The site of the outbreak was a linoleum factory situated in the Rue de Vouy, a long, narrow street approached by thoroughfares at either end and backed on one side by tenement buildings and on the other by a railway. Obviously, the chief risk was that the fire might spread to the tenements, and hence the main attack had to be made from either end. Seven motor pumps were brought into operation, supplying thirteen jets, while two more were worked from a hydrant. The number of officers and men employed numbered 135. It only remains to be said that the disposition of the apparatus, as evidenced by the plan reproduced below, was admirable, the officers in charge having clearly and quickly grasped the danger zone, and it is satisfactory to note that the blaze was under control within ninety minutes of the arrival of the first engine upon the scene. Owing to the part played by the Prefect of Police in the control of the Paris Fire Brigade, it is natural that some form of cooperation should exist between the two departments. In fact, it is not too much to say that herein lies a connection of considerable value. For ordinary small fires, the mobilizing of the police necessary to keep the ground is dealt with by the provisional police superintendent in whose area the fire occurs, and he can also draw assistance from neighboring divisions. In the case of large fires, police headquarters sends immediate aid from its reserves, including, if necessary, Republican guards and strong cyclist sections. The principle of having a number of police ready for immediate turnout on bicycles to any point in the city is both expeditious and advantageous, and merits more than passing attention from the authorities of every large municipality. Upon cooperation between the police and fire departments much depends, and it is only by constantly playing into each other's hands that the former can rightly judge how far away a crowd must be kept for their own safety's sake, and in order that the efforts of the firemen may be unhindered by the ill-judged incursions of the curious. For fire protection along the front of the River Seine, there is a special organization known as the Brigade Fluvial, or the River Police. This consists of a chief inspector, four assistants, and thirty-six policemen, twelve of whom are pilots and mechanics. Not only does this force serve as auxiliary to the fire department, but it is trained for emergency work in times of flood, as well as acting as police in the usually accepted sense of the word. Needless to say, owing to the tortuous narrowness of the Seine, the apparatus in use is small, but it is serviceable enough for its purpose, and the men in the Corps are, in addition, expert lifesavers of drowning persons. It is a curious anomaly of this command that its hours of duty are only from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m., and hence it is practically unavailable for any night emergency. 
the authorities who are responsible for this incongruous state of affairs must evidently possess a touching confidence in the designs of le bon dieu as to the ordinary ideas of the firefighter the hours of most danger are precisely those when it is to be supposed the officers and men of le brigade fluvial are wrapped in slumber salvage work in paris is carried on by a distinct section of the fire department and is in no way reliant upon any outside or independent assistance this whole question of the interdependence of the fire department upon a private salvage corps and vice versa receives careful consideration in another section of this volume but none the less it may be broadly stated that there are advantages attaching to an undivided control of both these departments and since paris was the first to adopt such a measure a short account of its equipment for that purpose may not be without interest the paris salvage service commenced operations in nineteen o four and is intended to limit as far as possible the damage caused by water or fire to all kinds of property since salvage duties form part of the ordinary duties of the brigade instruction in this special branch is given to all ranks special appliances for the purpose are placed in six stations each of which has a certain number of zones to protect but the appliances of one area may be sent to another according to the severity of the fire besides this every one of the twenty-four motor apparatuses of the department carries some salvage gear so that a proportion of this work can be accomplished without the presence of the special cars each salvage car is manned by one non-commissioned officer two corporals four firemen and a driver on arrival at a fire the man in charge of the appliance takes his orders from the senior officer of the firefighting force who employs his services as he thinks best thus in case of emergency the men of the salvage corps can assist in the firework or the men employed in the firework can assist in the salvage the salvage units comprise six motor cars with a wide radius of action each carrying a crew of eight men the whole being under the charge of a superior officer and each carrying no less than fifty ordinary covers fifteen special covers one special scaling ladder one step ladder one set of draining gear and a large supply of mops brooms swabs sponges trays small covers ropes lamps axes carpenters tools bags of sawdust telephone fittings and so on there is also a reserve car and in addition to this every motor pump carries two covers and other minor salvage gear towards this comprehensive service the insurance companies pay forty thousand dollars per annum and in addition nominate two of their officials to do service if called upon in a technical or consultative capacity probably the paris fire department is the only one in the world which can bring so effective a plant to the seat of operations so quickly and with so little delay and broadly speaking it is without doubt an advantage to have at hand so large and competent a force upon which to draw at a moment's notice the personnel of both fire brigades and salvage corps is after all only human and it is impossible always to avoid some friction between the two bodies when each has a different object in view and is naturally anxious to look after the best interests of their respective paymasters it is in this direction that paris benefits generally speaking the parisian theatres can scarcely be said to make any special claim for excellence in either architectural construction or equipment but in this respect they differ little from those of other countries which except in rare cases seldom come up to the standard of modern requirements in the case of paris the majority of the buildings are old and the proprietors have vested interests necessarily rendering any action on the part of the public authorities a difficult and thankless undertaking nevertheless a systematic effort may be observed on all sides to ameliorate the dangerous features in these old buildings and to ensure safety of the audiences as far as is practicable under existing conditions the primary features of the protective system observed in paris appear to be very similar to those in vogue in new york 
and consist in the installation of a fire-resisting curtain, large ventilator openings, absence of rubbish, the non-inflammable treatment of scenery, constant inspection, and lastly the organization of fire watches, composed of regular firemen who shortly before every performance make the rounds and test the fire appliances, remaining until the conclusion of the entertainment when the appliances are once more put under trial. Also, as in New York, plans for new theaters are inspected and reported upon by the fire department. All of this is most satisfactory, and is evidence that the French authorities are keenly aware of the terrible fire risks in theaters, where even a false alarm may result in a hideous and unnecessary loss of life. But with the National Opera House of Paris, another tale has to be told, and it is literally amazing that its equipment and construction should be such as to make even the most uninstructed in the peril of fire pause and hesitate. Granted that the foundations of this historic pile were laid as far back as 1863, yet owing to the Franco-Prussian War the building was not really completed till some twelve years later, the opening taking place in 1875. There has always been an idea that buildings of a period antecedent to our own day of rush and hurry were more substantial and of better construction than the jerry-built shacks of the modern real estate agent who hides the worthlessness of his wares under liberal coatings of gilt and gingerbread. Yet, judging from the Paris Opera House, the architects concerned in its erection must have counted fire as one of the negligible happenings of fate. No less a sum than $7,500,000 was lavished upon the building, but apparently the imagination of the gentlemen responsible for its erection only carried them as far as architectural magnificence, and they were blind to such matters of minor importance as the safety of the audience and artists. But again, perhaps it is too much to expect that an architect of the sixties in the last century should have realized that panic bolts to doors, rounded corners, and continuous handrails form safeguards for human life. One might legitimately expect, however, that such precautions would have presented themselves to the minds of the present-day directors. To quote from the report of the British Fire Prevention Committee, issued after their visit to Paris, the Opera House stage is generally considered to be one of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous, in Europe. It is mainly of wood construction, supported in parts by unprotected cast-iron columns. It is a mass of old-fashioned windlasses, pulley gear, and a veritable forest of rope. Little can be said beyond that it should be entirely gutted, as was the case with the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, and that a modern stage should be fitted in its place. The safeguards, however carefully devised, are discounted by the highly inflammable and complex character of the stage equipment. It must be clearly understood that this excerpt is given with no idea of disparaging one of the great art centers of the modern world, but only with the object of bringing home to the ordinary citizen the fact that, with all the history of fire disaster behind them for their guidance, those responsible for the safety of the public, unintentionally, no doubt, even today regard the subject apparently as not one of serious import. Further comment is surely needless. Suffice it to say that, judging from official reports concerning the fire equipment of the Paris Opera House, it is ludicrous, were it not possessed of its tragic side. Its structural height is nominally thirteen stories, the fire protection of which is served by three mains, the high pressure being naturally for the protection of the upper part of the building. Considering that the maximum pressure off the mains is only seventy pounds, it is difficult to see how even the tenth story could be protected, let alone the thirteenth. The subject of fire protection in department stores, on the other hand, has for some time past been receiving the careful consideration of the Paris Fire Bureau, and in this connection the modus operandi of the great Bon Marché stores offers an example worthy of imitation by many similar establishments in big American towns. 
This firm maintains a private fire brigade of 41 men who do nothing else except watch and fire duty. One-third of this number sleep on the premises, while to assist them is a special staff of 18 night watchmen. A portion of the regular sales staff also is instructed in fire duties, being especially trained to deal with customers and others in the case of a fire panic. The store possesses its own water supply, and sprinklers are fitted in all parts of the building considered to be particularly dangerous. Great care is also taken over the collection of waste paper and rubbish generally. It is gathered into sacks and removed to a fire-resistant room in the basement, which is lighted from without, is supplied with sprinklers, and possesses a self-closing iron door. In addition, all packing material is stored in a special apartment and is only issued as required. The elevator shafts are taken above the roof, the upper part of the shaft being glazed with thin glass, the idea being that in the event of fire, the heat and smoke should go well clear of the building. Finally, smoke helmets are kept ready for the slightest emergency, each being fitted with a portable electric bulb and a supply of oxygen sufficient to last 90 minutes. At different periods during the last century, notably in 1851 and 1858, efforts were made by the government of the time to obtain some form of provincial fire service on national lines, whereby the responsibility of the different local authorities might be centralized. These efforts met with scant success although a number of communes formed fire brigades as sections of the National Civic Guard. The first modern decree on the organization of French fire brigades was signed by Marshal McMahon in 1875, and comprised 35 articles setting out the requirements and conditions of service in great detail. Of course, it was in itself only applicable to the day of the manual engine, but even now it can well rank as a model to all countries as a code which nationalizes a necessary service, which is all too easily allowed to remain unrecognized where the independence of local authorities has become a veritable fetish, regardless of the best interests of the community. The following are some of the features of the Decree of November 1903, which today governs the formation of communal fire brigades in France, and marks a stage in the development of the old decree of 75. Fire brigades are primarily formed to do fire service, but may also be called upon to assist in the case of any serious accident or catastrophe. If they so desire, and with the permission of the Home Secretary, they may be armed, but under those circumstances they are not allowed to carry their rifles outside the limits of their own district. Fire brigades can only be formed with the sanction of the president of the department, after proof has been given that sufficient appliances exist for the brigade to man, and that means are available for the purchase of uniforms and the general upkeep of the force in an efficient condition for a period of at least fifteen years. The general organization is along strictly military lines, men being enlisted of their own free will for a period of not less than five years. Officers are appointed by the President of the Republic on the advice of the Prefect of the District or the Mayor of the Commune. Their rank is ex officio military. But the chief point in this connection is the effort which has been made by the various provincial fire departments towards a common federation of all brigades, the standardization, so to say, of the system as a whole. The objects of this federation are to improve the French fire service generally, to conduct assemblies, competitions, and exhibitions with a view to encouraging the ambition of various local units, and to the creation of a species of local esprit de corps. Incidentally, also, comprised in the scheme is a plan for benefiting those who are injured in the course of duty, and of assisting their wives, widows, or families. At the present time this federation consists of over 104,000 members, and there is no reason why, if managed along normal lines and those of least resistance, that is, in conjunction with the governmental authorities, 
this federation might not prove of inestimable benefit to all concerned the competitions conducted are of peculiar value as they do not consist of events which are merely a matter of athletic celerity but are rather founded upon a semi-scientific basis by this means successful brigades may be regarded as not only occupying the position of merit allotted to them in any particular competition but as embodying thereby their actual standing in the ranks of the provincial fire department in france as a whole there are also theoretical examinations for the officers which are taken separately and of a graduated character there being five groups a to e admission to the higher group having to be preceded by the obtaining of honors in the next lower group in fact it is not too much to say that this federation although in need of modernization as regards some of its details is generally beneficial in the highest degree to the french provincial fire service and by engendering enthusiasm and a spirit of emulation has done much to advance the cause of firefighting in that country m guinet its president has admittedly a difficult body to control political influences and administrative problems of importance have to be constantly overcome and adjusted with that diplomacy which alone can bring success to any organization of such magnitude and though from time to time setbacks occur and attempts are made to discredit the work accomplished the fact remains that the very genesis of such a union is a hopeful presage for the future were it possible to train the members of all fire departments in a country along national lines in a similar manner to that in which the apparatus of various cities in the united states has been standardized then without a doubt a great step would have been taken forward in the science of fire control admittedly of course in a vast country like the united states such a scheme is impossible of realization but in smaller areas such as england and other european countries the idea would certainly appear to merit consideration end of section five recording by maria casper Section six of Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six Firefighting in Germany. As might be expected by those conversant with Teuton thoroughness, the question of fire control in Germany has received the most careful consideration on the part of the authorities, from the Emperor and Empress downwards this has resulted in the centralization of all executive authority which in itself possesses many advantages in berlin all matters relating to building construction factory inspection the storage of inflammable material and other details of a similar nature are under the supervision of the berlin royal police with which the fire brigade is incorporated the advantages of this system are obvious thus a factory inspector a superior officer of the fire department a superior officer of the sanitary police and the police building surveyor frequently work together and confusion as to responsibility or the overlapping of various forms of control is eliminated now admittedly this system is excellent but since prevention is better than cure great efforts are made to instill into the minds of children at an early age the necessity of exercising great care in the use of matches lamps candles and open lights towards this end special courses are arranged in the public schools whereby boys and girls are taught by fable picture or simple instruction the dangers inseparable from imprudence in the use of the above-mentioned articles these simple educational methods are having a most marked effect on the whole of the coming generation in germany and fatalities from burns amongst young people have decreased while their parents also have grown more cautious naturally the full results of this teaching will not be felt for another ten years when its effect upon the incidence of fires should become marked building construction in germany generally is of a solid and substantial nature 
both as regards business and residential premises, the interiors being subject to the inspection of the local building control department, risks such as those commonly met with in tenement houses are avoided. The centralization of fire control has also had important results as regards the high standard of safety existing in most German theaters. This supervision is responsible for the introduction of the specially heavy fire curtain in general use, and for the installation of a system of stage lighting which does away with the more dangerous features of the older methods. In this connection, it may be noted that the theater owners find the police restrictions in no way irksome, even though that most unpopular official, the censor, is also a member of the department. One final feature of the Prussian brigades merits attention— the duty for firemen is so arranged that after 48 hours at a fire station, they are entitled to 24 hours rest at home. During their period on watch, starting at 8 in the morning, they are actively employed till 10.30 p.m., when, unless summoned to a fire, they may sleep until 6 a.m. On that day they are relieved from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., in order that they may take part in the night watch without undue fatigue. There are no married or single permanent quarters for the men at the stations, this practice being similar to that in vogue in New York. As regards the merits, or otherwise, of this system, much may be written, and the subject is fully dealt with in a later chapter. From this brief resume it will be gathered that German fire control is planned on severely official lines, which to some degree no doubt stifles initiative on the part of the individual, but at the same time makes for that mechanical precision which is responsible for the fire risks being the lowest in the world. The Berlin Fire Brigade was organized in 1851 and modernized in 1875 when the system of firefighting units was first brought into operation. Each unit comprised a trap, a manual, and a water tank. Such was the organization at that time that within ten minutes of a fire being reported, it was nominally possible to obtain the assistance of such a unit at any point throughout the city. As the brigade stands today, it consists of a headquarters and five divisions, each division controlling five units. This force has to protect roughly an area of 15,000 acres, with 27,800 buildings, and a population of 2,123,000 souls. The officers of the department consist of one chief, two deputy chiefs, five divisional officers, 15 assistant divisional officers in charge of the units, and two adjutants. By way of comparison, Berlin has 25 officers to a brigade of 1,040 of all ranks, Vienna 7 to 468, Hamburg 12 to 512, London 5 to 1,400, and New York 63 to 4,996. Berlin authorities state that it should be borne in mind that it is not only the superior officer's management of the brigade and his greater technical education, but his general influence over the policy of fire prevention, his skilled assistance in the supervision and inspection of buildings, and the prestige which is conferred thereby upon fire control, which gives the department the standing it deserves as a highly important economic feature in municipal and national life. Such recognition from so highly organized a body as the Berlin municipality makes the writer hopeful that before long the status of the genus fireman will cease to be regarded as less important than that of the soldier or sailor in the service of his country. The policy of the Berlin Fire Department, as might be expected, has been towards the adoption of mechanical means of transport, and at the present moment most of the units are equipped with automobile appliances. Chief amongst these may be noticed a number of 80-foot extension ladders, chemical engines, and steam pumps. There are also electrically propelled breakdown cars for dealing with dangerous structures. The loose gear carried is of the most extensive character, the men having special instruction in the use of smoke helmets, 
their familiarity in the employment of the same being second to none in the world. A feature is made of what may be termed fire tactics, or the topography of districts in the municipal area, enabling officers and men to fight fires to the best advantage. To this end, a handbook is supplied, specially printed, in order to be visible in a bad light, giving a tabular list of every thoroughfare and every hydrant or source of water supply in the city. But this compendium goes a step further, and in respect to particularly dangerous risks, shows the most advantageous position to be occupied by individual engines. In the event of the apparatus designated being at work elsewhere, its place is taken by its relief. Great attention is accorded to questions of fire prevention by the officers of the brigade, and systematic inspections are favored, which are carried out by the brigade independently of or in conjunction with the Building Act Department, Factories Department, or other sections of the police administration. The amount of inspection work done by the superior officers of the brigade in the last few years has been enormous but its effect has also been very considerable in reducing the causes of fires. This supervision includes theaters and public buildings, factories, warehouses, department stores, hospitals, lunatic asylums, and all buildings subject to special risks such as electrical powerhouses and tanks for the storage of petrol and other explosives. Those desiring to join the Corps as officers must satisfy the authorities that they are physically sound, financially stable, and possessed of first-class higher school certificates and military papers. They are then eligible to become ensigns, but in order to obtain commissions as officers, they must then satisfy authorities that they have passed the final examination as architects or civil engineers at a Royal Technical College, or taken the scientific courses at either a naval or military engineering academy. Further, they must have been either commissioned officers in the Army or Navy, or at least hold rank in the Reserve. In addition, they are required to place their financial position clearly before the chief officer, to undertake not to marry without the chief's consent until they have been in the brigade at least one year, and to show that they have not only satisfactorily passed the ensign's course in the Berlin Brigade, but also that of an ensign in at least one other brigade. Candidates must also possess a thorough grounding in electrical work, and have a knowledge of the principles attending first aid. Finally, they must be of good family. From these details it will be seen that officers in the great German fire brigades must be men of exceptional ability, in fact, that the profession is practically closed except to those who, holding commissions in the Army or Navy Reserve, are in private life architects or civil engineers, or belong to the engineering or artillery branches of the Army or to the torpedo or gunnery branches of the Navy. It seems superfluous to state that such credentials imply the acme of hard work and the height of scientific efficiency, Yet the writer must be forgiven for hazarding the statement that the man trained in the University of Hard Knocks, and who has gained his advancement from the ranks by shown ability to meet the emergencies of his calling, is in every way his equal for all practical purposes. The chief principles employed in fighting fires may be briefly summarized thus. Fight the flames at close quarters— always have a man in reserve on each branch armed with a lifeline and an axe for emergencies, and make use of all apparatus obtainable irrespective of immediate necessity. Comment upon these tactics is deferred till later in this article. It is, however, strictly enjoined that senior officers should not expose themselves to any unnecessary danger, and should not under any circumstances penetrate to the heart of a fire, or work inside buildings in danger of collapse. There is a tendency observable to allow unimportant values to be destroyed if it is considered that their attack by water appears likely to cause greater damage than their worth justifies. Thus, a roof or the contents of an attic, if situated in a high-class building, are generally allowed to burn out so that the floors below may not be injured by water. 
the rule of the brigade is to work upwards rather than downwards, and a branch is rarely applied to a fire from surrounding elevated positions. Regardless of the utility and great convenience of mechanically operated extension ladders, the brigade continues to give the closest attention to hook ladder and lifeline work. Every foreman and fireman must be thoroughly efficient in the operation of these two appliances, failing which he is compulsorily retired, and every fireman drills once a week at least with this apparatus during the whole period of his service. Berlin possesses nearly 700 fire alarms, of which 200 are public street alarms, directions thereto being fixed on every lamp post, pillar box, and licensed kiosk adjacent to a crossing. The regulations governing the department stores of Berlin are peculiarly comprehensive, with the result that they are probably the best safeguarded in the world. Each shop of any magnitude has its private fire brigade, the watch-room of which is centrally situated, and apparatus for any emergency is kept in constant readiness. Employees are specially trained as to the alarms, bell signals, appliances, and those quarters to which they must proceed in the event of an alarm. Such signals are A. Quarters, B. Return to duty, C. Clear premises. The first signal can be pulled at any one of the private alarm points in the building, the second and third by a member of the private fire brigade alone, and then only from the watch-room. Upon the first call sounding, those attached to the fire section proceed to the scene of the outbreak, which is marked upon a specially illuminated location chart, while those not similarly engaged are expected to remain at their posts under pain of instant dismissal, by this method, anything in the nature of a panic amongst the customers is immediately checked. At the third call, the personnel not at quarters is expected to pilot the clientele into the open by exits arranged according to departments. Meantime, all wagons and carriages have been removed from the courtyards, areas, and so forth by a special staff of porters, who likewise act upon prearranged signals. As on board ship, Test alarms are frequently made to familiarize both staff and visitors with the mode of clearance, and in this connection it is of interest to note that in the event of what a police officer may deem to be the overcrowding of any store, he has the power of stopping the entrance thereto until such time as the congestion has eased. Theater fire risks in Berlin are inconsiderable, thanks to the modernity of the majority of these structures, coupled with the stringency of the building regulations. The natural tendency to roominess, observable in all public construction in Germany, has also beneficially influenced the internal designs of places of amusement from a fire point of view. In Berlin proper, there are 34 theaters, music halls, and circus buildings. The daily fire watches number 36 foremen and 109 men, about one-sixth of the brigade, or a full half of the men off duty, for it must be explained that the men forming this contingent are voluntarily recruited from those who in their spare time wish to make extra pay. It must, however, be borne in mind that this special service is compulsory as regards the brigade, the means of its supply being left to the chief of the department. The problems connected with safety in stage illumination appear to have been solved in a satisfactory manner. Effects of flames and fire are obtained by concentrating electric lights of considerable power and of the required colors upon pieces of silk which are suspended by one end and blown into position with a fluttering movement by electric fans and bellows. A duplication of the lighting system is also provided in most theaters, this being obviously of extreme value in cases of emergency when otherwise the building would be plunged in darkness. An example of excellence in theater construction is afforded by the Schiller Theater, with seating accommodation for 1,460 persons, which it is estimated can be emptied in less than one minute. There is only one gallery of small size, 
the rest of the house being given over to what corresponds to stalls and pit in European theatres, or in American phraseology, orchestra chairs. To understand the situation of the fire service in Hamburg, it is necessary to appreciate that this is a city which in the main is a port, with enormous warehouse values, both within the dutiable area and in the free port that it further has a large city or office district, a retail business section, and finally extensive residential suburbs of varying descriptions. The business portion of the city is intersected by a large number of waterways, which, whilst providing the most valuable auxiliary of an ample and accessible water supply in some of the more dangerous districts, at the same time create considerable difficulty for intercommunication and the concentration of the brigade in force. Roughly the population of Hamburg amounts to 900,000, the number of buildings approximating 31,000. The main fire risk is naturally centered in the warehouse area, and more especially in the free port, where, owing to the short-sightedness of those responsible to the harbor board for the dock equipment constructed in the early 80s of the last century, Buildings were erected with all vertical and horizontal metal supports entirely unprotected, and in many cases formed of light latticework girders, which are peculiarly liable to collapse when subjected to great heat. In the newer warehouses, all this has been remedied, and the improvements introduced include the use of fire-resisting materials to protect supports, the substitution of ordinary flooring by reinforced concrete, laid at such an angle as to ensure the speedy and easy drainage of water into the scuppers, thus avoiding unnecessary damage therefrom in the event of fire, and the absolute insulation of all elevator shafts and staircases from the rest of the building. As to the development of the fire department, its history is short, considering the lesson that should have been learned from the destructive conflagration of 1842, not until 1869 was a professional brigade formed, and then it consisted only of the ridiculously inadequate number of 48 men under a chief officer. This, in turn, was assisted by 1,200 volunteers, the apparatus at their joint command comprising four steam fire pumps and 109 manuals. In 1878, the force was reconstituted, and today it consists of a chief officer, twelve assistants, six warrant officers, forty-three foremen, twenty-nine engineers, and four hundred and twenty-two firemen, or, together with supplementary staff, such as telegraphists and electricians, a total of nearly five hundred and fifty men. There are ten fire stations, and, as in Berlin, the hours of duty are forty-eight on to twenty-four off, some idea of the brigade's activity may be gleaned from the fact that on the yearly average it attends seventy fires of first importance and one thousand of lesser importance, while false alarms total the huge number of nearly five hundred. It would be of interest to know to what the latter remarkable figure is attributable. The equipment of the brigade is excellent. Amongst other apparatus may be noticed 25 steam fire pumps, 7 chemical engines, 10 80-foot extension ladders, and no less than 17 large fire floats. Considering the strength of its personnel, the area of the city and the property to be protected, it is no exaggeration to state that few fire brigades can show so large a proportion of mechanically equipped apparatus which in itself speaks volumes for the enterprise of the responsible authorities. The administration of the force is in the hands of a special civic commission formed on comparatively independent lines and representing the various interests at stake, both financial and technical. It consists of a senator who acts as chairman, a lawyer from the Senate, three municipal councillors, two municipal fire insurance officials, and an official from the city's waterworks. The cost of the brigade amounts annually to $450,000, of which $240,000 is raised by a special rate upon house property, 
$50,000 by stamp duties on fire insurance policies, while the remainder is provided by the authorities out of the general funds. An interesting feature is the position occupied by the chimney sweep, that humble individual whose services seldom receive recognition of any sort from the community, yet upon whose thoroughness depends the safety of property and persons untold. In Hamburg, the genus sweep is under fire brigade control, and no one can start in that business without first passing a stringent examination. It is compulsory to have all chimneys cleaned at regular intervals, and in the event of negligence, both sweep and proprietor of the premises at fault are heavily fined. Generally, as regards fire risks, the Hamburg municipality has framed special bylaws along much the same lines as those existing in Berlin, and the protection thus afforded is both ample and adequate. Though the town of Hanover is small, its population amounting only to 272,000, anyone visiting its brigade cannot but be struck by the fact that it is no ordinary organization, but rather one of exceptional excellence, and which on that account can afford to be compared with any in Europe. Needless to say, any great expenditure on apparatus cannot be expected from such a small community, but the district covered possesses a dangerous manufacturing section and includes some factories of great size. Hence, to meet the needs of the situation, it has been necessary to provide a department which, if confined to its regular duties, would scarcely find sufficient employment but an economical solution of the problem was found by according to the brigade and its officers additional municipal functions other than those of the fire service, and to this end both officers and men have been trained for other special duties. At the same time it was wisely determined that the apparatus, though limited in quantity, should be the best obtainable in quality and that the salaries of all concerned should be upon as liberal a scale as possible. Thus the brigade acts as the ambulance department of Hanover, in itself a work of considerable utility. Unlike other departments, which possess a first aid section, in this case the Corps undertakes the transport of infectious cases and the like to hospital, which, though open naturally to serious objection on account of the possibility of the spread of disease through this agency, is nonetheless a service that, in a small town, can be carried on with the minimum of risk, when every man concerned is under the closest medical supervision. In addition, the chief officer of this fire department is also, ipso facto, the administrative head of the Municipal Scavenging and Dust Destructor Service, which incidentally has considerable bearing upon fire prevention. Though no doubt a certain sympathy must be felt for scientific firefighters who are expected to employ a portion of their time in such uncongenial occupations as taking diphtheria patients to hospital or acting as scavengers, yet as the municipality urges they can only afford to pay for a brigade in which the rank and file can be otherwise employed, and it would seem better to have a fire force at even that price than possess none at all. And it must be remembered that Germany is a free country and that there is no compulsion to serve, at any rate in the Hanover Fire Department. The present constitution of the brigade is as follows. Four superior officers, an inspector of telegraphs, a superintendent of ambulance work, 17 foremen, 86 firemen, six telegraph clerks, and twelve coachmen, or one hundred and twenty-seven of all ranks. There are three fire stations, and approximately thirteen thousand eight hundred buildings to be protected. The principal equipment consists of three steam motor-propelled pumps, three eighty-foot extension ladders, four motor chemical engines, and seven traps. These latter are extremely useful appliances, carrying hook and scaling ladders, a quantity of hose, lifelines, and all those minor appliances that at fire often spell so much at the commencement of an outbreak. Three motor ambulances also merit mention, 
and all municipal telegraphy and electric wiring for bell and signal purposes being under the brigade's control, there are special motor trolleys for that branch of the department. The Corps is equipped with 45 street alarm call boxes in public thoroughfares and 22 in private or municipal buildings. On the average, the annual number of fires attended amounts to 282, of which 21 rank as of major importance, 28 are medium, and 78 are chimney fires. The ambulance section roughly answers 4,500 calls per annum, of which no less than 600 may be docketed as infectious. Hence it speaks volumes for the medical precautions adopted, that rarely, if ever, a fireman is temporarily incapacitated or permanently injured from this duty. As indicated, though a mere enumeration of personnel scarcely serves to emphasize sufficiently the point, this small force is no ordinary one, and under its former fire chief, Herr Reichel, now in command in Berlin, it can lay claim to having taken the initiative in motor traction as applied to fire engines, certainly in Germany, if not in the entire world. Today there would be nothing in a fire brigade ordering self-propelled appliances. Rather would they be remarkable if they did not. But it is worthy of more than passing comment that as long ago as 1901, Herr Reichel was able to exhibit at the Berlin International Fire Exhibition a complete fire service unit for a district station comprising a motor steam fire engine, an automobile trap, and a self-propelled chemical engine, which working as a unit, time has proved to be eminently economical. The unit in question, after an experimental trial of three months, entered the regular service of the Hanover Force and is still doing excellent work even today. As regards water supply, this is ample, the pressure off the mains averaging 45 pounds. Before closing the brief account of this most enterprising small brigade, a few words must be added concerning the actual methods employed in the ambulance service. On an alarm sounding, an ambulance starts away at once in the charge of a coachman and four firemen. In infectious cases, the men have instructions to handle the sufferer as little as possible, and at the end of the journey both attendants and coach are thoroughly fumigated. This system is also used for the removal of dangerous persons and lunatics, thus constituting a valuable auxiliary to the local police, hospitals, and lunatic asylums. Finally, this branch of the brigade during the summer months is charged with the manufacture of ice, which is sold at cost price to those in a position to pay for it, but is supplied free to the poor in case of illness or other necessity. In fact, the town of Hanover can lay claim to the proud boast that first of all the cities in the world it has recognized the science of firefighting to the extent of founding a lectureship on fire control, the chair of which is located at the Royal Technical College of Hanover, which now ranks as a national university. The first lecturer, docent, was that Herr Reichel of whom mention has already been made. From a perusal of the foregoing pages, the reader will have recognized that the outstanding feature of German fire brigade organization, as evidenced by that of its most important centers, is the large part played by a semi-military handling of the subject, coupled with that thoroughness of technique and design which is distinctive of the Teuton character. But this must not be taken to mean that, in the opinion of the author, nothing is beyond criticism or above discussion. In the first place, as must always happen in countries where class distinctions are rigid, and the private soldier cannot in all truth be said to carry the field marshal's baton in his pocket, there is that tendency to assume that mere theoretical training is sufficient to equip an individual satisfactorily to fight so insidious an enemy as fire. It is the humble opinion of this writer that this theory is erroneous. The individual may be provided with the most extensive scientific panoply of degrees and diplomas regarding the arithmetic progression of combustion under certain conditions, 
he may be able to work out by trigonometry the angle of water delivery from a pump to a window many feet from the ground, and he may be an expert at assessing the nozzle pressure necessary successfully to circumvent an outbreak before the latter has reached serious proportions. This in theory. But what of the practice? Every sailor knows that it is a matter of no great difficulty to ascertain in a classroom the position of an imaginary ship upon an imaginary ocean with the assistance of an imaginary sextant and the ordinary aids to navigation. Everything is at hand to make his task an easy one, even to that of such adjuncts as light, warmth, and stability. But place that same individual on board a real ship upon a real ocean, in a small, ill-lighted deck-house, with a chart pinned down on a swaying, uneven surface, and ask him to work out the same set of figures or the same problem, and he may be forgiven if he fails hopelessly. So is it in all appertaining to this science of fire-fighting. With all the technical knowledge in the world, and nothing else behind it, it would be ludicrous to expect any person successfully to cope with so crafty an enemy as the flames, or at any rate as competently to obtain their mastery as one trained actually upon the field of experience. In this connection also, without wishing to appear hypercritical, it seems doubtful whether the Berlin practice of preventing senior officers from taking an active part in the actual firefighting is either wise or desirable. True, a general on a battlefield is expected to direct operations from a point of as much safety as is consistent with his duties. But in the case of a fire chief, it should be remembered that each fire must be fought on its particular merits. There has been no survey of the ground previously, there has been no active intelligence department to warn the attacking force of what particular line of development may be expected, all that the fire chief knows is the bare fact that an outbreak has occurred at such and such a place, and that the locality is a dangerous one, or vice versa. Hence, in order to satisfy himself as to the true state of affairs, it is imperative that he should judge for himself by personal observation as to the possible chances of a spread of the flames and the best method to fight the same. Further, another feature of the Berlin Fire Department seems to demand special criticism, namely the custom of allowing a fire to burn itself out if situated at the top of a building, the other contents of which would be damaged by a water attack. No doubt this may be essayed and essayed safely in a fireproof building, separated from its neighbors by a certain distance, and when a sufficient portion of the fire department is concentrated on the scene and can remain there for any emergency. But time must be allowed for said fire to burn out, and the force detailed to watch it may meantime be urgently wanted elsewhere, and to leave it unwatched would of course be suicidal. Hence such tactics must be regarded as hazardous, and much better were it that the insurance companies should suffer for a minimum of loss, than be obliged to meet the demands of a really serious conflagration, the possibility of which is always present under such conditions. These are a few of the thoughts which arise in the mind of any trained practical firefighter. It is the theoretician who sees in the vicarious strategy outlined above a better method of overcoming a wily enemy than the old style of coming to grips at once and fighting to a finish. For the rest, the German fire departments have much to recommend them as models to the world, not the least important factor in their organization being the prestige attaching to firefighting as a science, and to the honorable position occupied by officers and men in the estimation of the public. End of section six. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 7 of Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Fire Departments of Middle Europe, Austro Hungary, Switzerland, and Italy. The dominant feature of the Austrian Fire Department is the high degree of excellence attained by purely voluntary corps, which owe their development in a great measure to the system of federation 
introduced as long ago as 1869. This organization was extended in 1885 under the name of the Austrian Fire Brigade Board, comprising delegates from the provincial brigades under a president and two vice presidents. In 1900, this board received recognition from the crown, became known as the Austrian Imperial Fire Brigades Association, and obtained an annual subvention from the government. Today, this federation numbers more than 9,500 brigades, representing practically the entire Austrian service. Some idea of the magnitude of this force can be gathered from the amount of the apparatus involved, namely over 200 steam fire engines and over 13,000 manuals. From time to time, this association appoints technical commissions to examine all questions connected with the scientific aspect of fire control. Further, courses of study are specially designed to familiarize officers and non-commissioned officers with the theoretical problems involved in firefighting. Particular attention is directed to the inspection of local brigades, and efforts are made to secure uniformity in their organization. According to the principles adopted by the Imperial Association, every volunteer corps must be composed of two sections, each properly equipped for fire extinguishing and life-saving work. Thus these brigades can be used not only for fighting fires, but may equally be called upon to render assistance in the event of accidents of any nature. Such a system is no doubt of public benefit in rural communities, but would clearly be impracticable in large towns unless all municipal forces were under the control of the same executive. A matter of enormous importance in the economics of the Austrian fire service is the fact that the law of the country requires all insurance corporations and companies trading on Austrian territory to contribute about 2% of their total gross premium income on the risk taken in Austrian territory for the specific purpose of assisting in the upkeep of the fire brigades and towards the firemen's widows and orphans fund. This law affects all companies irrespective of their nationality. It must be here emphasized that the foregoing remarks apply only to Austrian territory proper, Hungary possessing a distinct and separate organization of its own. The Hungarian Fire Brigades Union consists of 1,325 units out of a total of nearly 9,000 corps, sufficient evidence of the fact that it has not won the same popular interest. Its executive serves as the board of experts to which the Minister of the Interior applies when technical questions have to be dealt with. An annual course of instruction is arranged by the Union, lasting three weeks, and no officer, apparently, can attain chief officer's rank in a Union brigade without having passed this test and obtained a certificate. As to the Union's general work, it has systematized all questions of uniform and badges of rank. It has created a long service medal and has issued clear instructions for competitions and a guide for the testing of fire extinguishing appliances. Doubtless this list of ordinances is possessed of local value, but to the scientific mind it seems strange that questions of technical import have not received more attention from such an association. True, a uniform coupling is used throughout the country, and there is a standard manual fire engine, but as non-union brigades possess these appliances, it may be presumed that their adoption has merely been a matter of convenience. The city of Vienna, as regards fire protection, is dependent upon a municipally paid professional brigade, assisted by volunteer suburban corps under the control of brigade headquarters. Eight officers, five civilians, and 475 men form the personnel of the former, located in 15 stations, with two special watches in public buildings. The officers consist of the commandant, a chief inspector, and six subordinates, all of whom are housed at the central fire station. Of the rank and file, eight are drill sergeants, 40 telegraph clerks, 53 foremen, 22 engineers, while 248 comprise the actual firefighting force. 
In addition, 24 telegraph clerks and engineers are detailed for duty with the volunteer suburban brigades, the remainder of the force, numbering 78, being coachmen. Numerically, such a fighting strength for the fire protection of a city the size of Vienna would seem hopelessly inadequate. But in this connection, a word must be said for the building regulations enforced by the municipality, which greatly diminish fire risks owing to their far-sighted efficiency. The apparatus of the brigade is adequate to its needs, perhaps the most distinctive feature being the chemical engines, in connection with which are operated 80-foot mechanical extension ladders. Their crew consists of an officer and five men, additional gear carried comprising three hook ladders, a hose reel, a hand engine, a smoke helmet, a jumping sheet, an ambulance chest, toolbox, torches, and so forth. On duty, the firemen wear uniforms of white canvas, which scarcely seem appropriate considering the nature of the work they are called upon to do. Generally speaking, it would appear from the data obtainable that there is a tendency to overload the men with gear, and that some of the heavier apparatus is insufficiently supplied with personnel effective to operate it. The suburban volunteer brigades turn out to fires in their own districts, but may be called upon to assist in the event of a serious outbreak in the city. Their equipment is very similar to the municipal brigade, and since the men are volunteers, and as such enthusiasts, they take a pride in keeping as up-to-date as possible in all matters pertaining to their apparatus. Vienna is particularly fortunate as regards its water supply, which is ample for the requirements of the brigade. There are 3,620 hydrants, with an average nozzle pressure of from 75 to 90 pounds, so that the use of the steam fire engine is rarely necessary, doing away with much of the cumbersome apparatus found in other continental cities. The Hofburg Theatre is generally considered one of the finest in the world, but judging from the following report from the Journal of the British Fire Prevention Committee, it would seem that, in common with most other similar structures in the European capitals, desire for architectural magnificence has outweighed the less artistic essentials upon which fire safety depends. It is subject to a considerable risk of fire through antiquated electric installation. The switch room on the stage is one of the most dangerous the members of the party have seen. Besides being dangerous electrically, it is highly inflammable, and lined with match-boarding. There was much unnecessary match-boarding and woodwork in the theatre. It appeared curious that a building such as the Vienna Hofburg Theatre, on which such an immense sum of money had been spent, should contain defects so palpable that they were inexcusable. The staircase from the stage to the mezzanine was very antiquated, and capable of much improvement. The exits, however, seemed ample. The theatre has its own fire staff, and below the gridiron is fitted with a species of sprinkler operated from the stage level. Beyond this precaution, apparently nothing is done to ensure the safety of the flies or the scenery dock. There is, of course, an iron curtain between the stage and the auditorium, though the front of the house is seemingly left unprotected. At all theatres in Vienna, an evening watch is posted, and the fire apparatus is examined prior to and after each performance. Though an ambulance service can scarcely be considered an integral portion of a fire department, yet in Vienna the two organizations are so combined as to be almost inseparable. Formed consequent upon the Ring Theatre fire of 1871 by Baron Mundy, the Vienna Volunteer Ambulance Society has as its object the creation of a civil ambulance service to render aid on occasions of great emergency, such as conflagrations, railway accidents, floods, and the like. It consists of three departments, the first detailed for fire service, the second for flood service, and the third for first aid service. The fire service comprises several of the Vienna Suburban Volunteer Fire Brigades, 400 of the men of these brigades being organized to do duty for this purpose outside the metropolitan area if necessary. 
The flood service comprises 149 men from the leading rowing clubs and has its own pumps, pontoons, and food distributing vehicles, thus acting to some degree as a substitute for a regular river fire department. The first aid service comprises 14 paid doctors, 325 voluntary doctors, 60 medical students, 3 ambulance superintendents, 12 ambulance orderlies, and 6 coachmen. In the administrative building of the society, there are waiting rooms, duty rooms, an accident ward, operating theater, and watch house, the latter specially equipped with telephones for communication with the fire department, police, and other authorities. For railway accidents, the radius of action is 300 miles, while in the event of a conflagration or great disaster, the Society can count immediately upon the services of 50 doctors and 200 volunteer ambulance orderlies, equipped with 26 ambulances, 250 stretchers, and a large quantity of minor appliances. This forms a valuable auxiliary to the fire department, which can always rely upon its immediate cooperation. Some consideration must now be given to the Budapest Fire Brigade, which is likewise a combination of professional and volunteer forces. The staff of the professional brigade consists of a chief officer, an inspector, a senior and two junior adjutants, 23 warrant officers, three engineers, 15 foremen, 175 firemen, and sufficient coachmen to drive the horsed appliances. Amongst the apparatus may be noticed 16 fire engines, 22 manual engines, and a supply of hose wagons and extension ladders. Headquarters and substations are connected by private telephones. There are 149 fire alarms distributed throughout the city, which number seems inadequate. Since the publication of these data, it is understood that arrangements have been made to re-equip the force but necessarily this operation will cover some time. On the other hand, the Volunteer Brigade is a model of its kind, possesses an independent constitution, and comprises some 80 members. It is capitalized to the extent of $40,000, and receives, in addition, a special annual subsidy from the municipality. Though legally an entirely self-governing institution, the Corps voluntarily puts itself under the command of the chief officer of the municipal brigade. Their equipment is housed together, since that operated by the volunteers is bought and maintained by the city. The professional head of the department has at his daily disposal ten men who do duty every night and render service if called upon. Owing to the fact that the fire risks in Budapest are regarded as considerable, it has been found necessary to augment these two services by essentially private organizations of factory fire brigades. These number 44, all told, total 1,600 men, and have a mutual understanding whereby the members of any one factory assist others in case of need. In criticizing the fire department and equipment of a town such as this, it must first be remembered that it would be expecting too much to demand the finished organization and up-to-date resources of a city such as New York. When it is considered that only latterly has fire control come to be regarded as worthy of more than passing attention, it speaks volumes for the enterprise of a municipality situated so far east and peopled by a race so temperamental as the Hungarians to have evolved so efficient a service. This comment is made necessary because, since comparisons are odious but constantly instituted, it may be imagined that such a statement of facts implies discredit. The following condensed account of the burning of the Parisian store in Budapest on August 24, 1903, though ancient history, still possesses considerable interest. On the ground and mezzanine floors of the building were business premises while the other four stories comprising the house were given over to residential apartments. An open courtyard in the center of the block provided light and air to the residential portion. The proprietor of the business premises, wishing to increase his accommodation, had rented the mezzanine floor of the two adjoining blocks, cutting large openings in the party wall. 
In addition, he roofed over the open court, at the floor level above the mezzanine, closing the doors on the ground and mezzanine floors, leading to both front and back staircases, and blocking the windows facing the business premises. The store premises were stocked with dry goods. At about 7 p.m., smoke was seen issuing through the partition separating the business from the main street entrance of the residential portion. It is alleged that the outbreak was due to an electric short circuit, but more probably it originated among some of the inflammable goods in the store. The fire spread rapidly, volumes of smoke cutting off the egress of the tenants. Shortly the whole of the business portion of the building was involved, and the flames entered the residential part through the glass roof over the central court. Thus the tenants had no other means of escape except the windows overlooking the street, the door of the back staircase having meantime become involved in the general conflagration. Before the arrival of the brigade, three persons had jumped from windows and lost their lives. By the time that the brigade had arrived upon the scene, the fire had obtained so firm a hold that the fire escapes and jumping sheets could not be employed to proper advantage, with the result that twenty-six other persons jumped, of whom nine lost their lives, sixteen were seriously injured, and one was unharmed. Owing to the openings in the party walls of the mezzanine, the fire spread to the adjoining block, narrowly avoiding a very much larger area of damage. The moral of such a calamity is obvious. When tenements are over business premises, every constructional means should be adopted to ensure the safety of the residents. In this connection, the municipality itself should see to it that in all new buildings attention is paid to fire risks, and also that no trade or business of a dangerous nature should be carried on in any inhabited dwelling. This is of especial importance in these days, when the employment of celluloid in various forms has come into such common use. Since the development in Rome from 1870 onwards, combustible materials in building construction have been practically prohibited there. In buildings prior to 1870, wood could be primarily found only in roofs and floors. The wooden staircase in Rome is an exception, and in structures both old and new, a substantial vaulted fire-resisting floor separates the ground floor from all other parts of the building. Thus all shops on the street level are effectively isolated from the tenements above. The number of factories and workshops in Rome is small and is limited to a few steam mills. Consequently, up to 1894, the fire brigade was composed of municipal workers who took it in turns to man the stations and to act as theater watchmen. Since that year, the force has been reorganized, being 200 strong, of whom 140 are firemen, 50 belong to a special reserve, and 10 are officers. The municipality pays the entire expenses of the brigade, amounting to about $12,500 per annum. There are in all seven stations connected by telephonic communication and an alarm system of roughly a hundred points. As regards water supply, there are 350 hydrants exclusively for fire purposes, together with some 3,000 others which can be brought into use if necessary. It is estimated that the number of fires per annum amount approximately to 270, of which, on an average, 216 may be listed as petty, the damage incurred being in each case under $200. Since the population of Rome aggregates half a million, it will be seen that the incidence of fires per thousand inhabitants works out at only 1.8. The total average fire damage annually reaches $50,000. In case of necessity, following the usual continental procedure, the brigade renders assistance at disasters other than fires. As far as apparatus is concerned, there is little to demand attention, the equipment for the most part being somewhat antiquated. No better illustration of the divergency in Italian temperament could be exemplified than the organization of the Milan Fire Department and that of Rome. The northern capital is keenly alive to fire risks, 
and with that enterprise which distinguishes the Piedmontese, it has left no stone unturned to keep its equipment at a high level of excellence. By the decree of the Viceroy, Eugene Napoleon, the brigade was first organized in 1811, and consisted of two officers and 81 men, who were exempt from military service, but were under military discipline. This jurisdiction was not removed until 1859. A great fire which occurred in 1871 showed the necessity for the augmentation of the force, and in the following year 100 members were added, divided into two sections of 50 firemen each. The first was formed of regular firemen posted at the stations, the second of workmen who were obliged to undergo a periodical instruction, attend fires, and undertake patrol duty in the theaters. In 1905 the Corps was modernized, and the present personnel comprises eight superior officers with 240 rank and file. The superintendence of the equipment is delegated to a chief engineer assisted by a motor expert. Included amongst the appliances are 86 manuals and nine steam fire engines, five motor-driven pumps, and nine extension ladders. The use of the chemical engine is general, and a large supply of smoke helmets is included in the apparatus. There are seven stations with direct telephonic communication, each being specially connected with the municipal offices, the police, the military, and the theaters. On an average per annum, there are 785 alarms, of which 16 are serious, 52 of less importance, and 659 of slight consequence. False alarms are inconsiderable. In addition, the brigade renders first aid, being provided with special ambulances for that purpose, while it assists also in the demolishing of dangerous structures. The Scala Theatre, Milan, is world-renowned on account of its vast size, being third in seating capacity of all such structures. It is subject to the supervision of the Theatre Committee, but being a building of considerable antiquity and very inferior in fabric, it can only serve as an example of how a theatre may escape destruction by fire, regardless of the fact that the most elementary rules of constructional equipment have been disregarded, Hence, great credit must be accorded to the theater committee in its efforts to obtain small improvements whilst not having the required powers for the drastic action necessary. The hydrants in the building have a nozzle pressure of about 40 pounds at the stage level and are so arranged that the upper floors may be served through their being coupled to steam fire pumps. Another feature in Milan is also worthy of note. As in many continental countries, the government of Italy has taken over control of all pawn shops and has organized them into a state department known as the Mont de Piété, which comprises, besides the actual loan office, a credit bank and a safe deposit. For this purpose, the municipality of Milan has constructed a special fireproof building, which of its kind is a model. Of reinforced concrete, the floors of the galleries are of iron, with cages of steel wire for the storage of goods in pawn. There is a special watch station on the top of the highest portion of the building, connected direct to the fire headquarters, and a special patrol is kept constantly on duty. Incidentally, there are some 60,000 depositors per annum, and nearly 65% of the goods pawned are under the value of $4.00. The total value of pledges in one year reached the enormous sum of $2,300,000, a sufficient indication of the use made of this institution. By a government regulation, when a reserve fund of $50,000 has been accumulated, the profit goes to municipal charities, so that the money of the needy may be said to supply, in part, their own necessities. The Florentine Fire Department is the best volunteer organization of its kind which can be found in Italy. It is commanded by a military officer, specially selected from the army for this purpose, and paid by the municipality, which also provides the equipment and the fire station. Otherwise, it is officered and manned by volunteers, numbering about 130 officers and men. Their apparatus consists of four steam fire engines, 
a salvage and dangerous structure trap, which is in itself something of a novelty, and three extension ladders. Florence has about 160 fires annually. Since the water supply is not altogether satisfactory, and hydrants are not to be found in all the streets, special engines are used capable of drawing water at a distance of over 300 feet. When the pressure is too small, pumps are used in tandem. The average power from the mains is about 40 pounds to the square inch, which is sufficient for the services it is called upon to perform. Needless to say, the part played by the fire brigade in Venice is one which, in some of its aspects, is unique. Naturally, in a city with canals as high roads, the question of transportation differs materially from that in other towns. The corps forms an integral portion of the vigili, or municipal watchmen, who preserve order and generally render assistance to the community. Thus, in the event of a serious conflagration, the police section of the vigili augment the fire section and vice versa. Each division has a commander and its own staff, both being under the supervision of a military officer specially appointed by the municipality. The rank and file of the fire department number 71 and are distributed in six companies of varying strength. Their apparatus is naturally designed for water transport, and consists of one large modern petrol-propelled float, one large old-type steam float, two 35-foot steam launches, and several small petrol motor boats, which are used as first-aid appliances. Manual engines, ladders, and so forth are carried in a large fleet of swift gondolas. Fire escape work is done with Roman ladders, which are usually planted on two gondolas slung together barge form, or, if the depth of the canal permits, the lower length is bedded in the canal bottom. Owing to the substantial character of the older buildings, and also of the modern residential and business structures, the fire hazards are primarily those in the dock area, with its numerous sheds and small warehouses of a highly inflammable character. There are also some large industrial works in which the fire risks are equally great. The number of fires annually is comparatively small, averaging 125, and it is rare that more than one or two can be classified as serious. Roughly the fire loss per annum is $50,000, or about $400 per fire. Generally speaking, a considerable awakening of interest in questions relating to fire control is manifest in Italy, King Victor being something of an enthusiast in that respect. It is a mistake, however, to suppose, as is advanced by some technical writers, that Italy is more immune from the fire peril than other countries because of its climate. The facts speak for themselves, and the fire risks in New York are nearly as great in midsummer as in the depths of winter. Italy's geographical neighbor, Switzerland, possesses a fire service run practically on national lines, that of Zurich supplying an excellent example. This is a compulsory militia brigade under the control of the chief of police, who is also chairman of a committee of nine charged with the protection of the town from fire. Zurich covers about 12,000 acres, 1,500 of which are built over with some 15,000 houses, the whole of the buildings being subject to the local building regulations, and the State Insurance Association's rules, in which they are compulsorily insured. Every male inhabitant of the town is compelled to do some service for the prevention of or protection against fire from the age of twenty to fifty, which duty may be fulfilled by active service, or, in the case of an able-bodied citizen who is found unsuitable for such service, by the payment of a tax. This impost is fixed upon the basis of his income, though certain citizens are ipso facto exempt from active fire duty. The fire brigade comprises 15 companies of 120 men each, the officers being appointed by the municipal committee. Only men who are personally enthusiastic and who are possessed of good physique are selected and are preferably recruited from the building or allied trades. Absence from drills is regarded as a serious offense, being punishable by a fine, alternatively with imprisonment. 
The city insures the whole of the brigade against accidents and illness with the Swiss Fire Brigade Union, and also provides a fund for families in cases of the death of firemen on duty. Each company has three sections, a fire service section, a life-saving section, and a police section, the latter being utilized for keeping the ground free and attending to salvage. Further, each company is supposed, as a rule, to be able to deal with any fire in its own district, and it is only in the case of a very serious outbreak that additional companies are requested. Thus there is a system of decentralization and independence of action in this force, not often met with elsewhere, which, applied to a large area, would be unworkable. Firemen receive twenty cents for each drill of two hours, while for fires they receive forty cents for two hours and ten cents for each additional hour. This would appear to provide an incentive to unscrupulous firemen, though probably such are non-existent in Zurich, to prolong the life of a fire in accordance with the demands of their purse. The official regulations also state that refreshments are provided, though in this connection it is not clear whether before, during, or after a blaze. An extensive telephone service is at the disposal of the brigade, but since all the personnel are not connected with the system, the alarm is mainly given by horns blown by those who have telephones in their homes. One may be forgiven for imagining that under such circumstances this number cannot be very great. By law the telephone service is free for alarms, and is at the disposal of anyone for that purpose. A company comprises one chief officer, one second officer, one doctor, two ambulance men, and six orderlies as staff in charge, supplemented by, for the fire service, one lieutenant and forty men, for the life-saving section, the same, and for the police section, one lieutenant and twenty men. The full force of all companies is about 2,300 of all ranks. The apparatus is simple in nature, consisting mainly of hose reels and ladder trucks, housed in corrugated iron sheds to which the firemen all have keys. This simplicity of equipment is only made possible by an excellent service of hydrants, of which the city has 2,895, with a nozzle pressure of from 60 to 120 pounds. This represents a great advantage over the pressures to be found in most other continental cities, and is attributable to the fact that the water supply comes from the mountains. The fire control service is organized on most elaborate lines, owing to the fact that the building regulations and state fire insurance are practically in the same hands. All fresh construction, and even alterations, is subject to a cantonial building act, and it is the duty of the building department to carry out the law. Three members of the town council form a committee to grant or refuse licenses for new buildings or alterations to old ones, and in this duty they are assisted by technical advisers, namely the city architect and a number of architectural assistants and surveyors. In the case of a license being refused, an appeal may be made to the town council in plenum, and finally to the cantonial government. Amongst the regulations is the stringent inspection and cleanliness of chimneys, and the officials are, ipso facto, liable to prosecution in case of an outbreak of fire, if it can be shown that they were guilty of neglecting that duty. Such regulations speak volumes for the intelligence of the city fathers of this Swiss town, and are evidence of the realization by the municipality of the necessity for efficient fire control. The principles underlying the organization of the Lucerne Fire Department are very similar to those governing Zurich, with the difference that there is not so much decentralization, and the force is more homogeneous in character. It possesses, however, one feature which is probably unique. Attached to the life-saving section of the Corps is a technical division composed of experts drawn from such industrial undertakings as the Municipal Electrical Supply Company, the Telephone Company, the Tramway Company, the Gas Works, and the Water Works. The officer in command of this section is a civil engineer on the regular staff of the brigade, whose duty it is to advise the commanding officer on all technical points. 
All these divisions and subdivisions must tend toward some confusion in practice, but at the same time the fire chief has ever at his disposal a fund of highly scientific information upon which to draw in case of need. It may be emphasized, however, that the actual exigencies of firefighting under the conditions common to fires of any magnitude cannot permit of any fire chief accepting or soliciting advice from any quarter. He must be sufficient unto himself in the moment of action, though naturally he may have imbibed much useful knowledge from such sources during official discussions. Anything that in the smallest degree tends to diminish the initiative of the fire chief must be disadvantageous to a proper grasp of his complex duties, and it is to be feared in this case that in a multitude of counsel is confusion. This is penned in no critical spirit, but rather as embodying the experience of a practiced firefighter. End of Section 7 Recording by Maria Casper Section 8 of Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 The Trade of Arson. It is calculated that incendiarism for the purpose of obtaining insurance money is responsible for the destruction annually in New York alone of four million dollars worth of property. This represents a daily loss of ten thousand dollars or more than the yearly pay of a major general in the United States Army. Needless to say, this criminal practice is not confined to New York. Every large town in America suffers in a greater or less degree from the attentions of the genus Firebug. Now, for this state of affairs, it is impossible wholly to acquit the great insurance companies, for latterly it has become usual to accept fire risks of considerable value without instituting the searching inquiries, which are a sine qua non for the completion of business in Europe and elsewhere. Of course, cases of arson do now and again occur in any community, but that a gang of criminals should find it both easy and profitable to carry on incendiarism as a regular calling seems almost incredible, and bespeaks a species of toleration which is scarcely to the credit of the community. Quite apart from danger to public property and unnecessary loss to insurance companies, stands out another point in the most vivid of relief, namely the dire peril to human life, of which these fiends take no account. This murderous trade appears to be peculiarly lucrative, and judging from statistics it offers little risk to the perpetrators of discovery and punishment. In addition, also, it requires no stock in trade, such, for instance, as is necessary to the forger. It demands no courage, such as characterizes and lends an air of romance to the train bandit. And most assuredly, it makes no great call upon mental ingenuity, such as marks the operations of a bank swindler. Hence the firebug may without doubt be classed as belonging to the lowest and most degraded portion of the criminal population. Not that necessarily the votaries of this occupation lack a certain amount of spurious education. On the contrary, they are drawn from all grades of society, the less educated being as a rule the tools employed to do the actual burning. In this category must also be included those misguided individuals who, finding themselves in financial difficulties, regard a fire as the simplest method of retrieving their shattered fortunes. Frequently such people employ the services of the professional firebug and share the proceeds. Thus fire-making has become a regularly accepted calling, which it is most urgent should be stamped out in its entirety once and for always. Were additional evidence of the accuracy of these statements needed, it is surely supplied by the following curious circumstances. During the spring, fires in the fur trade are prevalent, while hat and cap fires usually occur in the summer. From September to December, it is peculiar that the ready-made cloak and suit trade suffers severely. 
while any change of fashion in millinery or feathers is invariably followed by a corresponding destruction of the old stock through fire. The advent of the motor car heralded the burning out of hundreds of stables, and now the influx of cheap automobiles into the market appears to approach to overproduction, since garage outbreaks have become practically incessant. All of which is, of course, only circumstantial evidence, though it may be aptly remarked that in some countries this alone is sufficient to bring a man to the gallows. Insurance officials argue that in order to collect insurance on anything alleged to have been destroyed, proof of loss must be submitted. But for the professional firebug this matter presents no difficulty. His system of operation includes a full knowledge of whence he can obtain ample supplies of false invoices, forged affidavits, and perjured testimony. In some cases, goods and furniture which have done duty in other fires are previously placed on the premises in order that all necessary proof of loss may be at hand. This business of incendiarism is responsible to a large degree for that undesirable class of persons known technically as public fire adjusters. It is the self-imposed duty of these functionaries immediately on the occurrence of a fire in any part of the city to hasten to the scene and get into touch with the insured person affected by the outbreak. The keenest competition exists among them, and cases have been known when as many as ten were seeking the same insured party at the same time, and one of them succeeded in obtaining his client by virtually kidnapping him and carrying him away in an automobile. Ostensibly, these adjusters play the part of philanthropists. Actually, they are influenced solely by motives of keen self-interest. Instances have been known where such men have obtained as many as five separate contracts from an insured person immediately after a fire, each contract promising 10% of the insurance money to the adjuster, the assured thus being compelled on settlement to give up fully 50% of his claim against the insurance companies. Although there are no doubt many honest agents, it is desirable to point out some of the questionable methods employed especially in cases where arson charges are involved, thus giving direct encouragement to incendiarism. It is safe to hazard that if many incendiaries had to appear personally in the offices of insurance companies or of their accredited agents, and could not conceal themselves behind the crooked adjuster, the actual facts connected with many questionable fires would be revealed. The most pernicious practice imaginable is that of the agent who, when he solicits business amongst known firebugs, has a distinct understanding with them that fires are to follow the issue of policies. This incriminates these gentlemen equally with their clients, and they most richly deserve a long term of imprisonment. Others, again, instruct policyholders how to pad their claims against companies without any appreciable risk of discovery, Hence, human nature being admittedly frail, it is not uncommon for an individual to realize that by this means he can secure a maximum financial return for a minimum outlay. The writer would here point out that incendiarism does not only affect the social fabric of the community, but multiplies to an inconceivable degree the labors of the firefighting force. For generally speaking, the incendiary lays his fire in such a way that it is of an obstinate character, and only too likely to involve its surroundings. Also, it is deplorable to relate that women are among the most expert in this nefarious trade. Many an innocent-looking curtain and gas-jet blaze, or clothes-closet fire, is the skillfully executed work of the female incendiary. In this connection, the following may be taken as illustrative of the lengths to which women will go in their efforts to make money by this means. During the night of August 15, 1910, a motorman on a trolley car passing down 3rd Avenue in Brooklyn noticed a red glare of a fire in one of the houses on the route. With commendable curiosity, he stopped and investigated. He saw a woman apparently sleeping near the doorway of a shop with her two children beside her, one an infant in a cradle. 
Being a hot night, there was nothing particularly surprising in this. The shop door, however, was ajar, and the motorman peeped in. A strong smell of benzene assailed his nostrils, and in his anxiety to ascertain the cause, he pushed the door further open and stumbled upon two little bonfires blazing merrily. Promptly arousing the apparently sleeping woman, he turned in the alarm. Other tenants in the premises, which contained a number of families and children, rushed down and attempted to put out the flames. Then the sleeping beauty of fiction became the shrew of fact, and a wicked one to boot. "'Don't do that!' she screamed angrily. "'You will only spread the fire. Let the firemen put it out.' Her peculiar anxiety not to have the outbreak promptly extinguished aroused suspicion, and investigations were made. Firemen found several wide-mouthed bottles in differing parts of the shop, all containing kerosene, around their necks being tied cords which led to a main string passing out under the door to where this ingenious lady had been pretending to sleep. Her explanation of this paraphernalia was unintentionally humorous. She suggested that it must have been the action of a wicked burglar. This naive proposition, however, did not satisfy the authorities, and after a severe cross-examination she admitted that the fire had been made at the instigation of a so-called adjuster. This enterprising agent, learning that she had only thirty cents left in the world, had glibly pointed out to her the great advantages to be derived from a fire policy followed by a convenient fire. He had dilated upon his success as a professional incendiarist, remarking that in Chicago he had engineered two uncommonly remunerative ventures. In the first, he had made the fire, while the family, in order to avoid suspicion, had gone to a cinematograph show, while in the second case, in order to give some spectacular realism to a bald piece of villainy, he had actually allowed himself to be rescued at the crucial moment by the fire department. Acting upon this information, the police made inquiries and quickly ran to earth the promoter of this dastardly plot. Brought face to face with his accuser, a dramatic scene ensued. The woman, upon it being pointed out to her that she had endangered the lives of numerous innocent children through the inhuman character of her act, completely broke down and exclaimed, I didn't want the fire. I didn't do it. I will tell the truth to show that I made a mistake in being influenced by this wicked man. He is a firebug and has made many fires in Chicago. It only remains to be said that the woman received a well-merited sentence of five years' penal servitude, while the community will be freed from the attentions of her accomplice for double that period. One more account of feminine ingenuity— a lady residing in an apartment house with her three children had as her sole lodger an old soldier with a wooden leg. One morning she peremptorily gave him notice to leave that same day, and within twenty-four hours a regrettable and of course accidental fire gutted the flat. The insurance company concerned paid her claim without demur, the sufferer removing without delay to a more commodious quarters in another part of the town. After a short sojourn there, she announced her intention of paying a visit to the seaside. The night following her departure, some children sleeping in the apartment below the one she had vacated were awakened by hot water dripping upon them from the ceiling. Immediate investigation resulted in the discovery of a fire in the flat above, the heat of which had melted the water pipes and had thus been instrumental in arousing the inmates of the house to the peril of their position. After the fire department had suppressed the outbreak, a remarkable state of affairs was disclosed. Sideboards, cupboards, and closets were found to be literally packed with ingenious time plants, guaranteed successfully to smolder for several hours, and then, by bursting into flame, to work their wicked will upon everything inflammable in their vicinity. Under the bed was also discovered a wooden box stuffed with papers and cotton waste, soaked in oil and surmounted by the inevitable candle. In the presence of such glaring evidence, the woman was obliged to cut short her holiday and return in the company of a police officer. The insurance company, which had been mulcted in damages over the preceding fire, 
suddenly bethought itself of the unusual claim of sixty dollars for one wooden leg, and upon making inquiries found that the possessor of this means of locomotion had never mourned its loss. Brought to trial after a lengthy hearing, the accused was found guilty of arson in the first degree. The writer feels that he cannot do better than give the exact words of the judge who passed sentence upon this callous fiend. There are certain crimes which are so revolting in their utter disregard of human life that one wonders at the cold-blooded calculation necessary to perpetrate them. Such a crime is arson in the first degree, for which crime you were indicted, and for which you have been convicted in a lesser degree after a careful trial. The first woman found guilty of this crime here in twenty years. I am convinced that you were responsible for the previous fire in your former home, and when you found that you were not suspected of that crime, you planned this affair, and at the same time increased the insurance upon your property. When the defendant is a woman, a mother, who with fiendish indifference for the lives of two families in her house, with four little children in one and two in the other, acts as you have, such a deed passes human understanding upon any other hypothesis save that you were capable of becoming a murderess by that midnight fire, arranged in your rooms with the candles set in oil-soaked combustibles, you, absent to avoid suspicion, and all for the paltry insurance money you hoped to get. I have never seen a cooler, a more calculating prisoner. No womanly sympathy is here, simply a fire fiend trying to secure money at any cost. Any feeling of pity or sympathy for you at this hour I must suspend before my stronger feeling of duty towards the people of this community whose lives and property have twice been in jeopardy through your act. You are a menace to this city of homes, and I therefore sentence you to remain in prison for a term of not less than fourteen years, and not more than fourteen years and six months. Comment upon the above is superfluous, unless it be to say that never was a sentence so richly deserved. Because it is almost inconceivable that women should descend to such depths, these instances of female depravity have been given precedence in the role of dishonor connected with incendiarism. But let it not be imagined that the crimes of men in this direction are any less horrible or less callous. The story of Samuel Brandt is of recent occurrence, and is one of the few instances where a firebug has been caught red-handed. Brandt openly boasted that he had worked up his profession into a high art, and that no fire marshal would ever suspect him of the many charges which could be placed to his account. With two other men he arranged to set fire to a certain flat in Brooklyn, and it may have been his overconfidence which gave the clue to the ever-vigilant police department. Unknown to Brandt, he had been under surveillance for some time, and the exact hour at which the fire was to take place had been discovered, the fire marshal being in the know, arranged that several of his staff should disguise themselves as street cleaners and peddlers, and loiter about in the vicinity of the premises. In a push cart, beneath a load of potatoes and other vegetables, were concealed a length of hose, some hand grenades, and various other firefighting apparatus. All these precautions were taken in order not to arouse Brant's suspicions. But just at the moment when all arrangements had been perfected, a guileless policeman very nearly caused the ruin of the plan. He had stationed himself so near to the house in question that it was feared Brant might take alarm and make his escape. Through the medium of a woman, a note was sent to the officer stating the case and asking him to leave his beat for the time being. Almost immediately after the departure of the policeman, smoke was noticed to be issuing from the windows of the apartment in question, and Brandt, accompanied by one of his accomplices, was seen to hurry from the house. This was the signal for the supposed street cleaners to throw aside their brooms, and for the peddlers to advance nearer with their innocent-looking push-cart. Rapidly they closed in on the two men, who, remarkable to say, showed fight, since the genus firebug does not as a rule suffer from a surplus of physical courage. They were quickly overcome and handed over to the police, the peddlers suddenly developing into first-class firemen who speedily extinguished the flames. 
The fire had been started in a clothes closet, and the flat was literally a magazine of combustible material. At his trial, Brandt remarked, I am a specialist in making fires, and I can make them so that no one can catch me. The fire marshal is a joke. If he gets you, all you have to do is tell him that you were away and get someone to prove it. It was proved that Brandt and his associates worked a regular system. One of them would solicit business by going to the owner of a store, flat, or small business concern, and offer to arrange for the insurance, at the same time planning the burning of the place. His terms were somewhat exorbitant, judging at least by that operation which cost him his freedom for fifteen years. A policy had been taken out for goods supposed to be worth eight hundred dollars, and from this sum no less than five hundred dollars was to be deducted by way of commission, or approximately sixty-five per cent of the claim. Incidentally, Brandt's gang was by no means unique. Others are known to have operated in Chicago and Patterson, New Jersey, and if they have ceased from their efforts, it must in no small degree be due to the active campaign waged lately against all of their kidney by Commissioner Johnson of the New York Fire Department, who can well claim to be their bitterest foe. Undoubtedly, one of the most dastardly acts in the entire history of incendiarism was the series of operations carried on during the year 1912 by a gang under the leadership of a fiend in human form known popularly as the Torch. Their system of swindling the fire insurance companies was peculiarly atrocious, and consisted of obtaining policies on good horses, substituting for the same broken-down hacks, and then burning the latter in order to collect their claims. Fortunately, for a week prior to the night of one of their projected holocausts, the suspects had been watched, and their movements had become known to the fire marshal. The torch was regarded as a desperate character, and hence the fire marshal's assistants, who were chosen to surround the stables involved on the night in question, were heavily armed, while some two hundred yards away two steam fire engines were stationed in readiness for immediate action. Shortly after midnight, the watchers were rewarded by seeing a glare inside the stable, and a moment later the torch and his son were observed making their way from the rear of the stable through a hole under the mangers. An alarm whistle was blown, three revolver shots punctuated the silence, a signal to the firemen to hurry with their apparatus, and a moment later the two desperadoes were fighting like wildcats in the hands of their captors. When an entrance into the stable had been effected, it was difficult, even for men accustomed to all kinds of human rascality, to realize that what they saw was the work of men and not devils. There were three fires burning, one just inside the doorway, a second a few feet away, and another in a corner immediately behind seven helpless horses which were tethered to their mangers. The coats, tails, and manes of two of these animals were saturated with gasoline. One of them was blind and the other was lame. The fire burning inside the doorway was so arranged as to block the only exit in case of possible rescue, and it succeeded so well in its intention that for a considerable time it hindered and rendered most dangerous the efforts of the firemen. The actual owner of the horses confessed that he had hired the torch to carry out this inhuman task, since he had been told that the latter was an expert in that line of business. With the utmost callousness, this firebug admitted his share in the deal, and showed not the least emotion when told that for the next twenty years, if the world was so unfortunate as to be encumbered with his presence for that time, he would be compelled to make his home at Sing Sing Prison. Though the writer knows full well the sentiments of humanitarians anent corporal punishment, he is unable to dissociate himself from a firm conviction that for crimes of this nature, perpetrated with such cold-blooded brutality, flogging is the most suitable reward. Unfortunately, the number of stable fires is considerable, and the fact that approximately 33% of the same are listed officially as cause not ascertained leads to the conclusion that they are of suspicious origin. 
here, surely, is sufficient food for unpleasant thought. For the hand which will apply a match to make a bonfire of a lot of dumb animals will most assuredly not hesitate where human lives are involved. In another case, which came under the writer's notice, no less than sixty horses would have perished miserably, but for the prompt action of the fire brigade. Six separate fires, it was found, had been started in the stalls of the stable, each plant consisting of candles surrounded with kerosene-soaked straw. For perpetrators of this kind of outrage, what human punishment can be too great? The following case is of interest as evidencing the truth in that popular phraseology, chickens invariably come home to roost. An enterprising gentleman, who had had a suspicious fire in a candy store, had been carefully kept under supervision, as it was expected that initial success would encourage future operations. One bleak March morning, a police officer was on patrol in the neighborhood of the suspect's store, when he noticed a man with a bundle of newspapers walking briskly down a side street. In a casual way he watched him, and saw him throw something away which tinkled metallically as it fell on the pavement. The officer picked it up, and found it to be a portion of a toy cash register made of black enameled tin. Putting it in his pocket, he resumed his patrol, and a moment later came upon a motorman who had discovered a fire in the identical candy store under observation, and the alarm was turned in. The place was locked, and there was a strong smell of kerosene. While waiting for the arrival of the fire apparatus, who should turn up but the same man whom the policeman had seen throw away the metal register? The store was completely gutted, and investigation clearly pointed to incendiarism, but direct proof was lacking. It was established that the owner was in serious financial difficulties. His account at the bank consisted only of six cents, and neighbors testified that his checks had been returned marked insufficient funds. Further, shortly before the fire, he admitted that he had borrowed money. This was certainly evidence of a presumptive character, but inadequate to secure conviction. On searching the remains of the fire, however, a charred toy cash register was discovered, minus the portion corresponding to that which had been picked up by the policeman. Confronted with this exhibit, the suspect first declared that he kept several of the same design for sale. Later, under cross-examination, he allowed that for fun his wife had used one and had deposited therein two dollars. The line adopted by the prosecution was that the accused had prepared his store for the fire, and that just prior to his departure he had recollected the two dollars and had broken open the register in order to secure it, carelessly throwing a portion of the same away in the street. Counsel for the defense sought to shatter this theory by producing a brand new toy register of similar design in court. Triumphantly he pointed out the following notice. To open this bank, place ten dollars in coin. It will then open automatically. If you don't deposit ten dollars in coin, you will have to get an axe. Where, pleaded the counsel, was the evidence that the accused had ever even possessed an axe? It was obvious that a blaze of this nature, which had not even incinerated a toy cash register, could not so completely destroy a steel axe head that no trace of it could be found and the fire department had never suggested that they had come upon any trace of such a thing. Further, his client maintained most strongly that the policeman who identified him as the individual who had dropped the portion of the register on the morning of the fire was in error. And in any case, he defied the jury to find any cause to connect the cash box of the accused's wife with that under discussion. It had been proved that the box was unopenable without an axe. Where was the axe? Upon this the jury retired to consider their verdict. Everything seemed in favor of the prisoner when one of their number asked to inspect the exhibit. Within the space of three minutes he had disproved the printed statement on its exterior and had opened it with a penknife. That candy store keeper received a well-earned five years' imprisonment. 
it would be easy to continue multiplying instance upon instance and story upon story to show that the existence of the working incendiary is no figment of the writer's imagination but rather a fact with which municipalities fire departments and insurance companies have got to grapple it accounts in part for the remarkable discrepancies between fire losses in american cities and those in european communities during nineteen ten london had three thousand nine hundred forty one fires paris two thousand thirty berlin two thousand sixty eight and new york fourteen thousand four hundred five for every one hundred thousand inhabitants berlin has ninety seven fires london eighty one St. Petersburg, 75, Paris, 74, Vienna, 59, and New York, 300. The fire loss per head of population in the United States generally is nearly five times greater than that of any foreign country. In New York, during 1911, the per capita loss was $2.45, while the average for European cities was about 50 cents, sinking as low as twelve cents in two towns so differently situated as southampton and dresden after making every allowance for climatic differences structural defects and the use of inflammable building materials it is difficult to escape the conclusion that the firebug has a lot for which to answer Broadly speaking, it is not an exaggeration to estimate 25% of New York fires certainly as of incendiary origin. The insurance risks carried by the 175 companies in New York total the gigantic figure of $40 billion spread throughout the country. Hence it goes without saying that the influence exerted by these corporations, financial and otherwise, is stupendous and may indirectly control the welfare of the community. There are not wanting those who maintain that insurance companies, within a certain degree, welcome fires as bespeaking business. It is reported that the manager of a Scottish insurance company, in a speech at Edinburgh, said, were there no fires, there would be no insurance business. And, on the other hand, the greater the fire damage, the greater the turnover, out of which insurance companies make profits. Now, this is only the report of a speech, and quite probably has been transmitted incorrectly, for it most certainly is at variance with the opinions of the insurance officials with whom this writer has come in contact. Rather is the question one affecting the nation as a whole. The search after all classes of business is so keen nowadays, the turnover so tremendous, and the demands of the shareholders for large profits so exacting, that directors and others responsible must be pardoned if in their anxiety to do the best for those dependent upon them they accept risks which cooler calculation and difference of environment would show to be preposterous it seems absurd to discuss an evil and then not to suggest the remedy but incendiarism though actively affecting the routine of fire departments and causing fire chiefs endless worry and anxiety properly belongs to a sphere outside the purview of the scientific firefighter. It is an excrescence on the social fabric which needs removal by those specially equipped for the task, and undoubtedly those referred to are the insurance companies. The means and methods to be employed must be left to them, for it would be as futile for the writer to tender suggestions on such a highly complicated problem as it would be absurd for underwriters to give him advice regarding the best way to fight a fire in a warehouse filled with explosives. But it is satisfactory to be able to state that already signs are not wanting of a general awakening of interest in the subject amongst all classes affected, professional and otherwise. That is to say, the insurance companies are on the move, and it is no longer so easy to effect policies on worthless goods while the individual of doubtful financial stability and dubious reputation is likely to experience considerable difficulty in persuading even the most reckless of agents to consider seriously his application. Towards this happy consummation, no one has worked with more energy and goodwill than Commissioner Johnson of the New York Fire Department, 
to whose publication on the subject the writer is indebted for many of the illuminating facts used in this chapter. It will at least be conceded by all concerned that the introduction of legislation to assist the insurance companies in their laudable efforts by making the punishment fit the crime and thoroughly frightening the firebug by the penalties awaiting him would be a distinct step in the right direction. End of section 8. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 9 of Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 Gasoline and Garages. The advent of the motor car has not proved an unmixed blessing to the firefighter, and it is no exaggeration to say that the general adoption of motor traction has enormously increased the fire risk. In the first place, Gasoline, the most usually employed of motor oils, is an extremely dangerous substance to handle, though that familiarity which breeds contempt has robbed it of its sinister significance, while ignorance of an almost culpable nature has rendered its handling additionally and unnecessarily perilous. The first essential for motor owner, chauffeur, or garage proprietor is that he should understand something of the chemical qualities of gasoline, in which term may be included all other spirits of a kindred nature, such as petrol, naphthalene, etc. This does not mean that they must study the subject with the microscopic care of the professional chemist, but it does presuppose that any individual gifted with common sense prefers to know the characteristics of the most important adjunct of the machine he essays to own, drive, or house. Gasoline in its primitive state is one of the component factors forming crude petroleum. By distillation it is purified to a greater or lesser extent, automobiles as a rule demanding the most refined spirit available, it is possessed of no flash point, that is to say, if placed in an open vessel, it will vaporize at any ordinary temperature, in fact, even with the thermometer at zero. The weight of its gas is three and a half times greater than air, which forms an inherent hazard, since, unlike ordinary lighting and acetylene gases, which rise and are carried off by a breeze or through any opening which causes a draft, it falls to the floor and will lie and collect unless disturbed. Should the disturbance take the form of a lighted match or candle, a tremendous explosion results and fire follows. But the point is that there is nothing to show that it is collecting in any particular place. It remains dormant and unobserved, like a snake in the grass, and is every inch as dangerous in its effects. Further, Unmixed with air, this vapor is comparatively harmless. Its virility depends upon its admixture with the ethereal gases. When one pint of gasoline is sufficient to make 200 feet of highly explosive mixture. In the liquid state, gasoline is innocuous. That is to say, so long as it remains an absolute liquid, it can neither ignite, burn, nor explode. Similarly, pure gasoline vapor will neither ignite nor burn. It requires the assistance of the air, and it is precisely for this reason that the carburetor plays such an important part in the mechanism of the motor engine. Its highest point of explosive violence is reached when roughly one part of vapor mixes with eight parts of air and decreases in combustibility with an increase of either air or gasoline. Another peculiar property in gasoline to be noted is that even when vaporized and mixed with air, it has a definite temperature of ignition, just as wood or any other combustible material. Hence it will be seen that this spirit is often more dangerous than even gunpowder or dynamite, inasmuch as the latter will stay where they are placed, while the former may vaporize and creeping subtly along a floor or passage, may be ignited a hundred feet or so distant from its source. 
the resultant flash will travel back through the gas strata, thus causing an explosion or fire at the point of its inception. With such ever-present risks attendant upon its use, it might be imagined that every possible precaution would be adopted by those handling it, and yet exactly the reverse is the case. Of all careless persons, chauffeurs and employees of garages may justly claim preeminence. In spite of printed regulations and orders, prominently displayed, they will smoke with the utmost insouciance at every possible opportunity, absolutely heedless of the fact that they would be just as well advised to smoke in a powder mill. And if the employees are bad, then the owners are not much better. Unless compelled by municipal ordinances, they are sublimely indifferent to effective fire protection in their garages, and with the slightest encouragement will press into their service any building, however unsuited to the purpose, either by structure or convenience. An empty stable, a disused church, a ramshackle warehouse built of wood, anything does so long as there is sufficient floor space, and there is any method by which the law can be contravened with impunity. These are some of the difficulties which the modern firefighter must be prepared to encounter, and by some means overcome. Needless to say, drastic laws have been introduced for the proper storage of gasoline in garages, though in this direction a very curious anomaly may be noted. Thus, while the gasoline in the main tank is assiduously protected, no attention is given to the spirit in the tanks of the automobiles themselves, often amounting to thirty or forty gallons per tank, and located haphazardly throughout the entire building. It is obvious that if a fire starts, such an arrangement is only too likely to lead to disaster, and that the care displayed over the main gasoline tank is not unlike locking the windows against burglars and leaving the door wide open. Broadly speaking, gasoline should be stored in a well-made tank underground and beneath the floor of the garage, and in this connection it will be apropos to give some excerpts from the regulations governing garages and the storage of gasoline in New York City. The following six sections explain succinctly where garages should under no circumstances be situated. A. No garage must be within 50 feet of the nearest wall of a building occupied as a school, theater, or other place of public amusement or assembly. B. It must not be situated in any building occupied as a tenement house or hotel. This is by no means uncommon in some parts of Europe, though anyone conversant with the peril he is running would preferably sleep above a fireworks factory. C. Garages may not be located in buildings not constructed of fire-resisting material throughout. D. They may not be situated in places where paints, varnishes, or lacquers are either manufactured, stored, or kept for sale. E. Or where dry goods and other highly inflammable materials are manufactured or kept for sale. F. Or where rosin, turpentine, hemp, cotton, gun cotton, smokeless powder, blasting powder, or any other explosives are stored or kept for sale. Such regulations may sound absurd to the average citizen. Who on earth would want to have a garage in a place where explosives are stored, it may be asked. And though this may be extreme, it is a fact that most of the regulations framed for fire protection are fashioned to guard against the proved thoughtlessness of the individual. The writer is reminded of a genial character he encountered once in his travels in a certain West African port. The gentleman in question casually knocked his pipe ashes out against the rim of an open keg of blasting powder. The remonstrances of his mates, which were of a physical nature, elicited from him the excuse, "'Well, I've often done it before, and nothing has ever happened.' it was quite useless to argue the point, that he would have been blown to Jericho, or somewhere else, but for the mercy of Providence, weighed with him not a whit. It is persons of this type who make nursery legislation necessary, and their name in the motor world is legion. 
the following sections explain themselves and serve to illustrate how gasoline should be stored having due regard to safety a each storage tank shall be constructed of steel at least a quarter of an inch thick shall have a capacity of not more than 275 gallons and shall under test stand a hydrostatic pressure of at least 100 pounds to the square inch b each storage tank shall be coated on the outside with tar or other rust resisting material shall rest upon a solid foundation and shall be embedded in and surrounded by at least 12 inches of portland cement concrete composed of two parts of cement three parts of sand and five parts of stone c each storage tank installed in a garage shall be so set that the top or highest point thereof shall be at least two feet below the level of the lowest cellar floor of any building within a radius of ten feet from the tank any garages constructed along these lines are unlikely readily to catch a light and the financial outlay rendered necessary by such structural additions is as nothing to the increased security obtained the following rules should also be rigidly observed and are applicable to garages attached to private houses which be it said are often carelessly looked after since both master and man are only too prone to be lax especially when outside the sphere of city regulations incidentally however this is precisely one of the occasions demanding the maximum of precaution all oils spilled on the floors of a garage should be removed at once by sponging or swabbing and should be poured into the drain leading to the oil separator which is installed so as to be connected to the house drain and so arranged as to separate all oils from the drainage of the garage no system of artificial lighting other than incandescent electric lights should be installed in any garage unless of a type for which a certificate of approval has been issued by the fire commissioner of course in the country there may be some difficulty over this provision but common sense applied to the problem will certainly limit the fire risk it also goes without saying that no stoves or any appliances likely to produce an exposed spark should be installed in a garage unless placed in a room separated from it by fireproof walls and floors as regards the carelessness of the individual the following excerpt taken from a speech made at the annual meeting of the national board of fire underwriters needs no comment i confess it is astonishing to find that the fire waste is not diminished by the better character of buildings we are getting we are getting better buildings than we ever did before but the losses keep up and this is because fires cost more today than they ever did before and there are new hazards we are using higher explosives we are using higher potentials in electrical practice we are using more gases like gasoline ten years ago the gasoline engine was a clumsy device and there were but few the development of the gasoline engine has brought a widespread field for it the farmer uses it for cutting his feed in grain the merchant uses it the manufacturer uses it the automobile has scattered gasoline all over the country to my desk there come reports of thousands of fires every year from gasoline cleaning with gasoline garages stored with gasoline and the cheerful idiot who smokes cigarettes in the garages and throws matches about useless unnecessary fires must be checked if we can place individual responsibility if we can change the attitude of the people toward the man who has a fire so that they can see that he is not an object of sympathy but a man who has offended against the common welfare unless he can prove that he was in no way responsible for that fire then we will approach the time when we can diminish these hazards that point of view must be emphasized and when every man who has a fire will have to step up before the fire marshal's investigation and is exhibited to his fellows as an offender against the common good as a picker of the pockets of the rest of us i believe we will correct these habits of carelessness the writer cordially endorses the above 
and as regards fire control in garages is inclined to add that for the lax in this respect no condemnation can be too severe from the latest report of the new york board of fire underwriters it appears that of 206 recent fires 33 percent were due to the use of gasoline for cleaning cars and 43 percent were due to backfire into the carburetors of automobiles amongst the others were five from filling tanks of automobiles with lamps burning three from smoking four from gasoline leaks in contact with a hot exhaust pipe five from defective electrical equipment on cars and one from spontaneous combustion these figures point to the fact that the promiscuous use of gasoline in many garages for cleaning purposes taken in conjunction with the number of fires attributed to this cause is one of the most serious hazards with which to contend although the investigations indicate that thirty three per cent of all fires of known cause were due to this practice the actual number is probably even greater as there is reason to believe that an appreciable number of fires reported as caused by backfire into carburetors are due directly or indirectly to cleaning parts of the car with gasoline in a number of the best managed garages the prohibition on the use of gasoline for cleaning purposes is strictly enforced and the use of oils no more volatile than kerosene is insisted upon in other cases even kerosene is prohibited for such purposes and the use of caustic soda and water or a similar solution is required one golden rule for all garages public or private is that a number of buckets filled with sand should be kept in readiness for any emergency while in the way of hand extinguishers those containing carbonate of chloride are amongst the most effectual another fruitful source of danger as far as the use of gasoline is concerned is its employment in dry cleaning and sponging establishments in fact it is an interesting commentary upon the philosophy of life that those elements which are of the greatest general use to society are nearly always fraught with an irreducible minimum of risk if applied without caution the cleansing properties of gasoline are beyond estimate upon this being discovered though fools literally stepped in where angels feared to tread with the result that several lives were lost in consequence of hairdressers using this spirit as a shampoo while it was not unusual for employees in dry cleaning establishments to wander around gas lighted rooms with trays full of the liquid things have altered since then the former operation has been forbidden and the latter is now hedged in with such restrictions that safety is to a considerable extent guaranteed usually the method employed consists of revolving drums each containing thirty or more gallons of gasoline which being in a constant state of disturbance has a tendency to throw off heavy fumes hence the drums must be kept closed when the garments are removed and placed in the rotary dryers or centrifugals more fumes are given off and finally the function of the drying room is to enable the clothes to throw off such gasoline as still remains in them so that this room is especially thick with vapor in addition a number of open vessels containing from five to fifty gallons of spirit will be found scattered about the place their raison d'etre being to facilitate the cleaning of gloves laces and other light and filmy fabrics the hazard in places of this description is too apparent to require much elaboration and it need only be said that the system of storing the main supply of gasoline should be the same as in garages namely underground in this connection it is of interest to note that never in the experience of the writer has any fire started from an underground storage system and in no case has fire been increased because of such a system in fact there is no case on record where the gasoline in a buried tank has been affected by a fire this proves conclusively that there is no danger in its storage when properly arranged but only in its handling thus the latter should be expedited in every possible way 
and so arranged that the gasoline is not exposed to the air, and the ventilation of garages and dry-cleaning plants should be so effected that no gases can accumulate on the floors. Hence the safe and sane handling of gasoline is no longer a question of insurmountable or insuperable difficulty. Inasmuch as the automobile has come to stay, inasmuch as motor traction will be increasingly applied in the near future for all classes of transportation, and inasmuch as the same familiarity, akin to the affection formerly shown to the horse, will now be extended to the motor car, though the affection for the former must not be allowed to develop into contempt for the latter, then it behooves the layman to understand something of the tool with which he will be called upon to deal. Gasoline has been termed man's unseen enemy, but, like many other potential adversaries, careful handling may transform it into a useful servant and a trusty friend. In conclusion, in order to emphasize the point once again, that point which is so regularly neglected, and which is such a fruitful source of danger to the community at large, the words of the New York Fire Ordinance may be quoted in extenso, they apply to all places in which gasoline is either used or stored. It shall be unlawful for any person to smoke or to carry a lighted cigar, cigarette, or pipe into any room or compartment in which volatile or inflammable oil is stored or used, and a notice bearing in large letters the words smoking forbidden, together with an excerpt of the rules governing the subject in smaller letters, shall be displayed in one or more conspicuous places on each floor where volatile inflammable oil is stored or used. Those breaking the regulation hereon displayed are guilty of a misdemeanor. End of Section 9 Recording by Maria Casper Section 10 of Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Great Fires and How They Were Fought. Part 1a. Great conflagrations are plentifully recorded during Roman times, and as has been shown, all that the science of the period, coupled with the most commendable forethought, could accomplish was done to stave off the peril. Nonetheless, however, the magnificent Basilica Julia, a building devoted to law courts, completed by Augustus in B.C. 44, after plans designed by Julius Caesar, was entirely gutted, and remains to this day a relic of architectural antiquity and a perpetual reminder that fire risks ever were, and probably ever will be, amongst the perils of existence. Again, in 64 AD, Rome was devastated by an outbreak which lasted three days and burned out most of the residential portion of the city. It has been popularly attributed to that peculiarly eccentric Emperor Nero, but in justice to that despot it must be added that the evidence of his being a firebug on a gigantic scale is slight. Then occurred a lapse of centuries, during which, no doubt, bad fires took place, but they were not of a sufficiently startling character to leave any permanent mark upon history, till the partial destruction of London in 1666. The details of this conflagration are so well known that it seems almost unnecessary to dwell upon it, but the following description, drawn from a diary of that gossipy old chronicler Samuel Pepys, appears worthy of quotation, since he was an eye-witness, and the style in which he writes is so quaint. September 2nd, Lord's Day some of our maids, sitting up late last night to get things ready against our feast today, Jane called us up about three in the morning to tell us of a great fire they saw in the city. So I rose and slipped on my nightgown and went to the window. But being unused to such fires as followed, I thought it far enough off, and so to bed again and to sleep. 
by and by jane comes and tells me that she hears that above three hundred houses have been burned down to-night by the fire we saw and that it is now burning down all fish street by london bridge so i made myself ready presently and walked to the tower and there got up upon one of the high places sir j robinson's little son going up with me and there i did see the houses at that end of the bridge all on fire and an infinite great fire on this and the other side the end of the bridge among which other people did trouble me for poor little mitchell and our sarah on the bridge so down with my heart full of trouble to the lieutenant of the tower who tells me that it begun this morning in the king's baker's house in pudding lane and that it hath burnt down saint magnus's church and the most part of fish street already so i go down to the waterside and there got a boat and through bridge and there saw a lamentable fire poor mitchell's house as far as the old swan already burned that way and the fire running further that in a very little time it got as far as the steel yard while i was there everybody endeavouring to remove their goods and flinging into the river or bringing them into lighters that lay off poor people staying in their houses as long as till the very fire touched them and then running into boats or clambering from one pair of stairs by the waterside to another and among other things the poor pigeons i perceived were loath to leave their houses but hovered about the windows and balconies till they burned their wings and fell down having stayed and in an hour's time seen the fire rage every way and nobody to my sight endeavouring to quench it but to remove their goods and leave all to the fire and having seen it get as far as the steel yard and the wind mighty high and driving it into the city and everything after so long a drought proving combustible even the very stones of the churches and among other things the poor steeple by which pretty mrs blank lives and whereof my old schoolfellow elborough is a parson taken fire in the very top and there burned till it fell down i go to whitehall with a gentleman with me who desired to go off from the tower to see the fire in my boat and there up to the king's closet in the chapel where people come about me and i did give them an account dismayed them all and word was carried in to the king so i was called for and did tell the king and the duke of york what i saw and that unless his majesty did command houses to be pulled down nothing could stop the fire they seemed much troubled and the king commanded me to go to my lord mayor for him and command him to spare no houses but to pull them down before the fire every way the duke of york bid me tell him that if he would have any more soldiers he shall and so did my lord arlington after as a great secret here meeting with captain cook i in his coach which he lent me and creed with me to st paul's and there walked along watling street as well as i could every creature coming away loaded with goods to save and here and there sick people carried away in beds extraordinary good goods carried in carts and on backs at last met my lord mayor in canning street like a man spent with a handkerchief about his neck to the king's message he cried like a fainting woman lord what can i do i am spent people will not obey me i have been pulling down houses but the fire overtakes us faster than we can do it that he needed no more soldiers and that for himself he must go and refresh himself having been up all night so he left me and i him and walked home seeing people all almost distracted and no manner of means used to quench the fire the houses too so very thick thereabouts and full of matter for burning as pitch and tar in thames street and warehouses of oil and wines and brandy and other things here i saw mr isaac hoblin the handsome man prettily dressed and dirty at his door at dowgate receiving some of his brother's things whose houses were on fire and as he says have been removed twice already and he doubts as it was soon proved that they must be removed from his house also in a little time which was a sad consideration
and to see the churches all filling with goods by people who themselves should have been quietly there at that time. By this time it was about twelve o'clock, and so home, and there find my guests. So near the fire as we could for the smoke, and all over the Thames, with one's faces in the wind, you were almost burned with a shower of fire drops. This is very true, so as houses were burned by these drops and flakes of fire, three or four, nay, five or six houses, one after another. When we could endure no more upon the water, we to a little alehouse on the bank side, over against the three cranes, and there stayed till it was dark almost, and saw the fire grow, and as it grew darker appeared more and more, and in corners and upon steeples and between churches and houses, as far as we could see up the hill of the city, in a most horrid malicious bloody flame, not like the fine flame of an ordinary fire. The chronicler at this point was forced to leave his own home and find shelter with one Sir W. Ryder. This occupied him during the 3rd of September. He continues on the 4th. Sir W. Penn and I to the Tower Street, and there met the fire burning three or four doors beyond Mr. Howell's, whose goods, poor man, his trays and dishes, shovels, etc., were flung all along Tower Street in the kennels, and people working therewith from one end to the other, the fire coming on in that narrow street with incredible fury. And in the evening Sir W. Penn and I did dig another pit and put our wine in it, and I my parmesan cheese, as well as my wine and some other things. I, after supper, walked in the dark down to Tower Street, and there saw it all on fire, at the Trinity House on that side, and the Dolphin Tavern on this side, which was very near us, and the whole heaven on fire. Now begins the practice of blowing up of houses in Tower Street, those next the tower, which at first did frighten people more than anything, but it stopped the fire where it was done, it bringing down the houses to the ground in the same places they stood, and then it was easy to quench what little fire was in it, though it kindled nothing almost. Fifth. About two in the morning my wife calls me up and tells me of new cries of fire, it being come to Barking Church, which is the bottom of our lane. I up, and finding it is so, resolved presently to take her away, and did, and took my gold, which was about two thousand three hundred fifty pounds, W. Hewer and Jane down by Proudy's boat to Woolwich. But, Lord, what a sad sight it was by moonlight, to see the whole city almost on fire, that you might see it as plain at Woolwich as if you were by it but to the fire, and there find greater hopes than I expected, for my confidence of finding our office on fire was such that I durst not ask anybody how it was with us, till I come and saw that it was not burned. But going to the fire, I find, by the blowing up of houses, and the great help given by the workmen out of the king's yards, sent up by Sir W. Penn, there is a good stop given to it, as well at Mark Lane End as at ours, it having only burned the dial of Barking Church and part of the porch, and was there quenched. I up to the top of Barking Steeple, and there saw the saddest sight of desolation that I ever saw. Everywhere great fires, oil cellars, and brimstone, and other things burning. I became afraid to stay there long, and therefore down again as fast as I could the fire being spread as far as I could see it, and to Sir W. Penn's, and there eat a piece of cold meat, having eaten nothing since Sunday but the remains of Sunday's dinner. Here I met with Mr. Young and Whistler, and having removed all my things, and received good hopes that the fire at our end is stopped, then I walk into the town, and find Fenchurch Street, Gracious Street, and Lombard Street all in dust, the exchange a sad sight, nothing standing there, of all the statues or pillars but Sir Thomas Gresham's picture in the corner. Into more fields, our feet ready to burn, walking through the town among the hot coals, and find that full of people, 
and poor wretches carrying their goods there, and everybody keeping his goods together by themselves, and a great blessing it is to them that it is fair weather for them to keep abroad night and day. Drunk there, and paid tuppence for a penny loaf. Thence homeward, having passed through Cheapside, and Newgate Market, all burned, and seen Anthony Joyce's house in fire, and took up, which I keep by me, a piece of glass of the mercer's chapel in the street, where much more was, so melted and buckled with the heat of the fire-like parchment. I did also see a poor cat taken out of a hole in a chimney, joining to the wall of the exchange, with the hair all burned off the body, and yet alive. Sixth. Up about five o'clock, and met Mr. Gowden at the gate of the office, I intending to go out, as I used every now and then, to-day, to see how the fire is, to call our men to Bishop's Gate, where no fire had yet been near, and there is now one broke out, which did give great grounds to people, and to me too, to think that there is some kind of plot in this, on which many by this time have been taken, and it hath been dangerous for any stranger to walk in the streets. But I went with the men, and we did put it out in a little time, so that that was well again. It was pretty to see how hard the women did work in the canals sweeping of water, but then they would scold for drink and be drunk as devils. I saw good butts of sugar broke open in the street, and people give and take handfuls out, and put into beer and drink it. And now, all being pretty well, I took boat and over to Southwark, and took boat on the other side of the bridge, and so to Westminster, thinking to shift myself, being all in dirt from top to bottom, but could not there find any place to buy a shirt or a pair of gloves, Westminster Hall being full of people's goods, those in Westminster having removed all their goods, and the exchequer money put into vessels to carry to none such, but to the swan, and there was trimmed, and then to Whitehall, but saw nobody, and so home. A sad sight to see how the river looks, no houses nor church near it, to the temple where it stopped. At home did go with Sir W. Batten, and our neighbor Knightley, who with one more was the only man of any fashion left in the neighborhood thereabouts, they all removing their goods and leaving their houses to the mercy of the fire. Thence down to Deptford, and there with great satisfaction landed all my goods at Sir G. Carteret's safe, and nothing missed I could see or hear. But strange it is to see cloth workers haul on fire these three days and nights in one body of flame, it being the cellar full of oil. Seventh. Up by five o'clock, and, blessed be God, find all well, and by water to Payne's Wharf. Walked hence, and saw all the town burned, and a miserable sight of Paul's church, with all the roofs fallen, and the body of the choir fallen into St. Faith's. Paul's school also, Ludgate and Fleet Street. My father's house, and the church, and a good part of the temple alike. This day our merchants first met at Gresham College, which, by proclamation, is to be their exchange. Strange to hear what is bid for houses all up and down here. A friend of Sir W. Ryder's, having a hundred and fifty pounds for what he used to let for forty pounds per annum. Much dispute where the custom house shall be, thereby the growth of the city again to be foreseen. People all over the world do cry out of the simplicity of my Lord Mayor in general, and more particularly in this business of the fire, laying it all upon him. Much good discourse, among others, of the low spirits of some rich men of the city, in sparing any encouragement to the poor people that wrought for the saving of their houses. Among others, Alderman Starling, a very rich man, without children, the fire at next door to him in our lane, after our men had saved his house, did give two shillings and sixpence among thirty of them, and did quarrel with some that would remove the rubbish out of the way of the fire, saying that they had come to steal. 
Fifteenth. Captain Cook says he hath computed that the rents of the houses lost in this fire in the city comes to six hundred thousand pounds per annum. Seventeenth. By water, seeing the city all the way, a sad sight indeed, much fire being still in. So much for the story of the fire of London, as told by so inquisitive and garrulous an eyewitness as Samuel Pepys. He could have had no idea that two and a half centuries later all that he remarked as passing strange would be repeated in another continent and amongst buildings higher than the then summit of Paul's church. And yet it is curious to note how identical in many respects are the great conflagrations of today. The general rush for safety, with never a moment's consideration as to whether, after all, there may not be some advantage in the defense of the home by the individual, the starting of subsidiary fires by burning embers, the use of explosives as a means of stopping a conflagration, often only to increase the damage, the frantic appeal to the mayor to do something, and the failure of that individual often to rise to the occasion, and finally, of course, the finding of a suitable scapegoat upon whom to heap blame. It also proves the lamentable condition to which the science of fire prevention has sunk, when the most important and the most wealthy city of the period not only possessed no organized plan of fire resistance, but was content to let it burn for aught its inhabitants cared, so long as their individual property was saved. The lesson, however, was not forgotten, and undoubtedly the modern fire department owes its renaissance from Roman times to this disaster, which once and for all taught the good burgesses of London and elsewhere that fire was an enemy as crafty and as dangerous as any on land or sea. Amongst great conflagrations, that of the city of Baltimore, which occurred on Sunday, February 7, 1904, and continued over the greater part of the following day, attains special prominence from the fact that in spite of the stupendous damage done to property, no lives were lost. The burnt area covered 140 acres and comprised 80 city blocks in the business section, while no less than 27 great buildings of fire-resistive construction were completely gutted, and in some cases collapsed. It may here be stated that at no time was there any shortage of water, which of course is one of the most general causes for the spread of a fire. At 10.48 on that Sunday morning, the automatic alarm registered a call from the basement of the Hearst Building, a wholesale dry goods house with a varied stock, including a large supply of celluloid novelties. Its location was the southeast corner of Liberty and German Streets, and within forty-eight seconds of the alarm an engine company and a hook-and-ladder company under command of the district chief were upon the scene. At that time no fire was visible on the first floor, and neither smoke nor heat was apparent. Presumably this led to an underestimation of the seriousness of the outbreak, as the firemen promptly proceeded to attack only with a single line of chemical hose passed from the German street side of the building into the basement. The small blaze discovered there, and probably caused by a smoldering pile of rubbish, suddenly burst into flame, which with incredible rapidity ran up the elevator shaft, driving the firemen from their positions. About seven minutes later, a violent explosion occurred, blowing out the windows in the building and shattering all the glass in the immediate neighborhood. It was then seen that the entire house was alight from top to bottom, and the flames shooting out through the windows greedily licked the walls of the buildings opposite, which in their turn took fire. Being Sunday, a large proportion of the population were at church, when the muffled boom of the explosion was heard above the solemn strains of sacred music. What it portended none could tell, but in the twinkling of an eye ministers and their congregations had left their devotions and hurried into the street. 
as though in answer to their worst fears another dull rumble of threatening significance was borne across the morning breeze later this was ascertained to have been caused by the explosion of a large quantity of blasting powder which by blowing out more windows expedited the onrush of the flames residents in the hilly portions of the city gazing fearfully in the direction of the sound could see huge volumes of fleecy smoke rising sullenly from the business quarter and then at last the realization was brought home upon them that they were face to face with a great conflagration amongst the first to reach the outbreak were scores of business men intent upon saving their books and records and who eagerly enlisted the services of boys loafers longshoremen in fact any person willing to aid in the all-important task the express companies likewise responded with all speed to the sudden demands made upon them and sent emergency calls for all their employees to requisition hand carts and wagons meantime the outbreak had increased alarmingly and had obviously grown beyond the control of the fire department a district alarm had almost at once been sent in and the departmental chief hurrying to the scene of operations had quickly realized that the flames fanned by an increasing wind and spreading in two directions would need a greater force to deal with them than he had at his disposal also bad luck seemed to dog their most desperate efforts an attempt to save a valuable piece of apparatus cost precious time and was unsuccessful while chief horton himself was unfortunate enough soon after his arrival to be incapacitated for duty by a severe electric shock from a fallen cable it is impossible to estimate the moral effect of such an occurrence for even as on a battlefield soldiers look for encouragement and stimulus to their commander even more so do the rank and file of a fire-fighting force depend upon the example and propinquity of their chief as soon as it became clear that the conflagration was assuming colossal proportions urgent messages were sent to surrounding towns such as washington chester york and philadelphia for their assistance and ultimately even to new york which responded to the call with promptitude owing to the congestion of apparatus however the crowds of spectators and the general confusion many of the out-of-town engines could not be utilized to the best of advantage while differences in hose couplings obliged numbers to obtain their own water supply direct from the harbor thus preventing their presence where most urgent the fire generally took a westerly direction and the buildings in the path of the flames failed to offer any resistance owing to their fire walls being parallel to the onset in the town itself the conditions were lamentable at the city hospital the sisters of mercy with smiling faces and sinking hearts endeavored to keep all news of the fire from their charges while the staff physicians stationed themselves on the roof in order to extinguish the burning embers which rained down upon them finally it was deemed necessary to transport the sufferers to a place of safety in the upper town a task carried out with the greatest tenderness and skill needless to add all the medical men in the town had offered their services and though happily these were required in only a few instances the knowledge of the fact went a long way toward reassuring the timid from five o'clock in the afternoon till midnight the fire made its greatest headway the wind during this period having increased from fourteen miles an hour in a westerly direction to twenty-five miles after which it veered to the northwest and remained in that quarter with decreasing velocity till the finish the spread of the conflagration in the direct path of the wind was practically unchecked by the operations of the firefighters by the doubtful expedient of dynamiting both burning and unburned buildings by the streets or by the so-called fireproof buildings minor explosions however did much to hamper the efficiency of the department one hundred fifty two whiskey barrels for instance caught fire and burst flooding the street with burning spirits and causing indirectly the destruction of three pieces of apparatus 
it may be here mentioned that valuable assistance was rendered by volunteers numbering some two hundred who extinguished a large number of subsidiary fires started by burning brands in quarters not in the direct path of the wind some successes were registered and served to cheer the drooping spirits of the fighters on the west side of liberty street and even in the vicinity of the hearst building a strong force concentrated to windward succeeded in saving a large shirt factory keeping the temperature down to a point where the automatic sprinklers were not called into play subsequently that system certainly proved its value the dry goods store of o'neill and company the entire interior of which was provided with that apparatus was threatened with destruction the roof boards being ignited owing to their tin sheathing becoming red hot fifteen sprinkler heads opened and prevented that fire from spreading another notable instance of successful defense was that made by a third wholesale dry goods house the lloyd jackson company situated at the southeast corner of liberty and lombard streets owners and employees put up a stiff fight kept the roofs wet by hose streams from their private fire pump and hung blankets soaked with water over the cornices at the same time water was pumped into the sprinkler supply tank above the roof until it overflowed when by plugging up the roof drain pipes the water was forced to run over the cornice and thus formed a water curtain down the north front of the building a large amount of glass was broken but there was practically no damage to the interior perhaps the most dramatic scenes were enacted in the neighborhood of the docks where as already stated the out-of-town departments were able to find full scope for their services no one lacked for employment in the river tugs of all sizes dashed in and out amongst the shipping towing away to safety great vessels and their valuable cargoes whose charterers or agents had visions of their entire destruction rescue had come none too soon for the docks of many had grown so hot that it was agony for the sailors to tread their scorched surfaces while the paint on funnels and sides blistered and peeled off in flakes a north german lloyd cargo steamer making its way slowly up the bay was confronted with the spectacle of what would have awaited it had it docked a few hours earlier and anchored hurriedly at a safe distance one busy tug was the means of rescuing the president of the c a gambrel company whose offices were behind the fruit wharves absorbed in saving his books he had not observed that his way to the street was cut off by the advancing flames until he reached the door his only hope now lay in the docks which were already in a precarious state and clutching his treasures under his arms he ran at full speed along the wharf's edge searching with anxious eyes for a boat and even meditating the final arbitrament of the water below him fortunately his plight was noticed and he was dragged on to the tug none the worse for his adventure and now occurred the first notable victory of men against fire in this portion of the city had the flames succeeded in involving denmead's malt house not all the fire departments in america could have stemmed the tidal wave of destruction which would have ensued and it is to the credit of the fire boat cataract that this catastrophe was averted aided by companies on land she fought the oncoming conflagration with grim determination until the safety of the malt house was assured by this time thirty-six companies a police boat and two tugs had concentrated all their force in the vicinity of jones falls a little dirty bad-smelling stream which had never served a useful purpose and which the municipality had proposed filling in owing to its unsanitary condition there city stood by city wilmington by chester york by washington baltimore by philadelphia and new york which had arrived late upon the scene but was doing yeoman service five firemen on the roof of one building had a narrow escape working like demons to save the adjoining houses they heard shouts of warning from their comrades in the street and to their dismay saw the flames beneath them 
a tall telegraph pole which fortunately rose to the height of the roof on which they stood was the only means of escape from the furnace which they could hear roaring below them reaching a tin gutter which afforded them some hold they one by one clutched the pole and slid to the ground the roof on which they had stood falling in before the last man once again had feet on solid earth around the lumber yards on either side of jones falls steam and smoke rose in such clouds that day was turned into night and firemen struggled along in practical darkness at length the united efforts of all the fire departments were beginning to tell and the final struggle for supremacy was short and decisive a minor fire had been started by sparks in a wood-yard across the falls and for a moment it seemed as though past efforts were to be obliterated in this new development but baltimore and chester faced it undismayed and human skill triumphed over its deadly enemy from that time on it was a comparatively easy matter to confine the fire to the limits which it had already reached and the last flames were extinguished towards the evening of that exhausting day new york long cherished a souvenir of the event in the shape of a stray dog which adopted engine sixteen as its foster father and followed it faithfully through the streets all day it accompanied the crew on their return and made itself perfectly at home in its new surroundings responding to its name of baltimore as though it had never known any other it is estimated that the temperature of the fire was rarely much in excess of two thousand two hundred degrees fahrenheit although in some spots it seems to have been approximately two thousand eight hundred degrees or more according to various estimates the most intense heat in the fire resistive buildings lasted from thirty to sixty minutes varying with the amount of combustible contents exposure and other features cast iron radiators and typewriter frames were found in some places almost completely destroyed by oxidation but had melted in a few cases only wired glass melted in a number of instances in contradistinction to ordinary fires in individual buildings which usually spread vertically from floor to floor this conflagration was essentially a horizontal fire as regards its attack and progress in each building as a rule every story was ignited simultaneously through the exterior windows and the fire swept across the building and out at the opposite side under such conditions the protection of floor openings will avail but little if the windows are unprotected vaults made of brick walls built up from the ground especially those having double walls with an air space between made a remarkably good showing when provided with double iron doors the outer ones being filled with about four inches of cement for insulation against heat vaults made of ordinary terracotta tiles about five inches thick and carried on the floors and structural frame failed in a number of cases owing to the fact that the tile was fragile and was cracked or broken by the heat about twenty five per cent of the contents of the tile vaults was destroyed some of these tiled vaults also had double doors each made of a single thickness of sheet steel with no insulation against heat in a number of cases the inner door was left open and the heat which radiated through the outer one destroyed the contents portable safes fared badly approximately sixty five per cent of their contents having been destroyed this was true of all makes of such safes whether insulated with cushions of concrete or not it is a curious fact that the low bank buildings on account apparently of their small height and in some cases sheltered position usually escaped the maximum heat of the general conflagration and did not receive an extreme fire test as a rule they were partially wrecked by the falling walls of higher buildings a group of high office buildings of steel and terracotta tile construction were typical of what may be expected from structures of this type 
and it is interesting to note that the damage was generally greatest in the stories above the first. Notwithstanding the fact that practically no water was used by the fire department in any of these buildings, the basements, and in some cases the first stories, were, to all intents and purposes, untouched, although the floors above were completely burnt out. Even the wooden nailing strips, which were embedded in cinder concrete below the top flooring, were entirely destroyed. It was also specially noticeable that although the conflagration attacked the fire-resistive buildings with great severity, the largest damage to the interiors was due to the fires in the buildings themselves. The damage was appreciably greatest where there had been a considerable amount of combustible material in storage. Even the severest injury to the exterior finish of the walls occurred over the windows on the leeward side when the fire came from within. Such was the great fire of Baltimore, the effects of which staggered the insurance companies of two continents, and sent not a few into liquidation. But as is often the case in such events, it brought in its train fresh channels of thought about fire control, while the energy and enterprise of its citizens has quickly obliterated all signs of the lamentable occurrence. Without going too deeply into problems which are dealt with in general elsewhere, there is one point which must make appeal to even the various tyro on fires and their fighting, namely that Ovid, when he penned the lines, Beginnings check, too late is physic sought, was giving the world in epitomized form the very key to the mastery of success against flames. End of section 10. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 11 of Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Great Fires and How They Were Fought. Part 1 B. The writer must plead the indulgence of his readers if, in describing the great fire which destroyed the Equitable Building in New York, the narrative is related in the first person. Owing to the fact that he was so intimately associated with the events of that memorable occasion, to deal with it otherwise would be impossible, having due regard for the interests involved. At 5.55, on the morning of January 9, 1912, the gong in my quarters struck 2 2 24, which indicated a second alarm from Station 24, at the corner of Nassau and Pine Streets, Two minutes sufficed for me to cover the distance of about one and a half miles between my quarters and the scene of the outbreak, which proved to be in the Equitable Life Assurance Building. This was an oldish structure, eight stories in height, and occupying the whole block, bounded on the north by Cedar Street, on the south by Pine Street, on the east by Nassau Street, and on the west by Broadway, the three first-mentioned thoroughfares were extremely narrow and contained buildings of considerable height, though some of them were of antique construction and doubtful fire resistance. On entering from Pine Street, I ascended the main stairway to the fourth floor, whence, looking up, I could see that a considerable area of the stories above was involved. I immediately directed my first aide, Lieutenant Rankin, to send out a third alarm, and then proceeded to the fifth floor, where I met Acting Deputy Chief Devaney, the officer in command previous to my arrival. Subordinate to him and directing the companies were Battalion Chiefs W. J. Walsh and George Cuss. One glance at the situation sufficed to impress me with the great battle ahead and at once I ordered a fourth alarm with a special call for Water Tower No. 2. Water Tower No. 1, which had responded on the first alarm, was already raised on the Pine Street side of the building. I returned to the street with a full grasp of the conditions to be met. A sixty-mile gale was blowing with the thermometer near zero. 
The direction of the wind was west-southwest, and I foresaw that it would drive the fire towards Nassau Street, where several old buildings, such as the Mutual Life and the Fourth National Bank, lay directly in its path. At this point, Nassau Street is only 47 feet wide, and should the flames have swept the buildings to the east under existing weather conditions, an uncontrollable conflagration would have resulted. To protect this point, therefore, was the first maneuver, and the reason for acquiring an additional water tower. The second alarm assignment reported to me on my return to Pine Street and Broadway, and Acting Chief Kelly of the 3rd Battalion was immediately ordered to take command in Nassau Street. Engine companies were assigned to him and ordered to take their lines to the roof of the 4th National Bank to drive the fire back when it broke through the eastern wall of the building, as was plainly evident would soon occur. Captain Henry, supervising engineer, was directed to meet Water Tower No. 2 on its arrival and have it placed in Nassau Street directly in line with the center of the Equitable, connecting it with the high-pressure hydrants in Maiden Lane, and to order the high-pressure pumps started at a pressure of 200 pounds. This was done to reinforce the lines on the roof of the Fourth National Bank. It may seem to the layman that the transmitting of the alarms, the assignment of companies, and the hundreds of orders consequent thereon, would take an appreciable length of time. Yet from the moment the gong struck in my room until all the arrangements had been perfected, exactly six minutes had elapsed. The actual plan of battle was evolved in less than thirty seconds after my arrival, and from that plan I never deviated. Knowing the construction of the building, with its four entrances and corridors leading therefrom to a great central staircase, it seemed doubtful from the first whether the blaze could be conquered, but the motto of the department under my command has ever been, fight to a finish, and hence we endeavored to outflank the fire by working from the staircase to windward, that is, toward Broadway on the Cedar Street side of the building, Similar tactics were employed towards Nassau Street to confine the fire to the Pine Street side, between the streams directed by the twelve companies in the interior, and the heavy volume of water from the lines placed on the upper floors of the buildings on the south of Pine Street. Such was the first line of attack, and a second line was at once provided by the companies in Nassau Street and the tower stationed there. It is my deliberate opinion that the interior dispositions of the forces at my disposal would certainly have been sufficient and have succeeded in quelling the fire, while the regrettable loss of life which followed would have been avoided, had it not been for the criminal weakness of the iron columns supporting so heavy a roof as that which surmounted the equitable building. The report of the New York Board of Underwriters on the subject is as follows. The columns appear to have been very defective, due to the shifting of the core during casting, making one side of the column very much thinner than the other. Their condition indicates beyond much doubt that the initial collapse in each case was due to the failure of one or more cast-iron columns. Thoroughly mindful of this circumstance, I ordered every person but the firemen from the premises at the moment there were hundreds of cleaners and other people within its walls, absolutely ignorant of any danger, as indeed to the ordinary observer there were no untoward signs, and only trained experts could detect the presence of peril. It is a matter of considerable difficulty to persuade persons who fancy they have business to leave their occupations and vacate their offices under such circumstances, and some time elapsed before the police reported to me that all but the firemen had been ejected. Alas, there were several who never obeyed the summons, as consequent events were only too clearly to show. The fight now continued with increased persistence. I inspected Nassau and Cedar Streets, which being to leeward gave me some anxiety. Returning to the Pine Street corner of Broadway, 
I watched for a few moments the battle which was being brilliantly fought. Never did men struggle harder or with greater intelligence. Every order was promptly executed, but notwithstanding the stubborn attack from both within and without, I could see that the fire was slowly gaining. Until now my reports from inside had been favorable, but judging from external conditions I had grave doubts as to whether the officer in charge of those forces had correctly gauged the situation. It was this which determined me to make another inspection in order to satisfy myself. Accompanied by Lieutenant Rankin and Firemen Henry and Blessing, I proceeded to the fourth, fifth, and sixth floors. Chief Walsh was in command on the fourth floor, and Chiefs Cuss and Devaney on those above. Chief Walsh was confident that he could drive the fire back and confine it to the Pine Street side. It must be emphasized that the conditions were good, very little smoke to weaken the men being observable, as it was driven eastward by the fierceness of the gale. Followed by my aides, I returned to Pine Street, where I found that the granite trimmings on the dormer windows of the upper floors were beginning to fly. This told me at once of the intense heat which must be surrounding the unprotected iron columns, of which mention has been made, and in consequence I ordered all companies to back down and out of the building. A most critical stage of the fire had now been reached. I knew well that within a few minutes of the companies inside the building shutting off their streams, the fire would gain complete mastery. Hence the problem was to get the men out and into position with the second line of attack, which had now become defensive. It is an axiom of warfare that an advance is easier to conduct than a retreat. With such a furious and destructive enemy as fire, the task is even more hazardous, Thus it was obvious that the companies on the upper floors should go first, while their comrades on the lower floors, in less exposed positions, held the flames in check and covered them with their streams. As soon as the latter were shut off, the fire burst through with increased fury, but was met and checked by the lines in the surrounding buildings, reinforced by the Nassau Street water tower. As a further precaution, the Pine Street Tower was removed to the corner of the former street, ready to enfilade the fire and throw a complete water curtain across Nassau Street, in front of the Fourth National Bank, should such a maneuver become necessary. The time was now 6.28 a.m., and I turned in a fifth alarm and ordered an additional 25 pounds on the high-pressure system. I had now 23 engine companies— six hook-and-ladder companies, two water towers, and a force of 275 officers and men. Lieutenant Rankin was dispatched with a second order that the men in the Equitable should back down and get out with all speed, bringing their lines to the Nassau and Cedar Street side, which was the quarter by far the most dangerously exposed. All companies had now reached the main entrance except Engine Company 4, and a few men from Hook and Ladder won, who, under the direction of Battalion Chief Walsh, were fighting obstinately and receding inch by inch. For the third time I sent an order, adding that it was imperative that he and his men should abandon their position, which had become untenable, and leave their line. Walsh received the message, but his sense of security, coupled with a desire to have one last bout with his foe, caused the delay which brought him death. A portion of the roof on the south side collapsed, forcing out part of the wall of the inner court and burying the steps down which the last men were hurrying. Before this catastrophe had occurred, the companies who had responded on the fifth alarm had been assigned positions in the buildings on the east and north, where they connected to the standpipes and threw powerful streams into the upper floors of the burning structure. Their efforts were successful, and at this point the flames were held in check. Captain Farley of Hook and Ladder 8 now reported to me that he and his men had removed Captain Bass and some members of Engine Company 4 and Hook and Ladder 1 from the collapsed part of the building, 
I then ordered a roll call, and discovered that Battalion Chief Walsh was missing. A search party was instituted to rescue him, but failed in the attempt. I learned that as Chief Walsh was about to descend the stairs to the third floor, the unmistakable rumble of falling walls warned him of his danger. Had he remained where he was, he would have been unscathed, but he sprang over the rail and dashed towards a door on the left leading to Nassau Street. Could he have reached it, he would have cheated fate, as did two of his comrades. But he was buried in the wreckage within two feet of safety. Never have I known a man more enthusiastically devoted to his calling. It was the breath of his existence. Brave as a lion, and loving a fight for its own sake, he constantly studied to increase his technical skill. It was my knowledge of the man, of his bulldog grit and determination to conquer or die, that had caused me to be so insistent in my commands to him to leave his post of danger. His heroic spirit was shown in his last action. Aware of the peril, he called to Captain Bass of Engine Company 4, Go at once, save yourself and your men and he remained to add one more name to the roll of those who have died nobly in harness. It was now that the full force of the millions of gallons of water began to tell. The water tower in Nassau Street was sending forth a heavy stream through the two-inch mast nozzle at a pressure of 120 pounds to the square inch, supplied by the high-pressure main in Maiden Lane, this was directed against the flames roaring through the lawyers' club on the fourth floor, while from the roof of the bank across Nassau Street, Acting Battalion Chief Kelly was performing admirable service. On the south, Battalion Chief Rush had availed himself of the standpipes in the buildings, and was using our steamers in conjunction with the house pumps, thus being able to obtain a considerable pressure. The same plan was carried into effect in Cedar Street, and every exposed point was covered on all sides. I was congratulating myself that we were masters of the situation, when the fury of the gale increased, gusts of wind attaining a velocity of seventy miles an hour, swept across the open space formed by Trinity Graveyard at the southwest side of Broadway, and the mercury fell steadily and remorselessly. So intense became the cold that dripping walls turned to ice, and the streets were frozen lakes, while enormous volumes of water were turned to spray by the wind a few feet from the nozzle. Men were repeatedly thrown down in their efforts to cross the path of this hurricane, and I myself was taken from my feet, not once but twenty times, and dashed against the wall of the building where I stood. The equitable now resembled a volcano in eruption. Great masses of granite from its walls were being tossed high in the air like thistledown, and exploding a hundred feet above our heads from the intense heat, their fragments falling in meteoric showers about us, a great section of the outer wall burst near the corner of Pine Street and Broadway, and a piece of stone weighing several tons fell near Mr. Robert Mainzer, with whom I had been speaking, missing him by only a few inches. I then closed that side of Pine Street, even forbidding firemen to pass along it. The intense cold seemed to give the flames a peculiar glow, while the high wind spread them fan-wise, flickering and beckoning over the ice-bound streets. There comes a time in a fire of this description which marks the beginning of the end. If outside exposures are properly protected, there can be no possibility of any increase in the conflagration, and it will be confined to the smallest possible space. Then one of two things will occur. Either the contents of the building will burn out, leaving no food for the flames, or it will fall. Should this latter contingency seem imminent, men must be kept at a safe distance from the walls, and judgment must be used to determine what is the limit of danger. Sometimes a wall will fall outwards at full length as though on hinges, covering the width of a street. 
then again it will collapse break in the middle and fall in a heap like a house of cards needless to say the first of these two conditions is the most dangerous in all respects and must be guarded against at any hazard in the event of a simple collapse the fire has then passed the crisis and as soon as this occurs men can immediately be advanced to close range without special danger the roof and floors of the equitable building were heavy and the intensity of the heat was so great that i feared it would expand and force the outer walls under such weather conditions as existed and in the narrow streets this would have been a serious matter and every nerve was strained to the utmost to drive the fire back and to hold it in in the centre of the building this attempt was crowned with success due not only to the powerful apparatus at my disposal but to the intelligent and in many cases brilliant operations of both officers and men a fire chief can never tell what may happen from one minute to the next and fires bring many surprises in their train which call for quick action of mind and body on the part of the officer in command this day was to prove no exception to the rule just as i felt that the fight was won and was expecting an inward collapse of the floors on the broadway side of the building word was brought that three men were on the roof overlooking that street and calling piteously for help after all my efforts to clear the building it seemed impossible that anyone could have remained within its precincts and yet these poor cleaners and porters had defied a command and had pitted their judgment against scientific knowledge with the result that they had been driven up to the roof where we could see them standing to reach them on that spot over one hundred feet from the ground when the possibility of a collapse had become imminent was a task to test the nerves of the strongest and the bravest of men that any attempt at rescue was fraught with great danger to all concerned i had not the slightest doubt but it is the duty of men on such occasions to brave death and even to defy it all chances were against them momentarily i was expecting an avalanche of bricks stone and burning embers the fierce gale swept strong men from their feet and the spray from the nozzles froze on their faces till they could scarcely see in spite of these conditions the men responded to my call without hesitation a hook and ladder truck was swung in on the northwest corner of cedar street and in less than one minute the extension ladder had been raised as i stood at its foot i did not have a chance to ask for volunteers or to order any men to this terrible duty on the instant lieutenant rankin fireman malloy and blessing sprang onto the rungs taking scaling ladders with them in the meantime i could see that it would be a most difficult undertaking to scale the equitable building on account of the projecting cornice and i therefore ordered acting chief kelly and the officers and men of hook and ladder one to proceed to the ninth floor of the building on the north side of cedar street with the gun roof rope and lifeline if the line could be shot true against such a gale it might serve two purposes for it would be ready for use by the men ascending the ladder or if this attempt failed the captives could make the line fast to some projection and slide down to possible safety the shot was aimed and the line fell true we could see the men in the act of hauling it across the space when the expected happened the great collapse came with a cry of agony and despair the unfortunates sprang out into the air and as they plunged downward there came with them the roof and the upper floors from my position i at first thought the bodies were those of the brave fellows who had so nobly gone to the rescue and though they struck the street a few feet from where i stood and though fire smoke and debris were on all sides for an instant i felt indifferent to my own fate then i realized that other lives and vast treasures were at stake and that at this moment my life was of value to the city turning around i walked slowly to the center of broadway and from this point i could see that the men who had ascended the ladder were alive 
Blessing was on the ladder. Rankin had one foot on the ledge, and Malloy was standing on the highest ledge of the broken and badly bulging wall. Their efforts had been in vain, but heroism could have been put to no greater test. My relief was great when I saw them descend unhurt. And now horror succeeded horror with incredible rapidity. Scarcely had the unfortunate creatures who had jumped from the roof been removed from the street, when Fire Commissioner Johnson told me that he had been informed that there were men imprisoned in the vaults on the Broadway side. The windows of these vaults were protected by bars of iron, two inches in thickness, and were inset at such close intervals that no human body could possibly pass between them. I soon found that this information was correct. For there, caught in a fiery prison, were three men, two living, pinned down by broken floor joists, and one dead, killed by a falling beam. With a raging fire behind them, a raging fire over them, heavy iron bars in front, and broken and tottering walls on every side, their predicament was a terrible one. "'Save them! Save them!' was the cry from men who stood at a distance. But this seemed to be impossible. I directed two companies with sledges and other heavy tools to try and wrench out the bars. In addition, though scarcely to be mentioned in comparison with these precious lives, there were a billion dollars' worth of security in the vaults, and the fire threatened both with speedy destruction. Fully realizing the gravity of the conditions, and wishing to obtain a better view of the situation, I took the elevator to the eighteenth floor of the Trinity Building, directly across Broadway. When I reached the front window, overlooking the equitable, an awe-inspiring scene met my gaze. Beneath me lay a seething, boiling cauldron. The very earth seemed to vomit forth flames and send up from its depths mammoth tongues of fire. Parts of chairs, desks, and boards were being hurled like pebbles five hundred feet into the air. Only the pen of Dante or the brush of Verrishagen could do it justice. But the question for me to decide was whether the Broadway front would hold, or whether it would collapse, burying the entombed men and the companies trying to effect their rescue. After a careful survey, I determined that the walls would stand, but to ensure this, I ordered that a strong stream of water from the Trinity building be employed to reduce the expansion by forcing the fire back at this point. About this time, I resolved to transmit the borough call, feeling that additional aid was necessary properly to protect the vaults and the men imprisoned therein. It was also advisable to have a greater number of powerful streams on the leeward side of the fire, although up to this time I had been able to hold it in check. Now the time seemed to have arrived for an advance, and this my lines were unable to accomplish. All these conditions made the borough call a necessity, and the alarm 7724-3339 was transmitted. Translated into plain English, this meant that the companies assigned to respond on the third alarm to Box 39, Borough of Brooklyn, would proceed to Box 24, Borough of Manhattan. The Brooklyn companies arrived promptly in charge of Deputy Chief Lally, and were assigned to positions, with the exception of the water tower, which was not needed and was sent back to quarters. Two engines were connected to the Siamese inlet on the front of the Trinity building, and two-and-a-half-inch lines of hose attached to the standpipe outlets on the seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth floors. These were all stretched to the eighth floor and connected in pairs by means of two-and-a-half to three-inch Siamese, then a length of three-inch hose was connected to each of these, and in turn to a three-inch Siamese. Leading from this was a length of three-inch hose, having a one-and-three-eighths-inch nozzle. This provided a pressure of a hundred and thirty pounds at the nozzle, with two hundred sixty pounds on each engine, and had less friction than if any other method had been employed. Now began the battle for life and treasure. 
Hacksaws were procured, and for almost an hour Engineer Lark, assisted by Rankin, Henry, and others, sawed at the bars, while great masses of stone fell from the upper stories around the workers. One great fragment rebounded and struck Lark in the back, almost paralyzing him. Rankin now took the hacksaw and cut through the remaining bars, so that ropes could be attached and the opening sufficiently enlarged to admit the passage of a body. One of the men was taken out, suffering from smoke, exposure, and shock. But the other cried, For God's sake, don't leave me. My arm is fast. Upon examination, it was found that his arm was pinned across the back of the dead man by two iron beams, and for fifteen minutes Henry and his comrades, using crowbars, pried and pulled, assisted by the man himself, before his release was effected. When free, he collapsed and was taken across Broadway, where he joined his companion under the care of Dr. H. M. Archer, who gave them every attention that humanity and science could suggest. By this time the fire was well under control on the north and east, and all danger of its crossing Cedar and Nassau streets had passed. I now called a boat tender and stretched three-and-a-half-inch hose from the high-pressure hydrants to the Broadway front of the building. Three-inch lines were also taken from the water tower into the Cedar Street buildings opposite the vaults, and company lines were siamese in order that heavier streams could be forced against the gale, which still increased. This method was in operation on the roof of the clearing house, where it was most effective. A peculiar phenomenon of this fire was that it worked steadily to windward against the furious gale. It seemed as though determined to destroy the enormous wealth contained in the vaults. All our forces were now concentrated to prevent such a catastrophe, and also to prevent the cremation of the lifeless companion of the two men we had rescued. Owing to the magnitude of our attack, the securities were untouched and unharmed, the walls, which were badly cracked and out of plumb, remained standing, and the corpse was not incinerated. Cautiously we now closed in, and the fight was over. There is one incident which I must mention, as it serves to show the hold sport maintains upon its votaries, even in moments of the greatest strain. Mr. August Belmont came to me, and asked permission to go through his offices— which, facing the east, had to a large extent escaped the great damage experienced elsewhere. I personally went with him through the ruins of his once beautiful suite of business premises, now sadly spoiled by water and fire. He then explained to me that his chief fear was lest harm should have come to the records and pedigrees of his horses, which of course are famous not only in America but wherever racing is popular. I am happy to say that he found them intact, and with a smile he tucked them under his arm and bade me a cheery good day. Another fact which I take pride in recalling was that of the gallantry shown by Father Joseph P. Dineen, who at the risk of his life conveyed the sacrament to one of the men afterwards rescued from the vault, this at a moment when all the onlookers feared the worst, and no man would have been considered a coward for hesitating. Some idea of the magnitude of the operations can be gleaned from the following statistics. Eighty-five officers and about five hundred men operated thirty-one steam engines, ten hook-and-ladder trucks, two water towers, and superintended the high-pressure service, while the water used in the attack amounted approximately to twelve million gallons. During the progress of the fire, all business in Wall Street was suspended, and anxiety reigned in two continents as to the fate of the billion dollars' worth of securities in the strong rooms. It speaks volumes for the skill of the firefighters that not one dollar's worth of damage was done in that direction, and that when recovered the papers were not even discolored. The outstanding features of this remarkable fire were the tremendous value of the property at stake, the extraordinary climatic conditions, 
and the possibility of the spread of the flames which would have caused a disaster unparalleled in the annals of history so stupendous would have been the financial loss in addition to this the construction of the building concerned was something of a revelation to all thinking persons for the weakness of the columns supporting the roof was so glaringly apparent even to the lay mind that those responsible for its erection must have been either hopelessly incompetent or criminally careless further owing to the age of the structure and the idiosyncrasies of some of its tenants it was a literal rabbit warren of private staircases ending in cul-de-sacs and narrow passages leading nowhere in particular the only marvel in fact appears to have been that the loss of life was not greater for it was only too easy for the firemen operating to lose their way in the intricacy of its mazes i must not fail to compliment the police department on its excellent work in the keeping of the fire lines this work being exceedingly difficult owing to the extreme exposure and extraordinary weather conditions prevailing it is pleasant to record that financiers and others of wealth and prominence with offices adjacent sufficiently recognized the self-sacrificing devotion of the department in subscribing the sum of one hundred eighty five thousand dollars the interest of which was to be used in perpetuity for the benefit of widows and orphans of firemen and policemen killed in the discharge of their duty end of section eleven recording by maria casper Section 12 of Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 Great Fires and How They Were Fought. Part 2. There occur at intervals in the history of the world calamities occasioned partially by fire, of which it is almost impossible to give a concise narrative or upon which either to pass criticism or apportion blame. In other words, when fate or destiny, or call it what you will, takes a hand in the game, human ingenuity, science, and forethought can only play subsidiary roles in dealing the cards. The Baltimore fire was destructive of property. The equitable teemed with terrible possibilities, and gave scope for the most modern fire strategy that probably the world has yet seen. But the conflagration in San Francisco formed an upheaval of primal elements, which in their magnitude stand alone in history, and yet show that dogged perseverance inborn in the firefighter, which sooner or later surmounts the greatest obstacles. On April 17, 1906, San Francisco was one of the happiest, grandest, and most popular cities in the United States. Within twelve hours, a large portion was in ruins. Within twenty-four, it was a mass of belching flames. And within thirty-six, the lamentations of its inhabitants had penetrated to the most remote quarters of the globe. To epitomize this ghastly debacle, on Wednesday, April 18th, an earthquake shock occurred, doing considerable damage, so badly crippling the water mains that, though their supply was rated at 36 million gallons a day, not only was the fire department unable to obtain the wherewithal with which to attack the ensuing fires, but so scarce became this necessity of human life that it is credibly reported that at one period it was being retailed to thirsty thousands at fabulous sums per cup. This conflagration destroyed 2,831 acres of business and dwelling houses, and caused losses to the insurance companies concerned of approximately $300 million. Needless to say, it is impossible to determine the number, location, or causes of the original outbreaks. All that can be definitely stated is that the fire alarms at headquarters were completely dislocated by the earthquake shocks, that the building in question was subsequently burned, that the telephone service became completely disorganized, 
and that doubtless many unsuccessful attempts were made to apprise the fire department of the need of its services. All that can be hazarded is that within half an hour of the commencements of the outbreaks there must have been twelve distinct and separate fires needing attention. Roughly, in order to give some idea of the operations involved, it may be stated that the center of the fire zone was an eminence known as Knob Hill. Thence, one portion of the city was involved eastwards to the waterfront, taking in Chinatown and the Latin Quarter en route. A second spread in a southwesterly direction through the business section and menaced the wharves and ferries, while the third, originating in the Mission District to the west of Knob Hill, burnt its way steadily towards the Union Iron Works, where at that time were building two battleships for the United States Navy. Before dealing in such detail as is possible with the incidental operations of the fire department, it may be said that the fire force, including reserves, consisted of some 600 men, 53 engines, 15 ladder trucks, nine chemical engines, and two fireboats maintained by the harbor commissioners. One of the fireboats had a capacity of 1,400 gallons per minute, and the other 930, both with a water pressure of 150 pounds. Of the 77,000 feet of leading hose, nearly 38,000 feet were lost, or over one-half, while three engines and a ladder were disabled beyond repair. Fire Chief Sullivan was unfortunately injured at the outset and died before he had formulated a plan of attack. This comprehends the total casualties to men and materiel in the department during the entire conflagration, a remarkably small percentage of the whole, and it is a fair supposition that had the means of regular communication been open and had water been obtainable during the early hours of the disaster, and having also due regard for the lightness of the wind and its direction, the fire department would have obtained control by noon of the first day. During the first period, that is to say, until Wednesday night, the fire appears to have been spasmodic and did not possess the nature of a fierce sweeping blast. The ordinary rules of exposure seem to have prevailed, and a leading part was played by familiar factors, such as individual combustibility, adjacency, opposing openings, short distances, and excess height. Some notable cases of defense are worthy of comment, such as that of the U.S. Mint, an old building far beyond modern standards of fire resistance. Superintendent Leach of the fire department rallied his men, and assisted by some regular soldiers, beat the fire off in a manner worthy of the highest commendation. Another remarkable effort was that made by the employees of the post office to save that structure. As the flames attacked, through windows broken by the heat, everything igniting was extinguished in detail. The officials fought most gallantly, and three days later, when it was possible once again to obtain access to the building, eleven postal clerks, who had been seventy-two hours without food or water, were rescued, together with the whole of the mail of which they had been in charge. Late in the afternoon, the great twenty-one-story Spreckles building ignited, through broken windows on the fourth floor, from fires started in two small frame buildings adjacent to it. This provided one of the most spectacular scenes of the whole outbreak. Enormous crowds watched the dull red glow mount floor by floor, till it reached the ornate three-tiered dome surmounting this edifice. The circular windows therein seemed to shine like moons for some moments, then followed a thousand spurts of flame as the floors collapsed, and as darkness closed around, men and women wailed hysterically thus to see the pride of their city so remorselessly destroyed. As for the Palace Hotel, its doom was sealed early in the afternoon, a fine attempt was made by its staff, assisted by some of the guests, to resist the enemy, but the protection of a hundred-odd closely attacked and wooden-framed windows and a vulnerable roof swamped them, and the hotel was abandoned. Shortly after this commenced the extensive use of explosives which figured so prominently in this conflagration. 
It is not surprising that men reduced to helplessness and desperation by lack of water should have resorted to what has been proved in all modern fires to be useless, and, in the opinion of this writer, even harmful. As is usually the case, the explosions made no effective gaps, and rather served to increase the quantity of combustible material. On the other hand, windows throughout the neighborhood were shattered. The proximity of exploding buildings made it dangerous for owners to prosecute individual efforts towards the protection of their own property, and it would appear that the choice of location for this desperate expedient was both haphazard and unintelligent. The situation when Wednesday night arrived is important to realize. Until now, the rich business district north of Market Street and the high-class residential area were untouched. It was still possible to maintain communication and to conduct organized opposition, since the center of the city was yet habitable. But human nature had become exhausted. Questions of life became paramount to those of property, so that upon the direction of the wind depended the future. Alas, during the evening the breeze, for it was little more, veered southward and increased, just sufficiently to level the sweep of the flame and render leeward positions untenable. The huge frame of the mechanics' pavilion was transformed into a roaring pyre, and the upslope toward Russian Hill perceptibly increased the vulnerability of that district. From now onwards, the spread of the flames was more rapid, and they greedily ate their way along O'Farrell Street, devouring in turn theaters, hotels, clubs, stores, and apartment houses. Higher buildings, like the Crocker, felt the blast of the intense heat in their upper stories and caught fire ahead of their time. Fireproof buildings, like the Mills and the Merchants' Exchange, which during the day had proved bulwarks of safety, became involved, and towards midnight were burning like beacon flares. A most desperate stand was now made around the Fairmount Hotel. Sailors from a revenue cutter, assisted by firemen, ran a three-quarter mile length of hose from their ship to the building, their officers with drawn revolvers impressing civilian bystanders to act as property savers. But all to no purpose, and as the dawn of the second day colored the eastern horizon, it was realized that not only the hotel but all the surrounding wealthy residences were doomed. During that Thursday morning the wind lightened, and now blew from the east, and served to check the advance of the flames which threatened the ferry building. It confronted, however, the defenders with a fresh and even more alarming development, that of losing the only closely inhabited part of the city remaining, the section west of Van Ness Avenue, in this 125-foot street, the most extraordinary efforts had been resorted to in a vain attempt to stop the ever-spreading fires. Beautiful houses were blown to atoms by dynamite, while the artillery belonging to the military garrison had carried on a steady and remorseless bombardment with high-explosive shells. The neighborhood was an inferno. Above the crackling of the flames resounded the dull boom of bursting shrapnel, and the cries of terror-stricken men and women, while a canopy of green-gray smoke slowly spread upwards, marking the positions of the targets. Yet all this only served to provide fresh fuel for the oncoming conflagration. Some check was doubtless afforded by these drastic measures, but the invader still advanced westward. On the Friday morning, the third day of the fire, the east wind happily dropped, but was succeeded by a strong westerly breeze, which, within the course of a few hours, shifted between northwest and southwest, the former driving the flames into the Latin quarter and destroying the frame houses comprising it like so many dry leaves, and the remarkable sight was witnessed of thousands of barrels of wine being stove in with the vain hope that the liquor might be used to stay the approaching cataclysm. Forces concentrated near the Merchants' Ice and Cold Storage Company, with the assistance of a city engine, and using the company's own water supply, at this point won a victory over the flames. 
individual work also saved an isolated and somewhat scattered group of high-class dwellings on the precipitous summit of Russian Hill. The conflagration had thus lasted three days, and on the Saturday morning a heavy rain did much to bring the situation under control. A few smoldering blazes along the east waterfront occasionally flared up, endangering unburnt structures, but were, however, promptly suppressed. Vigorous and effective measures were now taken to prevent new outbreaks in the uninjured districts, where, owing to the earthquake, chimneys, gas pipes, and electric wiring were generally in an unsafe condition, and where the scant water supply rendered the situation most precarious. No time was lost in destroying dangerous walls, and it is worthy of comment that explosives were again used to an exceptional degree in this work, causing unnecessary additional damage in some places, and unfortunately quickly terminating many opportunities for distinguishing the true effects of the fire. Thus, within the burnt area of 2,831 acres, there survived, in a partially habitable condition, firstly, three groups of buildings, that is, the detached dwellings on Russian Hill, some warehouses at the foot of Telegraph Hill, and a mercantile group near the Custom House. Secondly, one factory plant, the Western Electric Company. Thirdly, three government buildings, the Mint, the Post Office, and the Appraiser's Building. Fourthly, two fire-resisting office buildings, the Hayward, with a three-story building adjoining, and the Atlas building, with a two-story structure adjacent to it. Such is a brief description of the conflagration which devastated San Francisco, and necessitated, without exaggeration, the foundation of a new city. The narrative has been shorn of anything that might detract from a realization of the factors which governed the actual situation, though naturally it goes without saying that incidents of interest, humorous, pathetic, and tragic abound. As in all great crises, the behavior of those concerned varied according to temperament and circumstance. But generally speaking, there was little real panic, and on all sides was observable a tendency to make the best of things, and incidentally to help others to do likewise. At first people were so stunned that they scarcely realized what was passing, as was evidenced by one stranger to the town, who, making his way to safety, was accosted by a rough who demanded his purse. He surrendered it without demur, but the hold-up had been observed by an officer in command of some soldiers. Martial law having been declared, the thief was shot dead on sight. Afterwards, being asked to give evidence regarding this shooting, the victim of the assault was found to have forgotten everything about it, and remarked that he was so bewildered that anything seemed quite natural. This curious mental effect was by no means uncommon, and no doubt indirectly exerted an influence against any access of unreasoning or overwhelming terror which would have rendered the exertions of the authorities practically abortive. A story, dramatic in its sheer horror, was related by a doctor, who reported that he had found a man pinned under debris and suffering the most horrible torture, the while calling loudly for someone to put him out of his misery. After consultation, a police officer drew his revolver and fired at the sufferer, but being presumably unnerved, the shot went wide of its mark. The doctor was then authorized to act, and he accordingly opened the arteries in the man's arm, thus assuring him a speedy release from his agony. Thieves there were, too, in plenty, though short shrift was their lot when caught. Firing squads patrolled the streets, and these ghouls paid the price of their hideous crimes, the hacking of beringed fingers from lifeless hands and the like, with their own worthless bodies. On the other hand, simple heroism could be depicted in no nobler form than the spiritual comfort extended to the dying by the ministers of all denominations, who worked like slaves at great risk to themselves. A word of praise must be written, and in the pluck and never-flagging determination shown by all ranks of the fire department, under the command of Chief Shaughnessy, who succeeded Chief Sullivan after the death of the latter, 
the firemen worked for three whole days with such apparatus as was at hand, and only ceased when compelled so to do from physical exhaustion. And, with all, humor was not lacking. It so happened that the Metropolitan Opera Company of New York was fulfilling an engagement in the city at the time, and the experiences of its individual members would fill a volume. Their worldwide fame, of course, aroused the greatest interest in their fates, and it was only after some days that public anxiety was allayed, and it was learnt that no one of their number was the worse for the experience. Caruso was a guest at the Palace Hotel, and only escaped with difficulty, but he accepted the unexpected with a philosophy not usually associated with his countrymen, and as he sat in the middle of the street upon his valise, wondering what was coming next, he nonchalantly rolled a cigarette and professed himself as not unduly disturbed. Later, in common with everyone else, he was compelled to shift for himself, and owed his cordial reception by a band of soldiers, who gave him food and lodging, to the fact that he was carrying with him a photo of ex-President Roosevelt, inscribed with the words, With Kindest Regards. This served as a passport, one of the men remarking, If you're Teddy's friend, come right in and be comfortable. Caruso afterwards summed up his impressions in the sentence, It instantly recalled the horrors of my native Naples, of which I've been reading. Vesuvius interruption could not have been as horrible. Campanari, the great baritone, contented himself by opining that it made a change in the monotony of touring, and that he found Caruso's pajamas, in which incidentally he had escaped, a bad fit. Rossi, the bass, passed the time by trying his voice, while Nehan Franco, one of the conductors, risked his life by returning to his hotel in order to save a violin he much prized. Madame Sembrick succeeded in saving her pearls, reputed to be some of the finest extant, but assessed the loss of her wardrobe at twenty-five thousand dollars. Finally, Alfred Hertz, the musical director, who also helped himself to Caruso's garments in the moment of the emergency, found safety near the zoological gardens, which, owing to the roars of the frightened beasts, he declared to be a more horrible place than any in the city. A fact of more than passing interest which must strike all observers is the similarity of the results recorded in this conflagration to those in the Baltimore outbreak. The latter was the first in which modern methods of fire resistance received a severe test. There the water supply was adequate, and the fire department well up to the average, and manipulated with considerable intelligence. There were fireproof buildings, most of them of modern construction, and so situated as to reinforce each other and act, so to speak, as fire breaks. Yet the result showed that in the direct sweep of the fire, as determined by the direction of the wind, nothing survived except the following. Firstly, an occasional one- or two-story building, favorably located as to shelter or wind currents. Secondly, an occasional grade floor in a fire-resistive building. And thirdly, the empty shells of the fireproof buildings themselves, none of which possessed front window protection. Finally, structures on the side borders of the wind sweep, where the exposure was confined to ignition from brands, and where men and apparatus could maintain a working basis and keep open their communications. There was also something in the nature of a successful check at Jones Falls, a stream of water of but moderate width by which engines belonging to the New York Fire Department made a determined stand. Thus, from past experiences, there was no reasonable expectation in San Francisco of the survival of any building after the fire department was in retreat, except in cases analogous to those just mentioned. In the main, this proved correct, with some few exceptions. Within the burned section, not only did all frame buildings succumb, but also all brick structures having wooden floor beams, whether of good, bad, or indifferent construction, and with more or less complete ruin in nearly every case, with the one exception of the Palace Hotel. Prominent amongst conclusions which may be formed from this disaster, in the opinion of this writer, are the uselessness of explosives as a deterrent measure to the spread of flames, 
and the danger to tall buildings from the heat engendered by burning structures of a lesser height. The former accentuates confusion, causes panic, fosters misunderstandings between municipal and federal authorities, destroys property which otherwise might conceivably be saved, provides fresh fuel for the flames, and hence is practically worthless as a serious feature in firefighting. An exception, which may occur, only goes to emphasize the point. As regards the latter, this danger was plainly exemplified in the occurrences in San Francisco, and serves to illustrate the care which must be taken in considering the fire-resisting methods which must receive attention in the modern skyscraper, and which are dealt with at length in another chapter. Suffice it to say that the heat wave generated during the climax of the conflagration rose to a height of about 300 feet above the street level, and was directly responsible for the ignition of church steeples, skyscrapers, and all structures of a similar character. Otherwise, many old data received confirmation, which have been listed as follows in the underwriter's report upon the conflagration. A. The dangerous effect of a number of simultaneous fires. B. The weakening of a firefighting force if compelled to thin out over a wide front c. The improbability with existing methods of frontal resistance to a fire sweep when the wind velocity exceeds a certain critical figure. d. The special vulnerability of leeward upslopes. e. The structural ruin in conflagrations of all wooden joist brick buildings where the stability of the walls in any way depends upon the bracing of the beams. f the limited utility in a conflagration of rear and side shuttering where front windows remain unprotected g the likelihood of ignition of ordinary roofs consisting as they do of wooden boards with a thin veneer of tin or other roofing material h the slight value as conflagration breaks of fireproof buildings when abandoned i the possibility of holding buildings, even with unprotected openings, provided there are some men, even only a little water, and the openings are few. J. The structural survival, even without window protection and when abandoned, of steel frame buildings with fireproof floor arches, provided the steel frame is properly encased with fireproof material, the structural damage being in close proportion to the quality of the frame protection. K. The greater or lesser destruction in such buildings of all non-structural interior, heavy spalling of all kinds of facing stone, the injury to ornamental moldings and copings, extensive damage to hollow tile in floor arches and partitions as usually constructed, a marked increase of injury where wood-finished floors are used over the floor arches, the danger from falling safes where there is loose backfilling, the failure of unprotected cast-iron mullions and spandrels in courts, and the weakness of roofs carried on unprotected steel rafters with suspended ceilings. Amongst other important lessons derived from this conflagration in the matter of firefighting, may appropriately be noticed the following. A. The importance of front as well as rear and side window protection. Fire resistant, if possible, but at any rate fire retardant. That is, wire glass. B. The necessity of encouraging individual protection by the occupants of buildings. C. The importance of ample water supply and a good pressure d. The necessity for all fire departments to have a large reserve of apparatus and hose. e. The importance to fire departments of powerful apparatus with a long range. f. The importance of fire-resisting roofs, roof structures, and of well-protected skylights. g. The necessity of the adoption of rigid standards for column protection. h the importance of good bricklaying and mortar with cement in place of lime. 
j the importance of efficient protection to the steel frames in roof attics k the importance in partitions of a better bracing of tile and the need of fire retardant transoms as well as doors in conclusion perhaps the writer may be pardoned for hazarding the belief that in case of a great conflagration where the military authorities are invited to assist in the maintenance of order every effort should be made to assist the fire department and the loss of individual property should be subordinated to the public will in accordance with the expressed opinion of the fire chief thus the policy at san francisco by which looting was prevented on any large scale by the indiscriminate employment of the military who were also responsible for the use of explosives may have saved some thousands of dollars but this very policy was probably accountable for the loss of millions by the way in which the skilled firefighters were hampered in their movements through official interference by the unnecessary blocking of important thoroughfares and by the fears of bodily harm consequent upon unexpected explosions it would appear as though the american continent possessed a monopoly of great conflagrations and in all truth this is in a measure correct owing to peculiarities of construction canada supplies an instance of what may happen when the fire department is not equal to the needs of the situation which must sometimes occur when the building material is chiefly wood the town of hull which is situated on the north bank of the ottawa river directly opposite the capital of the dominion was until april twenty sixth nineteen hundred a thriving and prosperous municipality on that spring morning a fire broke out a quarter of a mile from the main street of the little city and fanned by a fierce gale from the northwest rapidly advanced in the direction of the countless lumber mills and other factories from which hull obtained its prosperity the population was chiefly composed of persons employed in these industries and of the heads of the mills in the district whose houses although many of them were large were built of wood by eleven thirty the flames had swept across main street and its dozens of cross thoroughfares were rendered impassable the courthouse the post office and many churches were destroyed and by midnight the interprovincial bridge connecting hull with ottawa was a mass of flame in the ruins of hull there remained only the catholic cathedral with a few houses clustered about it and two factories to mark the existence of what had once been a flourishing industrial centre but the flames were unsatisfied aided by the wind great masses of burning embers ignited the powerhouses street electric and incandescent electric companies buildings on victoria island from whence the wharves on chaudiere flats part of ottawa itself were within easy distance here were situated a great number of lumber mills and the piles of dried timber were the most enticing food for the roaring conflagration that could have been found here also was located the canadian pacific railway station which being of wood like the other structures offered no resistance to the attack in fact so rapid was the onrush of the enemy that many fine houses were consumed in the twinkling of an eye and before their owners were able to save even the smallest proportion of their possessions montreal and smaller towns in the vicinity of the threatened city nobly responded with men and apparatus on an appeal for aid since the outbreak had assumed proportions far beyond the control of a comparatively small local fire department but even this assistance combined with the efforts of the militia proved of no avail in the face of the tornado of flame which tore like a whirlwind past every obstruction and threatened to transform the capital of canada into a heap of ashes like its suburb of hull rochesterville a small township which had been included some time previously within the city limits was rendered a desolate waste and had it not been that the direction of the wind mercifully changed to the east and had it not been for the high cliffs which formed an insurmountable barrier to the onset not all the fire departments in canada could have saved the city 
owing to the destruction of the electric light supply, the House of Commons, which was then sitting, was obliged to adjourn. Everything possible was done to provide shelter and subsistence for the 7,000 homeless people whose condition was piteous in the extreme. Most of them were laborers from the mills and lumber yards who had seen their homes wiped out and their occupations taken from them at practically one and the same moment. The military drill hall and the exhibition buildings were devoted to this charitable purpose, and many philanthropists proved themselves worthy of the demands made upon them. A curious feature of this disaster was the fact that after the fire had burnt itself out, there remained no smouldering embers and smoking ruins, but all was literally in ashes, so thoroughly had the flames done their work. It is also worthy of note that only seven persons met their death, and that no fireman was injured, with the exception of the chief of the Hull Brigade. The property loss was assessed at seventeen million dollars, three million four hundred thousand pounds, and some idea of the extent of the damage in the lumber yards alone can be gained from the bare statement that two hundred million feet of timber was destroyed. Needless to say, the price of this commodity was materially increased, and the trade suffered severely. This conflagration, it will be observed, was of the same sweeping character as that of Baltimore, though fought under totally different circumstances. For sheer horror, the disaster at the bazaar in the Rue Jean Goujon, Paris, on May 4, 1897, surpasses the wildest dreams of the most morbid fiction writer, and will ever live as perpetual reminder to the thoughtless of the uncertainty of existence. Owing to the social prominence of its 150 victims, this catastrophe stands out unique in the annals of great fires. Imagine the elite of a great city, the subscribers to such fashionable organizations as the opera, the horse show, and in England, Ascot. Pack them all within a limited area, apply a match, and make a bonfire of the surroundings, and picture the result. These formed the patrons at the bazaar in question, when at 4 p.m. on that day, hundreds of persons were crowding the narrow aisles between the stalls, decorated to represent the streets of old Paris, and were gazing with interest at the many titled men and women who had offered their services on behalf of a well-deserving charity. The building itself was a one-story wooden structure with a freshly tarred roof, and contained draperies and curtains of highly inflammable material. As in most of these instances, the origin of the fire is doubtful. It may have been caused by the overturning of a spirit lamp, or the ignition of the illuminating apparatus of a cinematograph which had been installed for the additional amusement of the visitors. But all that is definitely known is that at this hour in the afternoon an explosion took place on the left side of the bazaar. The flames, seizing on the hangings and articles exposed for sale, spread rapidly, and the crowd instinctively sought the farthest point from danger, of the eight doors, one was on the left, and therefore cut off by the flames. Three opened on to the Rue Jean Goujon, and four, located in the rear and used by employees, were unknown to the guests. People near the main entrances were able to escape with but slight injury. But the great mass of humanity surged towards the right wall, where there was no outlet save a small window, heavily barred, which connected with the Hotel du Palais. Servants in the hotel, who had been peering through this opening to obtain a glimpse of the gay throng, succeeded in breaking the bars and rescuing a number of the panic-stricken throng, but while so doing many were burnt before their eyes. The first intimation of the situation to passers-by was a rush of semi-nude and maddened women into the adjacent streets, where instantly all became confusion. Rows of stately carriages and humble cabs, whose drivers had been awaiting the arrival of their employers, were roused into activity by the vision of their shrieking, blood-stained owners wildly clamoring to be driven anywhere away from the scene of horror. Grooms in the service of the Baron de Rothschild, whose stables were nearby, 
use their hose to good purpose in extinguishing the flames enveloping the filmy gowns of the escaping patrons and one man more clear-headed than the rest plunged at full length into a horse trough to find relief from his sufferings before the firemen could arrive the whole structure was in a blaze and the building collapsed even as the engines galloped up it had been known to the authorities that the hall was anything but fire resistant though being built upon private property they had not been able to take any steps in the matter and it had been thought that its dimensions and the fact that it was on the street level was sufficient guarantee of its security in the meantime rescues had been effected in the interior by a few brave priests who by means of some ladders had led about thirty people over the walls of a neighboring convent but anything in the nature of organized firefighting was out of the question the flames having got beyond control and the whole structure resembling nothing so much as a giant funeral pyre which was intensified by the piteous moans and cries for help which no human power could give it is difficult to gather any collected narrative of what happened within in moments such as these impressions are fleeting and as elusive as the phantasmagoria of delirium but a few episodes remain illustrative to some extent of the nature of the struggle for life while others exemplify the height of self-abnegation to which on occasion individuals arise the story of the martyrdom of the duchesse d'alencon was related afterwards by an eye-witness a young girl who had been assisting her at a stall not far from the outbreak of the fire as the younger woman saw the flames approach she begged her friend to escape pointing out the fact that the main entrance was near and that the fire would soon be upon them but the duchess replied in calm tones that it was their duty to allow the visitors the first chance and she and her terrified companion remained at their post watching the waves of frightened people beat their way to safety until the heat became so intense that mademoiselle l could endure it no longer with one last entreaty to the duchess she joined the others leaving her brave companion with hands clasped across her breast and eyes steadfastly fixed on her approaching doom never to be seen again alive it may here be remarked that the duchess was a sister of the empress of austria who later was to die a victim to the assassin's knife and that both were universally known and beloved some may find food for reflection in the extraordinary manner tragedy appears to dog the footsteps of the members of certain families and of a truth fire is no respecter of persons as has been instanced again and again when the firemen were able to enter the ruins of this charnel house they found near the fatal right wall a mound of dead five feet in height denuded of clothing and many unrecognizable the duchess was identified only by a ring and certain stopped teeth in her jaw piteous was the plight of many of the survivors some of whom became insane from fright while others were so severely injured that they afterwards died or carried traces of their experience for many years it is out of the question to criticize what might or might not have been done in the case of a disaster of this nature with a non-fire resistant structure and conditions such as prevailed from the first the case was practically hopeless though as a counsel of perfection had panic been avoided more persons might have been saved and notices advising visitors of the back exits should have been displayed but even the latter would probably have availed little since it is the prime impulse of every person in a building to leave by the exit through which he or she entered this it is which makes it of supreme importance to have properly drilled aisle guards and staff who in an emergency will keep cool and act as pilots to the excited and hysterical it is not too much to say that if all were possessed of the splendid courage of the duchesse d'alencon less life would have been sacrificed to the fire it is a relief to turn from the contemplation of such horrors 
to a conflagration which, if involving tremendous financial loss, at least was unattended by the harrowing scenes which have been described above. In London, on the 19th of November, 1897, a fire broke out at 30 Hansel Street, in the heart of the manufacturing and warehouse section of the city. The origin of the conflagration was the explosion of a gas engine on the premises of a large firm of mantle manufacturers. The employees, terrified by the smoke, rushed to the roof and fled shrieking in fear over the adjoining buildings. A strong wind was blowing, and, as is often the case in emergencies of this nature, everybody's business was nobody's business. There was some delay in transmitting the fire call. On the arrival of the brigade, the flames had spread to a neighboring warehouse and had crossed the street to a paper factory. In this part of the city, the streets are particularly narrow, and great difficulty was experienced by the firemen in conveniently placing their apparatus. Large forces of police were required to keep back the crowds who sprang up as if by magic and threatened seriously to hamper the operations of the firefighters. One after another, the buildings, stocked with large supplies of novelties and goods for the Christmas market, were involved, and an explosion of gas meters added to the complexities of the situation. Firemen who had ascended to the roofs of fire-free buildings in order better to attack the outbreak found their retreat cut off, and the excited spectators witnessed many daring rescues of these brave men by their comrades. The vicarage of St. Giles Church, Cripplegate, was completely destroyed, and the church itself, interesting on account of its historic associations, was saved after almost superhuman effort. In all, one hundred houses covering four acres were consumed, and the combined exertions of practically the entire brigade were unsuccessful in checking the flames until 5.30 p.m., when a wall collapsed in Well Street, arresting the progress of the latter. The width of Red Cross Street was fortunately a sufficient barrier at that point, for had the fire broken through, it is impossible to say where or how it would have been stopped. Some idea of the magnitude of the conflagration can be gleaned from the fact that at midnight no less than fifty engines were still at work, and the fire was not under complete control till the following morning. The total financial loss amounted to five million pounds, twenty-five million dollars. It put two thousand people out of work, and sent up the price of ostrich feathers in all parts of the world. There is an absence of spectacular detail about such an outbreak, which tends to make it almost dull and uninteresting. But at the same time, it illustrates, effectively, the vast risks which are to be found in European towns, and goes to show that the London Fire Department, though by American ideas lightly equipped as regards personnel and apparatus, is at times called upon to fight fires of the first magnitude, it is perhaps this very absence of spectacular effect which makes the realization of fire peril so difficult to the European and so vivid to the American. Baltimore, San Francisco, the Equitable, were occurrences of worldwide interest and absorbed the descriptive talents of every skillful writer on two continents. A fire such as the above is merely a record of good work well and bravely done in the most unromantic of surroundings, and with a total absence of color, pathetic, exciting, or enthralling. The business of the world was not temporarily dislocated, though the pecuniary values involved were so tremendous. Lives were in danger, certainly, but so they are daily, and the fact passes unnoticed, Hence it is that in describing great conflagrations, those in Europe are apt to sink into insignificance, and those in the States loom out large in their gaunt and staring hideousness. In this respect, it may not be inappropriate to add a few words about the fire danger in conjunction with floods. In the spring of most years, and alas, particularly in that of 1913, floods often occur through the rising of rivers, and vast tracts of territory are inundated, while towns and cities are washed away or destroyed by fire. 
That latter phrase gives rise to comment. People argue, how can it be possible to have fires when it is water which is giving the main cause for alarm? The answer is simple enough. Gas mains burst, oil stoves are upset, electric light mains are severed and become potential torches, and there is no means of effectively fighting the outbreak. Streets impassable through water naturally prevent the operating of any but floating fire apparatus. And thus it is that flames and flood sometimes work as allies, and humanity stands staggered at the immensity of the forces combined against it. But there is one comforting reflection, that silver lining which borders every cloud, namely that year by year the services of science are being called upon to a greater degree to keep within control the latent forces of nature. Houses are built fire-resistant, apparatus is perfected, waters are dammed, rivers are banked, and inch by inch, day by day, the never-ceasing combat continues, till the time shall come when the victory shall lie with man. That day will dawn, of that there is no doubt, and the swiftness of its advent will be exactly proportionate to the determination of the human race. Amongst some of the great conflagrations known to history, the following are representative though it may be hazarded that the financial values involved must in the earlier years have been problematical, as when an entire city is wiped off the map, it is obviously difficult to total even approximately the fire loss. Ancient Rome boasts of one great outbreak which consumed almost every building within its walls, this in 64 A.D., Constantinople might not inaptly be described as the much-burned, since it had three conflagrations in the 18th century alone, one costing 100 lives and 15,000 dwellings, another 300 lives and $30 million worth of damage, and the third, 30,000 dwellings and a property loss of $115 million. Moscow, outside of 1812, when the city was destroyed by its own inhabitants rather than allow it to fall into the hands of Napoleon, was wiped out in 1383, the destruction on this occasion being even greater than the later event, since naturally the construction was inferior. The Great Fire of London occasioned a property loss of $60 million, while in 1861 the business section suffered to the extent of $12 million, and in 1874 the residential area suffered to the extent of $15 million. A conflagration of gigantic proportions gutted Smyrna in 1796 and destroyed half the city with a loss of over $50 million. Turning to America, the Great Fire of New York in 1835 destroyed 600 buildings with a loss of $20 million, while that of Boston in 1872 represented the second highest total extant, namely $100 million. The record for fire loss before the conflagration in San Francisco was held by Chicago, which in 1871 lost 17,500 buildings and $200 million worth of property, though without appreciable loss of life. Toronto in 1904, St. John's in 1892, and Hamburg in 1842 were also visited by serious outbreaks, that in the German city burning all the business section with a loss of $35 million, while the Newfoundland capital suffered to the extent of $26 million, a remarkable figure taking into consideration the small size of the town and the relatively minor importance of its financial values. After such a recitation, who shall say that personally, financially, or structurally, fire does not constitute one of the greatest perils extant. End of section 12. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 13 of Fires and Firefighters by John Kenlon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. The Hotel Peril. 
Within the last twenty years a great change has come over family life, both in Europe and America, and the reign of the hotel seems established. Everywhere vast caravanserais are springing up, and though replete with all the comfort the mind of man can devise, and though advertised as fireproof, their construction is often such as to render them an easy prey to fire, and therefore dangerous to human life. That some people are aware of this fact is evidenced by the frequent demand of visitors for rooms not too high up or on the lowest story. For it must be remembered that people do not perish only by fire itself, but from suffocation consequent on smoke, from ill-judged action caused by panic, and from other indirect causes. Also, the expression fireproof, as applied to a building, does not include its furnishings and equipment, and is further no guarantee that it has been designed along the lines of greatest resistance to the fire peril. Finally, the fireproofing of materials is not always satisfactory, and a story is told of a contractor in that business, who was asked by a friend what was done with all the shavings and chips from fireproof wood. The nonchalant reply, we use them to light the stoves in the morning, they make excellent kindling, gave him food for reflection. There can be no doubt that hotel fires are extremely prevalent, as may be judged from the following figures. During the first day of 1913, five hotels in widely separated portions of the United States were destroyed, with a loss of two lives and $100,000. The total of such fires in the month of January was 25, representing a property loss of $700,000 and seven lives. In 1912, there was a hotel fire every 33 hours in North America, and up to date, 1913, that record has been passed, with an outbreak every 30 hours. It has been estimated that the property loss in the United States through these disasters during the last five years has amounted to $25 million, 5 million pounds, while the death roll has been proportionate. These figures, it is true, apply to America, but similar occurrences are common enough in Europe, and are by no means confined to the older-fashioned structures, to wit, the fire at the Carlton Hotel is still fresh in the memory of Londoners. Now it must not be supposed that this state of affairs is due to the apathy of hotel proprietors and managers as to the safety of their clients. Apart from considerations of humanity and sentiment, that would be bad business. Rather is ignorance the root of the evil, ignorance of the very first principles of fire control, which all responsible for the lives and safety of others should thoroughly understand. It is only too common to find an attic at the top of a hotel used as a lumber room and filled with all kinds of inflammable rubbish, such as old mattresses, empty boxes, excelsior and waste paper, a perfect magazine of combustible material, and a direct invitation to a visit from the flames. Many hotels, again, have unprotected elevator shafts, around which circle the main stairs. Should a fire originate on the ground floor, instantly the shaft becomes a flue up which the flames sweep with amazing rapidity, and the stairway, as a means of exit, becomes impassable. Defective electric wiring is likewise a constant source of danger, short-circuiting constituting one of the most serious of risks. As for heating apparatus, with faulty connections, improperly covered or wrongly situated hot air ducts, were this cause of trouble eliminated, it is no exaggeration to say that hotel fires would decrease by one-third. It may be imagined that the introduction of precautions necessary to combat this peril spells the expenditure of large sums of money and radical structural alterations. Broadly speaking, this is not the case. The expenditure of a certain amount of common sense and care will produce far-reaching results, as the history of hotel fires goes to show. 
while in the case of new construction it should be realized that skimping in the matter of fire protection in the long run is the worst kind of penny-wise pound-foolish policy. The municipal authorities, of course, insist upon compliance with certain regulations when the erection of a hotel is undertaken, varying with the country and local conditions. But as a rule, the building code is directed chiefly towards ensuring safety of exit for guests, rather than interfering in the larger issue of how the necessity of a hurried exit may be avoided. At the same time, the writer must place on record the fact that in New York the new hotels embody every known means of fire resistance, and are as perfect in their construction as the present state of human knowledge will allow. But what precautions should be taken in older buildings, and are they beyond the scope of the average manager? The answer may be framed in the form of another question, or rather series of questions. Has everything been done to prevent a possible outbreak by the removal of potential sources of the same? This is largely a matter of common sense, coupled with some thought. Then, can a fire be readily detected? Is there an automatic fire alarm, or is there a night watchman who records his tours of inspection in a clock? Can guests be readily alarmed, and is there direct telephonic communication with the fire department? Is there an efficient system of fire escapes, and is the house properly provided with chemical extinguishers and such like apparatus? Are the employees competent to deal with an incipient blaze, and have any regulations been issued as to the particular duty of each in the event of an emergency? These suggestions do not represent a considerable capital outlay, and yet are all of primal importance. Of course it is easy to continue the catechism further, and to ask whether in design and construction the building is such that it is feasible to confine a fire within certain limits, whether elevator shafts are covered in, whether floor openings are unprotected, whether there is a sufficient water supply, and whether the house is guarded against exposure fires, that is, fires caused by adjacency to some other burning structure, a common enough contingency, and one easily met by the adoption of wire glass in windows. This may appear a formidable battery of queries, but a little consideration will suffice to show that their bark is worse than their bite and that, after all, there is nothing so dreadfully radical in the proposition as to necessitate loss of sleep or visions of speedy bankruptcy. The great conflagrations of the world have not been due to elemental disruptions, as a rule, beyond the control of man, but rather to acts of deliberate carelessness or thoughtlessness, which might easily have been avoided. And so it is with fires in hotels, they constitute a real peril, which annually reaps a rich harvest of lives and property, a minimum of precaution, and the harvest would not be garnered. The following examples of hotel fires which might have been avoided are selected from a list prepared by Insurance Engineering, a monthly publication devoted to the science of fire control. Brockville, Ontario, Canada, Strathcona Hotel, Cause, overheated furnace in basement. Discovered by clerk at 4.45 in the morning. No private appliances. Fire department handicapped by delayed alarm and lack of sufficient apparatus with which to fight the fire. Loss considerable. Overheated furnaces are a source of such constant trouble that the heating plant should always be isolated and situated in a fireproof room though a case is recorded from Chicago, in which it was found that the heat from the firebox of a boiler was so intense that it ignited some sheets of music on the other side of a thick brick wall. Hence, isolation cannot be too carefully ensured. Chicago, York Hotel, cause of fire, defective electric wiring, discovered by watchman, 3.16 a.m., in partition in first story. Fire department immediately notified. Fire spread to roof in hollow finish. Private fire protection poor. 
firemen who arrive promptly helped guests to escape by stairs. Loss nominal, owing to the prompt and effective work of the fire department. Defective electric wiring is too frequent a cause of fire, and can easily be avoided by regular inspection. It is then the safest method of illumination in the world. A word may here be inserted about hollow finish. This is a system whereby spaces are left between the outside covering of a wall, ceiling, or floor in the main constructional work. Such cavities, if subjected to fire, are a source of serious danger, since the air therein encourages the flames, whereas if built up flush this danger disappears. Rimouski, Province of Quebec, St. Germain Hotel, three-story, wood. Cause, hot stovepipe on the floor of the second story. Fire spread through hollow wall finish. Loss, total. Charleston, Ontario, Grandview Hotel. Cause, oil heater in pool room. Fire spread to other buildings and caused a conflagration. Loss, $200,000. These are two good examples of how fires occur through defective heating arrangements. It seems scarcely necessary to insist that in any building, stovepipes should be most carefully protected, while oil stoves as heaters should be abolished in toto. Akron, Ohio, Thuma Hotel, five stories, brick, ordinary construction, hollow finish. Cause grease fire on range of kitchen in basement ignited coating of grease in vent shaft which passed upward through building part of the way between the ceiling finish of the second story and the floor of the third fire department responded quickly to a box alarm and fought fire for six hours when the firemen arrived the fire was general throughout the building Owing to the effective work of the firemen, the loss was limited to 25% of the values. Vent ducts from kitchen ranges are peculiarly liable to ignition, since in the course of time the pipes become coated with a thick deposit of inflammable grease. Should this catch fire, great heat is generated, and the duct becoming red-hot will ignite any wood adjacent to it. Hence, every precaution should be adopted for the isolation of these vents, so that in the event of an outbreak they may burn out without causing more serious trouble. Of the inconsequent carelessness of hotel employees, a whole volume might easily be compiled. The following, however, are good examples. Salina, Kansas, National Hotel. Fire started in the basement, in laundry chute into which a cigar butt had been thrown. The chute was of wood and extended from basement to roof, with unprotected openings in each story. The fire was discovered by the hotel porter, but an alarm was not sent to the fire department. The notification to which it responded was the fire itself, which was seen by several firemen. The hotel had been inspected by the fire department, and the owner had been warned against the dangerous construction and arrangement of the chute. Missoula, Montana, Florence Hotel, three-story, brick, ordinary construction, hollow finish, unprotected floor openings. Fire started in elevator shaft in the rear of the building, and was caused by a can of hot ashes set on the platform of the elevator car. Fire was discovered at 11 a.m. by a clerk who promptly transmitted the alarm to the fire department. The flames traveled up elevator shaft and mushroomed in the attic, between the ceiling of the top story and the roof. A partition in the attic, between the main building and a wing, assisted the firemen in checking further spread of fire. It took five hours to suppress the blaze. The carelessness of hotel servants is proverbial, and to make them realize the danger of the thoughtless throwing away of an oily rag, the improper disposal of rubbish, or of an unextinguished cigarette or cigar end, may not inaptly be compared with the labors of Sisyphus. 
when it is remembered that in some large hotels the staff employed number about two thousand souls, the extent of the mischief can be gauged. And if servants are careless, what of the guests? Contemplate the following. Tacoma, Washington, Grand Hotel, four-story, brick, ordinary construction. Fire started at 5.35 p.m., and was caused by a man smoking in bed. It was discovered quickly by other guests, and the fire department responding promptly controlled the outbreak so that the loss was limited to $17,000. Comment really seems to be needless, and the protection of the individual against himself has not added to the lightening of the burden of those responsible. But probably the most terrible exemplification of the mischief which can be wrought by a thoughtless visitor is embodied in the story of the Windsor Hotel fire. This building occupied the entire block on the east side of Fifth Avenue in New York City, between 46th and 47th Streets. It was of antique construction, with wide halls, high ceilings, and several elevator shafts. On the 17th of March, at 3 p.m., a guest in a front parlor on the second floor lighted a cigar and threw the still-blazing match out into the street. As it passed the curtains, the latter ignited, and in an instant were in flames. Without attempting to extinguish the blaze or to give an alarm, the author of this disaster fled from the room, and a few moments afterwards the head waiter, in passing by the door, caught sight of the fire, which by that time had greatly increased. Unaided, he made a brave effort to subdue it, but his hands were badly burned, and it was easy to see that more help was needed. The St. Patrick's Day parade was passing at that time. The streets were lined with spectators and guarded by policemen, Interested onlookers were leaning out of the windows of the hotel itself, and the strains of many brass bands deadened all other sound. As the head waiter, calling fire, ran into the street and endeavored to reach an alarm box, which unfortunately was situated on the other side of Fifth Avenue, he was prevented from crossing by a puzzled policeman who could not understand the excited man's incoherent explanations above the din of the music but the smoke and flames soon told their own story, and a first, second, and finally a fourth alarm were sent in. Owing to the construction of the building, the flames ascended both by way of the halls and in and out of windows to the top floor with great rapidity. In spite of the desperate efforts on the part of the fire department, who were handicapped by a poor water supply, before 4 p.m. the hotel was in ruins, a little later, the only wall to remain standing slid down to its base like a closing fan. By 7 p.m., the fire was under control, and the safety of adjoining property was assured. Of the many guests and servants who had been watching the procession, 14 were dead and about 50 injured. Some of them had attempted to use the safety ropes which had been placed in each bedroom, but the friction on their hands became too great, and they were forced to let go and meet their doom in the streets. One handsomely dressed woman on the fourth floor held out her arms as though imploring aid from above. Then, without a cry, she jumped, turning over and over as she fell until she struck the iron railing below. At one window appeared a woman bearing in her arms a child, Terrified by the flames which were licking the sill from the floor beneath, she threw the child into the street and an instant later followed. Many rescues were effected by the firemen who mounted on ladders and dragged to safety some of the occupants, and if others had not been panic-stricken by the proximity of the danger and had possessed sufficient courage to await the arrival of help, many of those who jumped to death might have been saved. Behind the hotel, and connected with it from the interior, was a Russian bath establishment, where a number of patrons were enjoying the pleasures of treatment. They were obliged to make the best of their way out, clad in sheets, towels, or whatever articles of clothing were nearest to hand. 
two men in the hotel who were vainly hunting for a fire escape were met by a trained nurse who said that she could conduct them through her room to the object of their search when they had entered however she put her back against the door and told them that they must assist her in carrying her patient a helpless old lady in a wheeled chair to a place of safety in other words this plucky woman had invented this scheme in order to save the life of her charge and the men infected by her courage did as she requested and all four gained the street without mishap all this owing to an act of carelessness on the part of a visitor whose identity by the way has never been discovered to this day prevention is of course better than cure but next to that is promptness of action both direct and indirect that is to say an outbreak of fire should be detected as soon as possible which may be accomplished either automatically by sprinklers by a watchman who registers his inspection visits on a clock or by both it must never be forgotten that every minute lost means ten times the additional risk the following type of case is unfortunately too common sioux city iowa mondamin hotel four stories brick ordinary construction unprotected floor openings fire started eight twenty p m in boiler room in basement discovered by outsider who transmitted alarm since discovery of the fire was delayed fire department was unable to control it loss one hundred twenty thousand dollars a watchman at ten dollars a week would not have been an extravagant rate of insurance again contrast the following lansing michigan downey hotel six-story brick ordinary construction hollow finish unprotected floor openings cause of fire a heated bearing in or an electrical defect in elevator motor in penthouse over roof of elevator shaft discovered five fifty nine p m by hotel employee alarm received by fire department six twenty five fire burned until eight a m the next day loss over one hundred thousand dollars little rock arkansas gleason's hotel four story brick ordinary construction hollow finish unprotected floor openings fire caused by electric motor at top of elevator shaft discovered by employee at one o eight a m box alarm transmitted immediately fire controlled in thirty minutes and confined to locality of origin loss two thousand three hundred dollars less than three per cent of values a better exemplification of the advantages of prompt action could not be imagined the notifying of guests in hotels of an outbreak of fire is of supreme importance since as a rule such outbreaks occur at night when most of the inmates are asleep it is a good scheme to have an alarm gong fitted in the bedrooms which should be operated from the reception bureau or some other central position but even such methods should be supplemented by personal calls from members of the staff this will go a long way towards preventing panic of which there is a danger if the gong alone is used as for fire escapes this is a vast and intricate subject time and again have persons been injured on narrow fire escapes while as stated in the windsor hotel fire a rope provides only a last and desperate means of exit some hotels are now erected with fire escape towers which completely cut off the flames and ensure an open road to safety but it is impossible to lay down any hard and fast rules for the construction and placing of contrivances since to a certain extent the design of the building must be taken into consideration and in all cases sufficient and careful thought should be given to these matters it hardly seems credible that there should be hotels devoid of even a hand chemical grenade yet fire chiefs frequently report that such is the case every establishment of a certain size should not only be properly equipped with hand and chemical extinguishers 
but should also be possessed of a private fire department. The formation of such an organization offers no particular difficulty, and in the opinion of the writer is as worthy of advertisement in hotel announcements as such hackneyed phrases as unsurpassed cuisine, moderate terms, and unrivaled view. The casual visitor would sleep just as soundly were he deprived of those three remarkable benefits, but he might be forgiven for passing a restless night were he haunted by the terrors of fire due to poor fire control. And now to come to an all-engrossing portion of the theme under discussion, namely why fires spread so rapidly in hotels. In nearly all such buildings there is a lack of subdivision of floor area, although in some cities an interior wall of incombustible material is required between every set of four rooms, this extending from foundations to roof. In one of the latest New York hotels the partitions between rooms are of hollow tile, the doors of steel, and the transoms glazed with wire glass. Even the trim and picture mouldings are of metal. That this is the very height of perfection in fire control may be gathered from the fact that in this same hotel an outbreak recently occurred amongst some furniture stored on an upper floor. The furniture was completely destroyed, but the room was habitable twenty-four hours later, while the adjoining premises were unharmed. Unprotected floor openings, like the poor, are ever with us, and embody the most glaring structural defect imaginable. Their retention is virtually a crime, especially considering the facility with which this risk can be remedied. Cases without number might be cited of the prominent part played by this avoidable fault in hotel conflagrations, but the two following may be quoted as typical. At a hotel in a Kansas city, the stairway encircled the elevator shaft, a form of suicidal internal architecture peculiarly popular in England and on the continent of Europe. The fire started early in the morning in the basement, cutting off the escape of the guests, many of whom jumped from windows, while others slid down ropes made of bed clothing. The other hails from Oneonta, New York, Central Hotel, fire discovered at 3.30 a.m. under basement stairs by clerk. No private fire appliances. Fire department handicapped by wires in street. Rope fire escapes only. Three lives lost. In such terse language is summed up the result of unprotected floor openings. Fire and smoke naturally ascend and hence it is of paramount importance that not only should stairways and elevator shafts, dumb waiters, pipe and wire chases, be of fireproof construction, but each opening should be entirely enclosed by fireproof materials. Elevators and stairways should always be separated, the encircling stair and the lattice-work elevator shaft being an invention of the fire fiend himself. The shaft of an elevator may well be compared to a factory chimney. Everyone knows that the giant smokestacks which dot the hillsides of any manufacturing neighborhood have not been erected with a view to the picturesque. Rather, their purpose is strictly utilitarian. The higher the chimney, the greater the draft, the fiercer the fire, and the more tremendous the heat. It is exactly the same with an elevator shaft with a fire at the bottom which, if closed at the top, has the effect of drawing up the smoke and heat which form the primal obstacles to escape by inmates on the upper floors. Thereafter the fire spreads laterally and downward. Hence these shafts should be rendered as completely fire-tight as compartments in a ship are constructed water-tight. Finally, elevator machinery should be placed at the top of a shaft, as the lubricating oil and grease used on its running parts form ready material for the flames. The same may be said to apply to stairways, though in this connection it may be remarked that particular attention should be paid to the basement and attic entrances of the same, 
as it sometimes occurs that these are left unguarded and these two points constitute as a rule the beginning and the end of hotel fires interior light courts are also a source of danger especially when roofed over all windows looking on to such courts should be glazed with wire glass, and as a matter of fact, light wells should never be roofed. As regards hollow finish, the following two examples explain the danger more succinctly than columns of technicalities. Putnam, Connecticut, Chickering Hotel, three stories and basement, wood walls, ordinary construction, hollow finish, mansard roof. Fire started in basement near boiler, discovered at 1.30 a.m. by a passerby, burned six hours, loss $19,000, about 55% of values. Chief of Fire Department said, the fire worked up inside partitions to the roof. There was not a square yard of flooring burned in any place. Excelsior Springs, Missouri, New Elms Hotel, three-story and basement stone building. Fire started at 1.30 a.m. in coal bin outside of building. Discovered promptly and quick alarm sent in. No private fire protection and fire department handicapped by weak water pressure. Fire chief's reasons for spread of fire as follows. There were no firewalls in the building. There were wide spaces between ceilings and floors to act as deadeners, and it was through these spaces that the fire spread through the building and made it difficult for firemen to get water at the right place at the right time. This system of introducing deadeners is a concession to the visitors, who naturally enough dislike noise and who otherwise would be disturbed by their neighbors. It can be rendered safe, or at any rate partially so, by filling up these spaces either with asbestos or mineral wool. Ventilation systems should also be carefully supervised, as on occasion they may prove responsible for serious fire risk. The following instance is illustrative of the care which must be exercised over hotel design, where, be it remembered, panic is above all else to be avoided. In a New York hotel, a huge volume of smoke suddenly filled a crowded dining room. The cause was the burning of a heap of rubbish which had been placed too close to the air intake of the ventilating fan, which drafted the smoke and blew it on through the ventilating system. Nothing more serious than the annoyance and discomfort of the guests resulted, but the draperies and decorations were all damaged by the smoke. Had the intake been located higher up, or had it been arranged to close with movable louvers, the trouble would not have occurred. Fire exposure, or the danger to be apprehended from fires originating nearby and in turn communicating with a hotel, can to a great degree be guarded against by the fitting of window openings with hollow metal sashes glazed with wire glass. That this risk is not so remote, as might be supposed, may be seen from the following. Oakland, California, St. Mark's Hotel, eight stories, reinforced concrete. Fire started in sign painter's shop in second story of adjoining building and burned out windows of hotel which were sashed with wood. Kansas City, Missouri, Ormond Hotel, five stories, brick. Fire originated in garage adjoining, between ceiling of first and floor of second story. Cause defective electric wiring. Garage employees delayed sending in an alarm. Fire department handicapped by headway of fire, height of hotel, and weak water pressure. Insurance loss $140,000, values $310,000. It goes without saying that hotels as frequently burn other buildings, and that these remarks may be taken as being applicable to all houses of whatever type. Of course it may be urged that this use of wire glass is deplorable from an aesthetic point of view. 
which with some people counts for more than common sense and the protection of life and limb. For such artistic souls it is impossible to cater, though it is fortunate that with the majority of the community fire risks are more important than landscapes, however inspiring. Which introduces the conclusion of the subject. It has been demonstrated ad nauseum in the preceding pages that hotel fires are very real contingencies against which to prepare, and it has been shown that the fireproof hotel is not yet to be considered as practical politics. But it can be made fire-resistive, and that with a degree of certainty which will minimize the risk to an appreciable extent. The automatic sprinkler will do everything except start a fire, as explained elsewhere, its construction is simplicity itself. While not only does it automatically damp down an incipient blaze, but in addition will operate a fire alarm, ensuring that there is no delay on the part of either employees or fire department in tackling the enemy. It is perfectly possible to install this system in the public rooms of a hotel, and yet interfere not at all with the decorative scheme, which would be treason in the eyes of some. In one building so protected, the sprinklers number no less than 1,600, the source of water supply being a 20,000-gallon tank elevated 25 feet above the roof, and two six-inch connections with the city main. By this method it is possible for a room to be burnt out and the fire subdued, without the damage to property and the excitement amongst guests which would be caused by the arrival of a brigade and the subsequent operating of hose-pipes through the hall and stairways and through windows. The sprinkler system is, in fact, the silent guardian of life and property, which slumbers not nor sleeps, and which can be relied upon as a rule. A rise in temperature, 160 degrees Fahrenheit on the floor, is sufficient, and the sprinkler starts to work, sending down a drenching stream upon the affected area, and warning all and sundry that there is an enemy at hand. At a recent fire, in a hotel guarded in this fashion, one of the guests rang and complained of a water pipe located just above his bed, which had burst suddenly and awakened him from his beauty sleep. His indignation was unbounded, and in the morning he demanded an apology from the manager, which was smilingly forthcoming. But that individual did not think it necessary to explain to the irate guest that the room above his, an unoccupied one, had caught fire, and that the lives of some five hundred guests had been quietly and quickly saved by an inconspicuous sprinkler. End of Section 13 Recording by Maria Casper.